We're going to do this for now. Um, Karen's computer needs to restart, so it's going to be a minute. She's here. So are we waiting to start or are we going ahead? Um, if we're ready, we have a quorum. Trevor, are you okay that I have Karen on speakerphone listening? Trevor? She can hear and she can respond? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yes. We have a quorum so we can start in any case, but uh, she's going to get back online herself, right? Yeah, her computer is having trouble connecting right now. Okay. Yeah, we can get started. Okay. Are we on? Are we ready? I'm going to go. Okay. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of August 10th, 2020. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience while we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote, remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash Mikey, you're on mute now. Mikey, you need to unmute yourself. How did I get muted? I don't know. Where did I get muted? Okay, just keep going. You were I don't know where I was. You were at malibucity.org slash virtual meetings the first time. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'm just demonstrating the challenges of Zoom, that's all. Um, at this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed, so please make sure you visit malibucity.org virtual meeting early to sign up and speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I'll call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. Okay. Can I uh, have a roll call, please? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Councilmember Wagner, can you, you're, you're indicating that you're here, thank you. Thumbs up. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Peak? I am here. Mayor Pearson? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, can I have a motion for approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I will second that. Okay, do I need a roll call for that? Yes, uh, so that would be um, Council Member Mullen? Here, I mean yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, um, can I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on July 30th, 2020. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're gonna move on to item two, written and oral communications from the public. Do we have any speakers signed up? We have nine public speakers tonight. I'm going to read them off in order and then call them one by one to speak. The speakers are Bill Sampson, Don McClay, Joe Drummond, Lance Simmons, Craig Hill, Doug Stewart, Colin Drummond, Andy Lyon, and then I'm sorry, Don Clay had signed up again. We only have eight speakers. Uh, so the first speaker is Bill Sampson. Okay. Um, can we get Bill on? Hi, Bill, are you there? Uh, I think so. Yep. We can hear you. Okay. Um, in preparing for the uh, remarks on the uh, later agenda items, uh, I reviewed uh, the council people for the last eight years because I wanted to commend those who had at all times honored our mission statement and our vision statement and fully honored our municipal code 
and I wanted to publicly thank Jefferson Wagner, who was the one out of many who did that. So Jeff, thank you much. Thank you for your service all these years. It's much appreciated. Um, I would also like to um, urge us to somehow slow down the people on Broad Beach Road. I don't know how to do it. Um, some of you, uh, one of my neighbors suggested putting up a uh, deer stand. I don't think that's lawful, um, but something to slow. You got the same problems on the point. I know that. Uh, the highway is a drag strip out here. Uh, Pat, once you're past Trancas, um, I hear very high powered cars in fifth gear. That is way too fast. I love high powered cars. I even like noisy cars. I like to drive them both. Button Willows, uh, an easy drive from here and whatever you guys can do. And I'll close by Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. The next speaker is John, I'm sorry, Don McClay. Don, are you there? Muted also. Oh. We can hear you now. Okay. Hello. Go ahead, go ahead, Don. Okay, I prepared a written statement here, so I'm going to read it to you guys. My name is Don McClay. I've lived in Malibu since 1966, 64 years. We bought our house on Blue Water Road 47 years ago. I've got a master's degree in engineering from Cornell University, completed the Stanford MBA executive program, been active in Malibu Community Affairs for a long time. I witnessed and was an actual part of the two prior considerations concerning speed humps on Doom Drive. In the process, I've learned a lot about the subject. The latest plan for speed humps has all the earmarks of a bushwhack of the residents to me. There is zero community involvement and absolute illegal disregard for the city of Malibu policy about these devices. The policy of which the, co the council has a copy states in part that number one, Doom Drive is the only collector street on Point Doom because the speed limit's over 25 miles an hour. It used to be 35 miles an hour until the city lowered it without notice 30 to 30 several years ago. Every other street on the point is designated as a residential street at 25 mile an hour speed limit. These streets generally are narrower than Doom Drive and have no sidewalks. The policy specifically states by name that Doom Drive is not eligible for installation of speed humps. Policy also states that before speed humps can be installed, there must be a petition from the people who abut the street and that 60% of the residents abutting the street must vote in favor of installing these devices. Mentions also made of a requirement to conduct speed surveys and that the speed humps may only be installed if 85% of the observed speeds exceed the posted speed limit by more than five miles an hour. For Point Doom, that requirement, by the way, has never happened in past surveys. For the July 13th council meeting, the city manager stated that the public safety commission agenda in a public safety commission agenda report labeled as item, agenda item 6.B, that the public safety commission in their January meeting recommended that devices be installed on Doom and Fernhill. If you read the minutes of that meeting, the public safety meeting, that's incorrect. There is no record in the minutes of of the meeting to that effect at all. You can read those yourself. So I respectfully request that you, that you request that the Public Works Department be directed to postpone the installation on these two streets until the community affected can be surveyed and other steps can be taken. Results of the speed readings of the traffic logic speed deliver advisory signs can be promulgated to the public and interpreted by professional people. If the data is not suitable for that purpose, then another more pertinent speed survey can be run. Consideration can be given if it's decided to install, to install speed control devices on Doom Drive to use 30 mile per hour rated ones. Don, your instead time of, is up. Okay, instead of the 15 to 50. So please do something about this for us that is different than you've done so far and cancel that installation for now. Thank you. Thank you, Don. The next speaker is Joe Drummond.
Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for all of your service. Um, I'm 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 here today to talk about. Um, I know that on item four C, you'll you'll be making an ordinance for short term rentals, and um, we hope the city council can keep these regulations high, but also reasonable, so that homeowner vacationers can supplement their own incomes for a short period of time during the holiday seasons and not full time like so many other short term rental homes in Malibu. Um, having an on site host for people who rent out their home for only four to eight weeks per year with a one week minimum at a time would essentially end this type of rental in our neighborhoods and the quiet kind guests that come stay with us that are just like our own family and bother no one in the community. It would also stop the much needed TOT that gives much income for our already severely cut city budget. My husband and our family of five go away for several weeks in the summer as well as the winter for two weeks. And when we do, we rent out our home to help defray property taxes and college tuition. We have three kids that need college paid for. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars, as you know. We rent it out for a minimum of one week, often renting regularly for 12 to 15 days to similar families such as ours needing a getaway. They're always quiet, respectful, and enjoy the home. They use the entire house, so there would be no place for an on-site host to be present unless it could be one of my neighbors who might be willing from their own home. Please have consideration for homeowners who are not making a full-time living off short-term rentals, but trying to make ends meet by renting out their home for a short period of time during the year when most neighbors are also on holiday. The better option over the on-site host would be to limit the number of days allowed during the year, i.e. 60 days max. Um, we'd hope that there could be a special permit for people only renting less than eight weeks per year. And um, so that we wouldn't require an on-site host for those, for those, for our rentals. So um, I also hope that they do not raise the already high TOT 12% tax to 15%. This is a fair ch chunk out of the earnings that go, again, go towards our property taxes, et cetera. Thanks for your consideration in this matter and looking out for the little guys in Malibu. Our next speaker is Lance Simmons. You there, Lance? He doesn't seem to be responding. Lance, if you can uh, unmute yourself, you should have a button now. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, irony is the twin sister of hypocrisy. And in Congress, there is an abundance of both. Pay to play, scratch my back, and I will scratch yours is as old as the Republic itself, and Congress's penchant for folding many bills into huge omnibus spending legislation, where so-called pork barrel spending can lose itself in thousands of pages of legislative doublespeak, and usually end up against pressure to recess and go home. Is it any wonder that most legislators will honestly confess that they don't even pretend to know what all, what all is contained in the bills they pass. Thus, it is incredulously ironic and hypocritical to have Majority Leader Mitch McConnell publicly excoriating the mayor of Malibu for defending two important principles. First, advocating for federal assistance to serve our city and promoting environmentally sound projects in the wake of the serious devastation that took place in the Woolsey fire and the current economic downturn visited by the COVID pandemic. And second, by advocating for the principle of aid to local governments that on the intergovernmental totem pole always seemed to be at the bottom of the list. In his August 4th letter to con congressional leaders, Mayor Pearson did what all elected officials should do, namely take care of their constituents in the community. Moscow Mitch certainly will not anytime soon assume the moniker of Malibu Mitch. However, that the perennial purveyor of pork set his sights on this request is in itself laughable. 
Last year alone, McConnell steered nearly $1 billion in the form of corporate tax breaks, military construction, and other projects of interest to his campaign donors and constituents. This does not even factor in the millions that his wife, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow, steered to the bluegrass state. So while the mayor's request dealt largely with sustainable community projects that promote long-term resiliency, Kentucky, the fifth largest coal producing state in the nation, merely, merrily sucks at the teeth of federal largesse. I applaud the mayor's request and would respectfully ask that the city council adopt a resolution in support of the request on behalf of both our community and all the nation's cities who will be facing serious budgetary cuts unless federal funds extend help to meet the mandatory obligations they face. State and local governments are obligated to balance their budgets. The federal government has no such mandate, and for good reason. We all need to pull together to weather this critical storm. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Lance. The next speaker is Craig Hill. Hi, good evening, Council. I hadn't realized Mitch McConnell was monitoring Malibu so closely. Maybe he's angling to create a new homeless shelter here so he can put his name on it. Uh, two things, Zoom meetings have been the new, become the new normal. So let's reinstate the practice of donating speaker minutes. I raised this with the planning commission and there was some discussion about it, how the commission could be the laboratory in which any technical kinks are worked out before implementing it with council. There will be ways to do it. You could ask the person to use the raise your hand function in Zoom. You could be strict. If they don't raise their hand in 10 seconds, you move on. If an item has multiple donors, you could vet them all at the beginning of the item so as not to interrupt the flow once the speakers get going. Anyway, there were several more ideas discussed in the meeting. I'd recommend looking at it if you haven't. Um, and for complex items, it would be helpful if the mayor could recognize the raised hand in Zoom. For example, if two council members are wrangling with the meaning of something said by a member of the public, that person could raise their hand and provide a clarification. The idea would be to provide for the limited degree of interaction you have in a live hearing when there's a subject matter expert near the podium, or at least be more proactive about asking someone present for clarification. In the end, the point is to allow for relevant information without decorum getting out of hand. And it seems that a more effective balance can be struck now that we've become more familiar with the technology. Um, secondly, meanwhile, I live on a bluff where I don't hear much PCH traffic except for sirens and motorcycles. And there have been many more of each this season, more traffic accidents, more crazy loud motorcycles. So I was wondering if we could have an update on the CHP officer. I know uh, in the budget discussions, there was mention of swapping two sheriffs for two CHP units. I'm not sure how that came out. And beyond that, I realized that the city contracts for this, but we have concurrent jurisdiction with the CHP on the PCH. And, there must be some rationale now with the new uh, exigent circumstances of COVID to request that CHP provide a few more units. Um, there are many more people just taking a drive out here now because they have fewer places to go for entertainment. And with gas, gas prices relatively low, State Highway 1 has become LA's new playground. It's just, it's it's been a quantum change in the character and the amount of traffic out here. So. I hope that together the city and the CHP can work to address this change and um, get a few more units out here. Thank you. That's it. Our next speaker is Doug Stewart. Good evening, council members. I'm speaking tonight not as a public safety commissioner, although this topic has been the subject at several of our meetings over the last couple of years. I want to bring your attention to the need for something that is never top of the mind until you need one, and that's a tow truck. We all probably know that moment of relief when the AAA truck shows up to help us when our car won't start. But what I'm talking about is the need to be able to tow cars in Malibu when they are parked illegally. We lost the much beloved Malibu tow when he could no longer use the lot that's now part of the new college campus in the Civic Center as an impound lot. I know Councilman Wagner worked diligently to find a new impound location, but eventually that could not be accomplished. 
Now our sheriff's deputies must wait for, over, for an over-the-hill tow truck or one from Oxnard to work a traffic accident or tow an illegally parked car. The real issue is not the tow truck itself, but access to the impound lot. A round trip to the valley and back on a weekend to the impound lot makes towing away a car for an illegally parking citation just not practical. What we need as a solution is not a full-time impound lot, but a short-term transit lot that can be used by the tow trucks to quickly move the car away from the site and then quickly return for the next call. Malibu Tow apparently had such an arrangement with the high school for summer weekends, and surely fines and fees would make this cost neutral for the city. I ask that the council have the staff begin to evaluate how this short-term interim tow lot could be operated, especially for the summer months, so that when we say cars will be towed for illegally parking, we mean that your car will be towed. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Colin Drummond. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Pearson and honorable city councilors, thank you for your service. I wanted to add on to what my wife was saying about STRs and that um, specifically requiring an on-site host seems less like a reasonable attempt to restrict STRs and more like a way to outright uh, eradicate them. <clears throat> Thus, to be honest, trampling on our rights as tax-paying homeowners. STRs have been legal for some time in Malibu, as you know, unlike in Santa Monica. We all know and fear Malibu becoming half empty, filled with strangers, renting homes for wild weekend visitors. <clears throat> if noise is the problem, isn't there an ordinance? And should we not gain the, the Sheriff's Department's increased cooperation in enforcement rather than creating some giant new um, approach to tackling this. I think it's helpful to view the SDR owners as two very different types of, of, of groups. Those attempting to draw income on a semi full time basis uh, and those supplementing their incomes occasionally like ourselves. <clears throat> Using ourselves as examples we are not turning Malibu into a giant Airbnb town. We're highly active and visible volunteers in the community. Our kids go to Malibu High. We shop at Ralph's. Uh, we go to the cook-off when it's um, not being closed down because of COVID. We are no threat to the fabric of Malibu. We're actually an important part of it. Uh, the ordinance should make reasonable accommodation for these very different scenarios. Um, so, uh, you know, sub specifically, there might be uh, an, uh, an opportunity to mo modify the SEP, the special events permit, per permitting, for example, a total number of days per year. It could be based on vacations that families take. Uh, what number of days or weeks makes sense? Um, Four weeks vacation is a reasonable starting point when families are available to leave Malibu plus Christmas between Christmas and New Year, which is usually 10 days. So I don't know, is it something like six weeks permitted to rent, rent out their home? Um, that seems fair and reasonable. Or maybe a separate permit as well could be obtained for people like ourselves uh, that don't require an on-site host. But a 24 seven emergency call response and a neighbor close by with a key uh, and ourselves remotely to con contact if needed um, for further action. So in summary, we just don't think we should be using a sledgehammer to deal with like a fly or some- Paul, your time is up. Or, <laughs> thank you, please account for people like us. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Our next speaker is Andy Lyon. Hello, can you hear me? I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, maybe the city should put out an alert that there's a rolled over car down at Topanga right now blocking the highway going eastbound. Um, just came by there. I'm actually parked in front of the uh, Legacy Park now. I'm not driving and talking to you, so. Um, yeah, I'm also, uh, 
talking tonight about the letter that Mikey wrote that was mentioned by Mitch McConnell and the hypocrisy that goes with that really well one week in as mayor and you've you've got yourself on the stage of national politics and dragged this all in as elitist out of touch kind of people that Malibu tends to look at us like um the hypocrisy part of that is is that you voted not to allow Malibu to investigate the citizens to investigate going and moving towards a strong mayor system or a stronger mayor system. And first weekend, you're writing a letter as the mayor. And I don't see anywhere that that was uh, voted on by the council and a four to one, which is necessary for that letter to go out. Uh, you basically acted as a mayor, which you're not, you're just a, a co-council person. Um, unless, of course, Reva, Reva authorized you to write this letter and send it out, you know, through the League of California Cities. Either way, whatever side of politics you're on, that's the real issue is that you went ahead and you wrote a letter. You signed the letter as mayor of Malibu. You didn't go through the process of, of putting it on the agenda and getting the proper, proper um, vote to do so. And I just wanted, like, if that, if I'm wrong, like, Mikey, if you if you mm -hmm. did this, great. If Reva did this, great. But I know that nobody else, it wasn't on the agendas, and it's, now it's it's out there. Um, you know, protocol. Otherwise, like, you know, don't act like a mayor and and do things by yourself. You know, vote to let us all have a say as a real mayor. Then, right? Um, that's. I think. I think you. Uh, you should answer that in the comments or Reba can answer to that if she was the one that authorized you to write this letter without it going in front of everybody else to have a say. Because I think, you know, the, the asking for a bunch of, of, you know, electric vehicles, whether it's good or bad or whatever, I mean, we have the money if we need to get electric cars. We don't need to, you know, poach on to the uh, stimulus package. We have plenty of money. We got this, you know, beyond AAA rating that we brag about. You can't brag about a great, you know, amount of money in the bank. And then Andy, your password. time is up. Thanks. Look forward to the comments. Mayor Pearson, we have one more speaker, but they signed up after the item was called. Would you like to hear their comment now? Uh, that's fine. Yes. So who's the speaker? It is Jane Albrecht. Yes, am I, am I on? Yes, you are, Jane. Well, first of all, I'll make a quick uh, defense. Uh, Mikey, I didn't think there was anything wrong with the letter. Mitch distorted it. Uh, welcome to the world of social media. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, endorse what Don McClay said. Um, after I became aware of the uh, effort to install speed bumps, Shortly before the July 14th meeting, I did look into what happened. I was actually quite shocked that the Planning Commission intentionally, or the, I'm sorry, the Public Safety Commission intentionally or intentionally really did violate city policy and requirements. Um, the city staff did inform the Public Safety Commission of those requirements, but for whatever reason, they did not follow them before uh, sending the recommendation to the city council. The city council does not seem to have been fully aware of this because the memo briefing the city council on July 13th was quite limited. Um, the, among the many violations, and there were many, uh, it requires that streets must have a minimum daily average traffic volume of 500 vehicles per day. That may be true of Doom Drive. I'm not so sure it's true of the section of Fernhill they're talking about putting bumps on. You do need to get the signatures of 60% or more of the residents of the streets affected. Not only was that not done, but for the year that this matter was being considered, there was no attempt to notify all the residents involved. Um, it was also noted in the record that the problems of traffic were greater on Birdview and Doom than Fernhill. And as uh, Don mentioned, uh, the traffic speed requirements have never been exceeded as required. So I would encourage you and urge you, there's the time to do it right. It, two reasons to do it right. One is 
to, for the citizens. You ask the citizens to comply with, with the city's rules and regulations. The city should set the example. And secondly, it's the smart thing to do because usually important information comes out. The, the fire department does have concerns and Santa Monica has in fact taken out some of their speed bumps because of fire department concerns. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention with a little, little, little time left is that we on Point Doom, as I believe some or all city council members are aware of, really are uh, experiencing much higher traffic from the beach, uh, both foot traffic and, and parking problems. I just wanted to let the council know that uh, there's a number of people on Point Doom that are beginning to show interest in reviving or creating a good Point Doom Neighborhood Association so we can examine these problems and uh, come up with good solutions because the temptation is to do something quick uh, not that I want to delay it, but to do something that in the end doesn't work. So those are my simply my three comments. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that it for public speakers? That was our final speaker for items not on the agenda. Okay, great. Um, we'll go on to any commission reports? Or we city do not manager, have any please. commissioners that have signed up to speak. Okay, let's, uh, Reva, are you ready for the city manager update? Yes, I am. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'd actually like to start. I um, asked uh, somebody from Water District 29, Russ Bryden, who is the acting assistant deputy director, to give a brief update uh, to the council and the community on the temporary generators for the Big Rock neighborhood. So I'd like to uh, introduce Russ Bryden, and then I'll speak with my updates after he's done. Thank you. Russ, you can go ahead. Good evening. Mic check. Yep. You're there, Russ. Outstanding. Well, good evening, Mayor Pearson and council members, and thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Russ Bryden, and I am the acting head of the county's waterworks districts. I'm here tonight on behalf of Los Angeles County Public Works Director Mark Pastrello to provide you with a brief update on power resilience in waterworks district 29. Malibu, this is your system. At your July 8th council meeting, Director Pastrella committed to undertaking a power resilience benchmarking study and to explore pre-deployment of backup generators at District 29's 30 different pump stations. The Waterworks team has been hard at work completing this task. We reached out to dozens of similarly situated water agencies along the West Coast and even as far away as agencies in Australia. The goal of the study was to understand how these agencies address power interruptions to compare industry trends against what we do here in District 29, and to look for opportunities to improve our service. The study's being finalized now and should actually be ready to be shared in the coming weeks. Um, I'm here tonight to, to give you some updates on our initial findings. So one of the very first things we discovered in talking to other agencies was how unique and special the Malibu community is. There is literally no place like Malibu any place else on the West Coast. Your miles of coast that transition immediately to sweeping hillsides, the many steep canyons and winding roads that lead to secluded homes, and your rural setting and the integration with surrounding undeveloped land are really quite unique. And of course, you already know this. In terms of power resilience, though, the information we gathered really can be grouped into three categories. Infrastructure operations and upgrades, communications and remote control, and then backup power. So I'll briefly report our findings for each of these three categories. We'll talk first about infrastructure and, and uh, operations. <clears throat> In response to uh, increased power interruptions, most similarly situated water systems have chosen to upsize the volume of their storage tanks and to keep them as full as possible during fire season. For us here in District 29, our team, what we found is that our team does an excellent job of keeping our tanks topped off. We're right in line with industry practices for our operations. We did find that in District 29, that we do have an opportunity to build additional resilience into the water system by increasing the volume of strategically located water tanks. This is one of the items that we're looking forward to exploring more with the community and with your council and really building on the past planning efforts that we've completed, such as District 29's Water System Master Plan, which I understand you're all very familiar with. The second kind of cluster of common industry trends we found was concerning communications and remote operations. 
we found that most similarly situated water agencies have limited ability to communicate with and remotely operate their tanks and other infrastructure during a power outage. For us here in District 29, we found that our current communications and remote operations infrastructure actually far outpaces industry standards. We're doing a great job in this. We have very strong ability to operate our facilities from offsite and to do so during power interruptions. And being able to do this greatly improves the system's resilience. So that third cluster of common practices that we found um, was backup power supply. Really, this is generators. Our benchmarking showed that most similarly situated water agencies attempt to equip their key pump stations with some form of backup power supply. We found that typically these agencies attempted to install permanent generators on site and where it wasn't feasible, then they used mobile generators. So District 29, our current practice, we utilize a fleet of mobile generators to provide backup during power outages. The Waterworks team has wired each one of our pump stations with a quick connection that allows for a mobile generator to immediately provide power once it's placed on site. Additionally, our teams drill, so we're actually out there drilling on emergency generator deployment. This includes practice runs of delivering and connecting generation generators to each of our 30 pump stations so that when the real thing comes, our team knows exactly what has to happen and how everything fits together. But what District 29 doesn't have is permanent on-site generators. Our fleet of generators is 100% mobile. Um, and there may be opportunity here, we think, to build additional resilience into the system by exploring permanent on-site generators. So to that end, I'm happy to report tonight that Waterworks staff is undertaking a pilot project to study the feasibility of permanently installing generators at pump stations throughout District 29. So to get us started, we've selected the Big Rock, the Big Rock Canyon area as the location of this pilot project. The thought was that this community was very supportive of having fixed generators. And with their help, we could potentially get the generators pre-deployed prior to the upcoming fire season. The pilot's well underway and we're on track to have these generators pre-deployed by early September. There are three pump stations that serve the Big Rock community, a lower, middle, and upper location. Generators are necessary at each of these three pump stations in order to refill the tank at the top of the system. If one location is missing, we can't get water up to that tank. So to date, for those three pump stations, the generators at the three pump stations, we've secured a permit from a property owner to place a generator at the uppermost pump station. Also, we're close to securing a permit with property owner with a property owner adjacent to the lower pump station. We haven't been as successful with that middle pump station. We could not locate a supportive property owner near that station, but as a plan B, Waterworks staff is working closely with city staff to build a retaining wall and carve out part of a hillside to create space to park the generator. Now, this by no means is ideal, but we're optimistic it'll work. Um, and already what we found is that this pilot study is generating some pretty useful findings that will inform our practices for the rest of the district. The same characteristics that make Malibu so unique and such a desirable community to live in also present challenges to us constructing permanent generators. The narrow canyon roads with no sidewalks limit the amount of public right-of-way we have to place these generators. Many of our pump stations hang off the edge of steep cliffs or carved into hillsides, and the generators we're talking about, they're not small. They're roughly eight feet wide, eight feet high, and 15 feet long. Now, there are, of course, engineering solutions to placing these generators at these pump station locations, but they're not cheap. Really, I think the most straightforward approach to placing permanent generators at these locations is to work with nearby property owners and acquire an easement to locate the generator. However, what we're finding is that while the community at large may support permanent generators, individual homeowners can sometimes be hesitant or even opposed to providing part of their property to make this happen. These are all important lessons learned, and we'll continue to gather these lessons from the pilot project and to share them with you and your city staff. Additionally, we'll continue to provide Ms. Feldman with status updates on generator pre-deployment and make sure to send an announcement when all three are in place. So again, thank you for your time tonight. I'm available for questions and can stay, on long, stay online for as long as you need. Um, and thank you, Reva. This concludes my update. Thank you, Russ. Excellent. I got a question, if I could. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, Russ, thank you very much for coming tonight. That's all great news. 
and it's actually really um, wonderful. I think that's a great solution, and I'm glad to see that uh, Mark Pastrella uh, is honoring his commitment and doing what's necessary to uh, do this pilot program, which I think could have great benefit if it's done throughout the city of Malibu. And I think as the neighborhoods look into it, they will realize that it is quite valuable. So I really appreciate all the hard work from uh, Public Works and for you to come down here and, and tell us all about this. It's, it's great. And it's um, the, the Big Rock community should also be commended for really pushing the issue and, you know, amidst all the other things we got going on, this is really one of those things that could be very decisive at a very key moment in time. And they know what that's all about, having suffered two fires and the 93 fire. So I just wanted to ask if you had a timeline of when you thought uh, these permanent things, are, are you looking at this year to do those? If you said that, I missed that part. So for the pilot program that we have running in the Big Rock area, our goal is to have all three pump stations equipped with generators by the start of this fire season. So it's only about a month away, a little bit more than a month. As I said, I think we've made good progress on this um, and we should have them in place on schedule. That's very rapid and uh, I'm very familiar being a county employee, how slow government can work, especially <laughs> in these times of austerity. So. Uh, I know I speak for all the council members and everybody in, in Malibu when I say I really appreciate the commitment from Public Works and Mark Pastrella has got, you know, 10 million people that he's responsible for and he was very kind to come out here and address our issues. And so please take that our thanks back to him because super impressive work. I will, Councilman. Thank you for saying that. Sarah? Thanks, Mikey. Um, yeah, I... Too, would like to say thank you very much, Russ. Um, we appreciate uh, the progress to date and the follow through and, and uh, I won't repeat everything. I, I just uh, echo all of Rick's comments. Um, I'm just curious, how many mobile generators does Water District 29 have? We are in the process, we have five currently. We're in the process of securing five or six additional um, those are expected any day. Uh, we have a commitment that if those six can't come in, that we will rent generators until they are physically in place. So we should have, I think it's approximately 11 mobile generator, generators staged at our Malibu yard prior to fire, fire season beginning. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, um, how many or were you able to get uh, any of these into Malibu during the Woolsey fire? So <clears throat> I am new to this position. I don't have much information on prior um, prior happenings. I'd be happy to look into this and get back to you. Um, I do have some information about our operations during the Woolsey fire, but not specific, specific information like this. If you'd permit it, I'll get back to the city manager with that information. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again, Russ. Excellent report. Very encouraging and uh, Thank you, Reva, for uh, having Russ come on. It was excellent. Of course, thank you. And thank you, Russ and uh, Water District 29 in the county. Um, I do think they really um, stepped up when we asked them to, so I appreciate that. Um, I have a few updates for this evening. Uh, first, our update on COVID. Um, the latest report from the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health reflects 208,528 positive cases in Los Angeles County. Of that, 86 positive cases have been reported in Malibu uh, with two uh, very unfortunate uh, deaths. Um, the most recent order from the Los Angeles County Public uh, Health is from July 18th, and that order is still in place um, as of today. Um, there has been no update to that order. And um, I wanted to also make sure everybody knows that we are expecting some very hot and dry weather at the end of this week uh, with some severe uh, fire uh, danger. And so it's a really good time. Uh, we are, you know, even though official fire season doesn't start for a bit, uh, we really are in fire season all year round. So I wanna make sure that everybody has done their brush clearance. If you need help from the city, Jerry Vandermulen can come out and do a walk around with your with you at your property uh, with social distancing and masks on to make sure that your home is safe. 
Um, and I also wanted to share that the city staff um, has been actively training to make sure that we're ready to assist and respond to any disaster, including a fire, uh, even though uh, we are still under the uh, COVID stay at home orders. So we did conduct an EOC drill using Zoom with all of our partner agencies last week, and we'll continue to train in that manner. Uh, we've been working with the Red Cross to make sure that we have proper protocols in place uh, for evacuations. Obviously, the requirements to um, house people in emergency shelters has changed with COVID-19. Um, there's quite a few news articles about the um, uh, Apple fire out in Riverside County, and they were actually putting evacuees in hotel rooms. Um, so it's, you know, a, a fluid process right now as everybody tries to get up to speed, but it is something that the city is making sure that we are prepared uh, to assist our community. Um, we also, um, after the Woolsey fire, as you know, uh, did a robust evacuation plan that included establishing zones in Malibu, similar to what Topanga has. And so over the next coming weeks, uh, the community can start to expect to see information and kind of an education campaign on those zones, uh, which we hope to be using, or and I hope I don't have to use them at all. But if there is a fire, uh, we would use those to notify the community in the event of an evacuation. Um, and then also just to remind everybody, if you have not done so, please make sure you've signed up for alerts. Um, and you can do all that on the city's website and get more information about how to prepare for an emergency. You can also download our new emergency preparedness guide from, from the city's website. Um, in regards to our fire rebuilding process, we have 242 single family homes that have been approved through planning, 130 building permits that have been issued. And just last week, we were uh, able to deliver our seventh certificate of occupancy. And we have quite a few more homes that are in the queue to be finished. So uh, very good news there. Um, City Hall remains open by appointment only, um, but you can um, do anything you need to do uh, with this that City Hall has always provided you uh, by going online, uh, either whether you wanted to submit something online or get a permit, you can purchase that online as well um, or make an appointment to come in. And then just a couple upcoming um, items on August 12th, the California Coastal Commission uh, a monthly meeting, there'll be uh, an item for Malibu, it's item 19B, where they'll be hearing the Fire Resistant Landscape Ordinance, LCPA, um, and we're expecting that to go through without any problems. So that'll be really wonderful to have that done. Um, on August 15th, the uh, Lost Hill Sheriff Station will actually be holding an e-waste collection and a document shred day. Um, we haven't had any of those since COVID started, so, um, you can certainly take advantage of that at the sheriff's station. And um, then last on September 8th, the planning commission meeting uh, will be hearing a permit application from Caltrans for the Trancus Bridge uh, replacement project, which will also include um, the addition of a right turn lane um, at Trancus and PCH. So um, that concludes my report. Unless the council, if you'd like me to answer some of the questions from the speakers, I'll be happy to do so at this time. Do you have anything you can eliminate on the speed hub some point in? Certainly, yes. So um, I, as you recall, and as uh, the speaker said, um, we did uh, receive a recommendation from the Public Safety Commission to install speed humps on Point Doom, uh, on several streets on Point Doom, and um, council for that item and approved it. Uh, we were going to proceed with moving forward um, on that item as quickly as possible uh, due to some other priorities uh, in our workload for our street maintenance crews. Um, under that contract, we've decided to wait. Um, so I don't believe that's going to move forward for about another six months or so. And we'll certainly let the community know when that is going to happen. Um, but if the council would like us to come back and revisit it, we can do that as well. Um, the other two notes that I had down were regarding the tow yard and um, CHP services in Malibu. Would you like me to speak to those, Mayor? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so the tow yard, um, you know, has been <laughs> this uh, long, ongoing, long uh, battle for Malibu tow. Um, I worked uh, closely with them. I provided them with 
um, every site in the city that is zoned correctly for their activities. Uh, what Malibu Tow or any other tow company would need to do is um, first get permission from the property owner and then come to the city to get a permit for those activities, which would include some environmental review. Um, that has yet to happen, um, but I did speak with um, the chair of the Public Works Commission um, last week and we talked about that, I'm sorry, the Public Safety Commission, and we talked about um, whether there was any ability under the urgency um, of the COVID-19 emergency whereby we might be able to waive some of the requirements. So I'm looking into that with the planning department. I don't have um, a definite answer, but I am looking to see what we could do on an urgency basis for this summer to assist um, the towing activities. Um, and then in regards to the CHP services in Malibu, um, as uh, the community might recall over Memorial Day, um, I took it upon myself to make sure that we had sufficient resources um, here in Malibu. So we augmented the services that we have uh, from the Sheriff's Department and hired two dedicated CHP officers for that long weekend. Um, what we were able to do was hire CHP officers on an overtime basis. Um, and if anybody's been following the administration and finance subcommittee agenda that came through last week, uh, we did talk about um, some of the direction that the city council had given us to supplant CHP officers uh, with sheriff deputies. Um, at this time, um, and we'll talk about this um, at the August 24th budget update meeting, um, but at this time, it does not appear that the CHP um, West Valley Station has enough officers to be able to give us a dedicated officer. And so that would mean that we could hire someone, but it would be on an on-call overtime basis only. And my concern is that may not give us everything we need that we get from a dedicated sheriff deputy to our community. Um, and obviously keeping everybody safe is our highest priority. Um, so uh, we'll be bringing forward some recommendations that uh, would allow us to be able to have CHP on call for or, uh, busy weekends or if there's a PSPS um, um, instance where we might have some power outages, we have an agreement in place with CHP that the council previously authorized where we could use them. So I hope that answers everyone's questions on that. Thank you very much. Um, you done with your report? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, council, um, Karen, do you have a update for us? <clears throat> sure. Um, well, uh, as usual, it's been uh, a flurry of uh, Zoom meetings for me, and I think probably for everybody. Uh, I attended my first Library Foundation committee meeting. Uh, the COG had both its regular meeting and a special meeting, which was regarding uh, legislation that was of concern to the five COG cities. Uh, most of it regarding housing and some bills that were are working their way through Sacramento. Two of them have already um, been dropped off the calendar. So um, the COG came to the conclusion that uh, it's one for all and all for one. And since we did not have a unanimous uh, decision at the COG, we didn't move forward uh, on opposing that legislation. Um, and it was nine bills. It was a lot of things to, to look at at one time. Uh, I had both a regular and a special meeting of the LA Division Governing Board of the League. And again, it was a regular meeting and then a special meeting regarding housing legislation. Uh, I've been on several county public health briefings, including today. And the main message is that the numbers are slightly down, uh, according to Dr. Ferrer, even with the reporting problems that have been in the news lately. And she uh, said that she is cautiously optimistic. So that's good news, it's not great news. Um, you know, we have had the usual summer traffic issues, uh, including two recent fatalities, one pedestrian and one single car uh, crash that was a fatality. So yeah, I do also hope, I think with the rest of the council that we can augment our coverage because the only deterrent 
seems to be increased enforcement. Um, I'll just, uh, two quick reminders. People, anybody listening, please fill out the census by September 30th. It won't take more than 10 minutes. Uh, the link, the website is my2020census.org. Uh, and there's critical federal funding for all of us involved in that. And Malibu is um, underreported even compared to uh, other LA County cities. Um, and also just a reminder, the city has produced this excellent emergency survival guide. Please, uh, you can email skaplan at malibucity.org and request a copy. Um, it's a really valuable thing to have. Um, as far as the comments tonight, um, I just wanna say thanks to everybody who's contacted me and all of us uh, about our short-term rental agenda item tonight. I have had a complete spectrum of opinions um, from one end to the other. So I can't say that I've received a communication that's heavily um, in favor against, uh, in favor of amending as is. It's been all over the map. Um, and yeah, the doom drive speed humps. Um, I know that Chris Frost, I wanna thank both Don and Jane. I know they've put a lot of time and effort into uh, communicating with us and looking into the issue. Um, I believe you were both CC'd and if not, I could forward uh, an email that was sent out by the Public Safety Commission Chair, Chris Frost, uh, after the last meeting when this was discussed. And in that, email, he states that he and the uh, commission studied that issue, that particular issue for two years. So the decision was not arrived at in haste and um, not uh, in an indeliberate manner. Um, I just wanna make sure you know that. Uh, and I guess now it's, uh, it's delayed. So, you know, maybe, maybe we look at it again, I don't know. Uh, if the council wants to do that, but it, it looks like um, it's not happening right away anyway. So um, I think that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Jefferson, do you have comments tonight? Uh, yes, thank you, Mikey. Appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Skylar and I had a uh, Zoracis meeting uh, um, this week, Zoom, and I don't want to let uh, just myself speak on it, but Skyler may want to speak in some depth on it, but we did move forward the standalone parking initiative that started about a year ago, but because of all the issues, uh, wasn't given the priority, but now it's going to be on our plate. Hopefully uh, some of this before uh, Skyler and I are off the council, we move that forward. Uh, that's my only commission report. We did hear from several speakers, um, Lance, Simmons, Andy Lyon, and Jane Albright on the, the letter that went and was expanded upon, opinionated by Mitch McConnell. I was just ask, curious if we could ask either yourself or Karen, I mean, not Karen, uh, Reva, uh, how it came about, because I did get some of those ugly emails as you did, I'm sure, that came on our city emails. Uh, well, I wouldn't even repeat them, uh, and I, I'm just disappointed that so many people read into this uh, opinions that uh, have no manifestation in reality. But if somebody could explain to those viewers that are watching now and the ones that may contact us by email in the future, how the letter came about, and then we can get over that. Thank you, Mike. I'll explain it in detail in my comments. Copy that. Thank you. I'm all done. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, Rick? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention a while ago, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but I, in my other job, I was in a fire that was in Big Rock and, um, I may have mentioned this, but I don't think so. We, we showed up there as a little brush fire in a gully started by some weed whacker guys and it, we were actually on another fire when that happened. So we had to get cut loose from that and, and get there. And, uh, the cool thing was the neighbors were out hooked up to the fire hydrant already suppressing the flames because it was in a gully on one side there were no houses and then 
on the, on the side that they were spraying on is where the houses were. So before the fire department even showed up, they were out taking decisive action. And, you know, when the dust settled down, I sat down one of the neighbors and, and said, what's the program here? And they said, oh, yeah, we got a little neighborhood group is on Rock Point. And, they, you know, there's some enterprising movie, uh, like stunt guy or special effects guy that lives there that kind of trained them all. So it was really impressive. And I think a lot of those neighborhood readiness actions can be, I'm not encouraging everybody to go out and put out your own fires, but um, the neighborhood working together uh, was really cool to see. And I forgot to mention that last time. So I just want to bring that up. It was on the 16th of July. I want to comment on some of the speakers. Bill Sampson, I hear you on the broad beach uh, speeding, but as you can see from the point doing thing, it's probably best to get the neighborhood involved and get a consensus, etc. I'm personally, I'm a big fan of the speed pumps. They work great in our neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I even noticed they're on Pacific Avenue in Santa Monica, and it really wasn't uh, an impediment. Um, but that's my personal opinion. And I, in my neighborhood, I would want everybody to uh, be a part of the process. So if you're interested in doing that, I would say learn from these comments that have happened on Point Doom, because there are some people that are very pro, and there are some people that are against it. And I think you do kind of have, a, have to have a robust discussion with everybody who's going to have to deal with it in that neighborhood. I think that's appropriate. And I think those comments are good. Um, Don McClay, I liked your comments. I even got your thing you sent to us right afterwards. Uh, put together like a true engineer, I must say, citing all the directives, chapter and verse, very organized. Um, as Karen said, um, it's been delayed. Probably a good time for the neighborhood to drop back and punt and figure out what they want to do. But we hear you. And um, like I said, I'm a fan of speed humps. And I think that speeding around here is getting uh, worse. But that's your neighborhood. That's not my neighborhood. And I think you're right about there should be consensus, et cetera. Uh, Joe and Colin Drummond, we hear you. But there's an agenda item. Normally, the when you spoke is for things not on the agenda. It's probably more appropriate to bring those things up during that agenda item. I'm not sure if you weren't able to stay for later, but uh, you know, just my recommendation, speak when, when our minds are focused on that. Um, I already made my comments about the waterworks chap and I uh, look forward to the mayor's comments about the, the you know, wading, wading into national politics, that's no party. And uh, my sympathies are with you, but it was a surprise to me too. And I'm sure it's probably just a bias for action, wanting to get things done with all the right intentions. And, uh, uh, you know, Malibu is everybody's favorite whipping boy. And if they can score some points on it and portray us as Rodeo Drive by the Sea, they won't miss the opportunity. So um, anyway, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Peep. Good evening, Mayor. Um, thank you. Um, so, yes, as Jefferson mentioned and as Rick mentioned, uh, with Jefferson, we had his racist meeting um, last week, and we were discussing some of the uh, parking as a standalone use um, uh, for commercial properties. Um, we elected to send that to the Planning Commission for them to look at it um, with some specific parameters. I'm not going to get into all the details of that right now, but look for that coming to the Planning Commission and then back to Council. Um, after it goes there. Um, and I think Rick kind of touched on our ANF meeting, but, you know, just to kind of reiterate that the city, you know, the COVID thing is going to be a little bit challenging for it, but I, I think that we will, it'll be challenging for the entire city fiscally, and I think we will get through it. Um, I, uh, you know, I think for our city as a whole, um, I appreciate all the hard work um, that our staff has done um, while they've been working remotely and everybody can, a lot of people continue to work remotely, um, but that it, you know, a couple people may not be coming back to work at the city based on our budgeting stuff. So I think that that's a hard thing um, and nobody um, ever wants to be in that position. And I just really commend Reva, Lisa and everyone else for, for stepping up um, across the board to come up with ways for us to be, I think, fiscally responsible as we move forward. Um, and I will leave my comments at that. Other than the thing with the speed humps on Point Doom, I appreciate the, the comments from, from Don and others with concerns about it. 
you know, I, this was some, some of these points were raised before when the speed humps were added on the point. Um, I think that, you know, the, the irony of it is I feel like a couple people that were against it wind up supporting it because I think people, it does slow cars down. Um, the complaints that I've got and I've still got is from a couple residents that, you know, kind of uh, jokingly state those damn things forced me to slow down <laughs> and they're just frustrated because they, they wind up slowing down, but they all, they also, I think have humor in it that it's, it's for the better. So, um, you know, again, I've been spending some time working on doom drive a lot lately and, um, you know, I've gotten scared there a couple of times just with how fast people are going. So I think that it's real. I think that people that live on those streets and Fern Hill, um, do have concerns about that. I understand the concerns that have been raised in regards to first responders. I think those have been addressed. I think the um, Public Safety Commission has done a good job of looking at that. Um, but I, I've, and I've also, you know, heard from a lot of people that want them out of their streets. So in particular, the Broad Beach area, um, Bill, a couple of your other neighbors up there uh, have, you know, gone to the extent of contacting myself and maybe other council members, but we've kind of pointed them in the direction of talking with people and trying to get signatures, but that's probably not the best thing during COVID. Um, <laughs> people don't want just to, you know, somebody randomly knocking on their door. So um, I think when this stuff settles down, there may be more support for that elsewhere. And I thank Reva for looking at the priorities of the city and adjusting things. I know that they can't get done right now on point two, but I think that long-term that's the right decision. Um, and maybe in the meantime, Reva, we can direct the sheriffs to have some more enforcement, you know, particularly on Point Doom and Broad Beach uh, in regards to speeding on, you know, Fern Hill, Doom Drive, uh, Broad Beach Road, um, and anywhere else that, you know, people suggested in the city. So. We'll do. I'll ask for that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. That's it. Thank you, Skylar. Um, well, welcome back. It's been like a month, five weeks since we met. So long time sitting at home with COVID. Um, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, Bill Simpson, I hear you. Broad Beach is definitely got some very fast drivers. And I think you can see that there's sort of a way to get speed bumps done, speed humps done. Um, I think the same issue exists on Malibu Road. I was actually there maybe last week and heard a car go by. It sounded like they were doing 70. I don't know really what they were doing, but I know it's an issue there. Um, so thank you for all the speakers on that issue. Not sure where we end up on it. Craig, Mr. Hill, I think interesting points on uh, speaker minutes and hands raised and Zoom. The problem I see is it's not a terrible idea is that we don't actually see all the speakers. So that's tricky, especially if an item's up, you only see like four speakers. So I see some technical issues there, um, but still with technology, not a terrible idea at all. And I just wanna thank Russ again, and I wanna thank the Big Rock neighborhood on this water pump generator issue. I think uh, really your efforts in Big Rock have made a huge difference. It's makes me really happy to see that. I think, uh, yeah, we're all worried about fire season. So I see your thumbs up there, Colin. Good job by the neighborhood. Really, really, really well done. As far as my other comments, um, as Karen said, please, please fill out the census. My2020census.gov, I believe is the address. It's really easy to find. It doesn't take long. I'm looking at some of the numbers. It's embarrassing. My neighborhood of Malibu West has the best rate that I was sent here, 46.8%. That's not good. So it's uh, it really does make a difference. So please, 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 please get the census done. It's becoming a worrisome time on that. I want to address, I saw some emails related to undergrounding. And I know some people are frustrated trying to get that done. It's a difficult project. And I know since you started, it's been difficult and things change. And it's really, really expensive. Please know that I've checked on this and the city's doing its best to help. We want you to underground. It doesn't make it any easier. So um, I just want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge something that a number of people brought to my attention, I think was mentioned here tonight, 
and that's the Point Doom Headlands parking issue. I started getting sent a whole bunch of pictures, and I drove over there myself. It, it does kind of kind of blows my mind. There's cars parked everywhere in the road, up on the curb on the headland side. There's actually not a curb in one part, so it's like a little ramp you can drive up. People are driven uh, driven up there. I, I don't even get it. It's like it's a ticket, and it seems like nobody cares. And there's a herd of cars, not a few cars. They're all over the place. So I don't know what we can do about that, but I think it's crazy how bad that's gotten. It's really shocking to me, actually. Um, I don't know what better we could do. There's a parking lot not that far away. Can we get figure out how to get people to go park in it, walk up the path. But I was really caught off guard with that. And I know I haven't been driving a whole lot, but I did go by there to check that out. And yes, there was cars parked everywhere. So there's that. And now I want to address um, my letter to my best friend, Mitch. So on August 4th, I joined with many other cities around the state and nationally in sending letters to Congress to advocate for small cities and the next round of stimulus funds that were being considered. I'd received a number of emails from the National and California League of Cities urging members, of which we are one, to con contact Congress as small cities are not included in the bill and are taking an enormous financial hit, some much more than Malibu, as you know. The National and California League of Cities are organizations that help educate and advocate for cities. As you know, we're very involved in the league. The letter that I sent was mostly a form letter provided by the league and the executive system of the city helped me put it together on letterhead. Um, there was an urgency of it or normally I absolutely would have waited. Hopefully most of you have seen the letter by now. If not, let me know, I'll get you a copy. So then as you know, what happened next is Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell went on various news outlets and claim that Malibu is asking for $500 million for electric cars and other versions of that, $500 million. That is a gross mischaracterization or complete lie of what I wrote in the letter. At no time did I even ask for money for Malibu. All I did was advocate for small cities and point out um, that some of the council approved projects that we were having to modify them or cancel them due to the pandemic. Basically, Mitch and his staff decided to politicize the issue and decided to go after Malibu to do it. A couple of other points. Some people have questioned how or why I could send that letter on my own without discussing with council. Ordinarily, that would happen. But this was time sensitive and advocating is exactly the reason we were elected. This is what we do on city council. And I will never stop advocating for Malibu and joining with other cities when we need strength in numbers, never. And those that question the danger of an elected person sending a letter, because God knows what they will say. Yeah, you're right. And there's a lot of evidence of this. You just have to look at Washington DC or Mitch McConnell's office to see proof. But there is something you can do about politicians, including me, including anyone, that say things you don't like or that lie. Don't vote for them. Another thing, for those of you that decided city manager Reva Feldman had something to do with this, that is completely untrue. She never even saw the letter before it was sent. That is not her role. And that the media decided the letter was from her is very unfair. And I've done everything I can do to correct it. And for that, I apologize for that happening, Reva. You work extremely hard, and that was completely unfair. So lessons learned by me. First, I will never stop fighting for Malibu. Not Mitch or anyone else is going to do that to me. I don't care what you say or what you make up. Second is that we send out quite a few letters, and even during crazy busy days, I will make sure they represent Malibu in a positive fashion. There's a certain irony to Mitch's comments. He has a very long record of adding millions and millions of dollars for his state on completely unrelated bills. Just a few examples. Tax breaks for the liquor, the spirits distillers in his state, in Kentucky, 
have already totaled more than $426 million this year. He also secured tax breaks uh, for their thoroughbred horses. I guess that's a thing. And he's appropriated millions and millions of dollars for projects that have ended up being named after him. So that is really interesting. There's the Mitch McConnell Park in Bowling Green. In Owensboro, there's the Mitch McConnell Plaza and Walkway. In Western Univers Kentucky University, there's the Mitch McConnell Integrated Applications Laboratory. And the University of Kit uh, Kentucky has the Mitch McConnell Center for Distance Learning. Might be helpful right now. Each of these came from tens of millions of dollars tacked onto other bills. So it's notable to me that when Mitch McConnell cited the letter, he never mentioned it also talked about enacting emergency orders, setting up testing for COVID, helping local businesses survive, rebuilding from the Woolsey fire, or a resiliency projects related to fire prevention and preparedness. It makes me think, it makes me worry that he really doesn't care about small cities. And also makes me realize that I never think the decisions I make on city council in terms of Republican or Democrat. That's just not how I feel here in Malibu and with the decisions I make. But I'm acutely aware that on the state and national level, that is not true. So Mitch, I get that you're running for re-election. Yet again, low approval ratings, and I'm sure you have some fans in Malibu, but at least get your facts right if you're going to go after Malibu. That's what I have to say. So let's move on. We have the consent calendar and I have a note here. So I want to ask how to handle it, but Jefferson has to recuse himself on one item. Is that correct, Jefferson? Yes, thank you, Mayor Pearson. Uh, I would like to recuse myself on that uh, Civic Center work project. I believe it's 3B9, 3B9. Yep. I would like to recuse myself from that. Thank you very much for reminding me and for the record so that our city attorney understands that I will recuse myself from 3B9. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, how should we procedurally handle the recusal? Is anything else being pulled from the consent calendar? Great question. Um, do we have anyone else on council want to pull any of the consent items? Oh, Karen? Sorry, just just a quick question. I don't, I don't. This isn't exactly pulling it, but um, item three B nine, please. All right. Yes. So, and Jefferson's recusing himself on that one. So, I suspect we have to hear it separately. Is that true? Yeah. I would make a motion to approve the consent calendar um, and pulling um, out. If I can interject, we yeah. do have a couple of items that are pulled by the public. If right. you want to hear yeah. that before a motion. Yeah. Of course. Of course. What items does the public want to pull? Items three A one. 3B5, 3B6, 3B7, and 3B8. Okay, I, I might have lost track. 3A1, 3B5, yes. 3B6, and what else? 3B7 and 3B8. Oh, good times. Okay, so the motion will be for... Treat the consent calendar except for items 3A1, uh, 3B5, 3B... Six, three B eight, three B nine. No, I think three B seven and three B eight were pulled by the public. And then, if you wanted to pull three B nine, I guess do we need to pull it because of the recusal? Yeah. Well, if, there, if there's questions about it, then we should pull. We'll just pull it, and then uh, uh, Councilmember Wagner can vote on the balance of the consent calendar, and then we'll go through the items. And when it comes to three B nine, he'll need to uh, to uh, disconnect. And recuse himself from that one. And I just wanted to be clear, I was adding 3B7 to that so that we're on the same page. Okay, okay. Do we have that? Yes, so we'd be pulling items 3A1, 3B5, 3B6, 3B7, 3B8. Those were all pulled by the public and then also 3B9 for questions. Okay, do we have, uh, Karen? Uh, I just want to say, sorry, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not asking for a full staff report on 3B9. I just want to ask a question when we get to that point. Okay. Um, do we have a second on the consent items that are, are not being pulled? I'll second. Okay. Can we have a roll call on that? 
Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, now let's go to the first consent item uh, 3A1. Um, second reading adoption of ordinance number 467. And I guess short staff report. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so this item was basically um, up, updating our emergency ordinance in order to show that we are going to comply with the Emergency Services Act and state that our Disaster Council will meet at least once per year and also updating our res resolution relative to um, disaster service workers. Um, essentially, it's not gonna change anything that we currently do. The state just wanted cities to update their emergency ordinances since most cities, including ours, adopted it more than 20 years ago. And things have changed in the state, uh, particularly the um, complying with the California Emergency Services Act and that uh, it now is regulated by the California Emergency Office of Emergency Services as opposed to the California Disaster Council. So there's changes in terminology and things like that, but essentially not much is uh, changing for us. Okay. Um... Do we have speakers on? Thank you for the report. Uh, do we have speakers on this item? Yes, we have one public speaker, Hamish Patterson. Okay. Hamish, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Hey, um, for some reason, I didn't get in on the uh, the public comment period. I, I don't know what happened. I kept did it a couple times. So I'm going to do my public comment now, and uh, you can just roll with me. I do have some uh, some issues with the letter, Mikey, and it and it's the tone deaf nature of it, not what you did. First of all, cities are the economic engines of our state and the backbone of our nation is factually untrue. It's the citizenry of our country. It is the working people of this country that are the backbone of this nation. It's not cities. This the people that work and the small businesses of this country provide the tax base which the cities depend upon. That I have real issue with that. Secondly, I have this thing where, where's all this money coming from? You want to dig into the federal coffers. Where is this money coming from? There's no money there. Nobody's working. We've all sat back and let this situation happen. And it's alarming. I don't know if anyone's driven into the city of Los Angeles anytime recently. It is very alarming. I suggest everybody on the city council, everybody in the government, go take a tour through our city and realize the economic disaster that's coming our way. And so when we talk about these city budgets, there's not going to be any money next year and the year after if we don't pull out of this. And I just say that, look, the reason the cities of California are broke isn't COVID. It is unfunded liabilities. You have a state that has $85 billion in re retiree health benefits that are unfunded. You have $93 billion in pensions in the state of California unfunded. That is why the cities don't have any money. It's not COVID. It is bad management. And to put that on the backs of the federal government, again, I I'd say that is, is a smoke and mirrors thing. And the secondly is, look. I said before, would you guys please start asking questions about how, why we're locking down our society? Because you have on August 6th, the high quote from the, the Los Angeles Public Health, high numbers of new cases due to backlog of test results. That is just one anomaly from the 6th. Almost every day there's anomaly of their reporting issues. You had three days ago, California State admit that they, are, they have had a glitch since July 25th. So you're telling me our entire economy is being KO'd because, and they don't have proper data collection. If you wanna tell me there is some sort of catastrophically of, of, of human misery coming our way, I suggest that it is the economy. There is a tidal wave heading our way. And if we as a city, we as a community don't get ready and start advocating for that city of 10 million people that is just over the city line over there, 
that wave of humanity is going to come somewhere and they're going to rightfully come here because you've made it clear that our we our what we're losing is electric vehicles we're sitting on the west side we, the kids out there aren't being educated the schools got shut down by strong arm practices by the teachers union and why isn't the city at least standing up and asking questions that's all i'm saying that's the tone deaf nature of this letter and i'm alarmed at it mikey i i come on you're smarter than this everyone on that city council is smarter hey, Mitch, than this you're out of time thank you thank you hamish um any more public speakers on 3A1? Not on this item. Okay, can we have, uh, is there a motion? Do we need a motion? We need a motion, right? Take the motion. Okay, second? Second. That would be staff's recommendation. For second staff's recommendation, yes. Um, okay, can we have roll call on that, please? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're on to 3B5 update on city facilities. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add um, other that was in the staff report. We just wanted to give a receive and file report uh, so that the council and the community would know uh, where we were in terms of all of the city facilities. Um, as you know, uh, both Bluffs Park and the skate park remain closed at this time, but we do have a plan which is outlined in the staff report um, as how we can open that safely uh, when the next reopening phase uh, is ordered by the county. So so be happy to answer any questions if you have them for me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have public speakers on this. Yes, we have one public speaker, Bruce Silverstein. Okay, Bruce, are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. I can hear you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. So first, I, I wanna publicly extend my gratitude and compliments to the city clerk, Heather Glazer, for the dedicated and delightful work she has done for the numerous candidates for city council over the past two weeks. She's been prompt, courteous, and helpful in the process, and she deserves recognition for the great work she's done for the city, largely from home during this pandemic. Um, secondly, I do wanna request that the Zoom call process be improved so that residents who participate in the meetings can be seen when they address the city council and the public at large. I recently had the pleasure of speaking at a meeting of the Coastal Commission, and they have their Zoom meeting set up so that speakers can be seen on the Zoom screen. For some reason, that feature malfunctioned when I was speaking, but it worked perfectly when Bonnie Blue addressed the Coastal Commission in opposition to my position. So I know the technology is available to allow the public speakers to be seen, and it can work. Um, relatedly, Craig Hill raised an excellent point, which is that while these Zoom meetings are occurring, they should, they should be occurring just like city council meetings occurred when we were there physically. We just can't be there physically. So people should be able to donate their time just like they were then. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, do we have any more public speakers on this? No, that was our only speaker. Okay, does anyone wanna make a motion on this? On motion, make the motion. Is that to receive and file uh, 3B5? Correct. I'll second. And Karen will second. Can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 3B6, Amendment to Professional Services Agreement with American Guard Services, Inc. Good evening, Council. Um, this is a, an amendment to our crossing guard services we have in the city, and I don't have anything further than the, the staff report, but... You're glitching. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Did you hear anything? No? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take off my, hold on. For some reason when I have my headphones on, they glitch up. Um, so uh, 
this item is an amendment for our crossing guard services with the city. I don't have anything further in the staff report and available for questions. Great. Do we have any public speakers on this item? Yes, we have one public speaker, Graham Clifford. Graham. Okay, Graham, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Um, Hi, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, I just wanted to talk about this because <clears throat> we have no schools going on. So I wanted to make sure that the guards were going to be reassigned and, and or put to work somewhere. Otherwise, they can be furloughed like a lot of other people have been. I mean, we could put it, for instance, we could put a guard or two up at the skate park and reopen the skate park. We could, we need guards at the library and, um, and um, and we need guards at a at a few of the construction sites that are presently going on. So I just I just wanted to make sure that um, as um, Skylar said recently, we need to be fiscally responsible. And as Rick also mentioned, austerity. That's where I'm at right now. So I'm just making sure that um, we either make use of these guards well or furlough them until schools come back or something something of the nature thanks guys thank you graham is there any other public speakers no that was our only speaker on this item okay um back to council here rob do you have any comments on that uh, yeah so we know that school is out and uh we are not going to imp use them out at the schools if they're not needed but if there's other uses we could use them for if there's uh, crossing guards needed at construction or down um, you know, on Civic Center or Cross Creek. If, if that need comes up, we'll, be, we'll have the ability to kind of use them. But right now we're just amending this. Hopefully that the schools will get back in session and we'll, we'll have them ready to go. But as of now, we're not going to um, use them if, if school's not there. Mayor, I do want to just add that this is a service for crossing guards only. These are not security guards. And so the services that they can provide uh, really only are to assist people crossing streets. Okay. Skylar? But this is, I mean, this is just a pay-as-you-go service. If we're not using it, we're not paying for it. And That's correct. I would like to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation. I'll second. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Now we're on to 3B7 Professional Services Agreement for On Call Land Surveying Services. Um, Rob, is that you again? That's me. It's going to be me all the way till nine. So, um, so we got uh, you. Okay. This is a um, our on-call land surveying um, service contract we we have with to help us with um, various land development or survey survey issues that come up. Um, I don't have anything. Once again, I don't have anything more that's in the staff report, but available for questions. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers on this item? We have one speaker on this item. It is Graham Clifford again. Okay. Graham, are you, are you on the line there? Yep, still here. Okay, off you go. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Austerity, um, um, I just want to make sure that we're not actually paying people at this time in our lives to be on call. Um, for, and I don't understand why the building and planning department can't do um, land surveying anyway, but... Uh, um, as long as we're not, as I discovered just above when Reba said that the guard services are uh, not, we're not paying for them if we don't use them anyway. I just want to make sure that this is the same, this is the same deal here, that we're not paying for someone to be standing around on call when, if we need them, we can just call them. That's it. Okay, thank you, Graham. Uh, Rob, would you care to comment on that? These services are on call, exactly what it sounds. We do, we use them when we need them. We're um, having a contract in case something comes up, um, very standard protocol. So that uh, definitely not paying for anything we're not using. And the services for uh, the surveyor are very unique and not something staff can do. Okay. Thank you for that detail. 
Um, seeing there's no other speakers, is there a, a motion or questions? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Okay, and the motion is to approve uh, 3B7, the staff report, the staff recommendation? Yes. Okay, uh, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Molly? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempic? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. Um, now on to 3B8. Um, Professional Services Agreement for On-Call Civil Engineering Services. Uh, Rob, um, are you there? Yes, uh, um, this is the same thing. This is for on-call engineering services we, we use during um, in public works. Once again, I'm, I'm available for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. I'm gonna guess our public speaker might be Graham. That would be correct, Graham Clifford. Excellent, hi Graham, are you still there? Hi, Mikey, I'm still here. <laughs> I, I don't need to, I don't need to respond to this one because Reva has answered my questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Graham. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak. Um, any more comments or, or a motion? I'll okay. make a motion. Okay. Second. Second. So we have uh, a motion to on um, 3B8 to recommend authorized city manager to execute professional service agreement. Um, can we yeah. have a roll call, please? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempic? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, now I guess we have to have uh, Councilmember Wagner disengage. Are you ready to get back on pretty soon? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will uh, do whatever it takes. Um, I hope we have standby help so I don't miss more of the meeting. I'm also going to go to the restroom. I oh, somebody I'll, I'll be sure to delay for a minute or so. Thank you. Okay. Jeffrey, you can call me with questions. Thank you. Can, we, can you turn off your, uh, your, your video? So. Okay. I guess is that gone enough, Trevor? I assume if if you, if you can hear me, Jefferson, uh, you need to leave the room. But it looks like he is disconnected and muted, and I think we should be good. Okay. Um, was there any public speakers on three B nine? We do not have any public speakers on this item. Okay. Does anyone want have questions or want to make a motion on this? I just have a quick question, and, and I don't want to uh, ask Rob for a staff report. Um, but in looking at this item, um, in, in reading the staff report, uh, there were five bids, and the bidding process was completed uh, in March. Um, and Rob, could you just uh, expand a little bit on the delay in getting this project moving? Sure. Uh, um, shortly after after going out to bid, the project was appealed to the Coastal Commission, and uh, we had a hearing in, I believe it was July, on um, I think it was July 16th around that around that time period, to where um, the project was heard by the Coastal Commission, and the Coastal Commission did come back with a favorable. Um, conclusion or recommendation to approving our CDP and rejecting the, the appeal that was um, uh, that was issued against the project. A um, couple of things too is, is that we had very a, a good favorable bid from our contractor and he was very gracious to to make sure that he, he didn't withdraw his bid because it took so long and was able to um, st still keep his contract with us, which is which is a very good thing for the city. Okay, thank you. And the the that that bid price was guaranteed during the the delay. It, it was uh, guaranteed, and he had to extend the bid. And so what he did is he provided his documentation that he will extend the bid um, in, until this date, until this council date, and then. Um, which which gave us the opportunity to still 
keep the project moving forward with with the current bid. If he didn't, then we would have to go out to bid again, and most likely the bids will be higher because everyone knows if you bid it a second time, people know the price. They're going to increase it to 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 get more funds. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That, that's all for me. Okay. Is there any more questions or a motion? Motion to approve. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to approve uh, this award, and award the Civic Center Way Improvement Project bid. Do we, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Yeah. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, does anyone need a break or can we go a little further here? Break. You need a break? Okay, so let's take a five minute break if you can let Jefferson know and uh, we will uh, be back in a little bit. Everyone can turn off their video and mute too.
Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Do we have everyone back? I don't see Jefferson yet. I called him and I told him we were taking a five minute break, so hopefully he'll be on in a minute. Oh wait, there he is. He's waving. Okay, um, whenever, whenever we're ready, let's start. Yep, if you want to call the next item. Okay, good, we're up. I'm making sure we're alive and going. Okay, um, next up, item 4A, um, consolidated coastal development permit for the replacement of a failed on-site wastewater treatment system and a new, and new seawall improvements. I see Bonnie there, so I assume you're maybe going to address this item? Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, this is an unusual thing to come before you. It, we've had a few of these over the years, but it's been a little while, so um, some of you might not have seen one of these before. This is a, um, a uh, proposal for a consolidated coastal development permit. And this, the reason for this is because the scope of work for this um, on-site wastewater treatment system or septic, septic system, as we uh, call them, is um, both in the city's permitting jurisdiction and the Coastal Commission's permitting jurisdiction. I'll show you a little more detail about that. Um, the project is located, next slide, please. The project is located um, here, um, just west of Big Rock along the beach. Um, there's an existing single family residence and a, a septic system garage on the property. Next slide, please. Here's what it looks like from the street. Um, in 2005, the city recorded a notice of violation for the failed septic system. Um, the property changed ownership. Uh, nothing was ever done about that, but the property changed ownership in November 2018. And more recently, um, the city's building official inspected the site and um, determined it was necessary to uh, abate the hazardous conditions right away. Um, but as I mentioned, the the project is partly in our jurisdiction and partly in the um, Coastal Commission's jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Um, the project uh, will replace the failed septic system with a new system, but because of the small lot and configuration of the house and the septic tank, um, the residents and garage have to be underpinned and waterproofed. Um, there's also a mechanical ventilation system for the garage that's needed, and there will need to also be a shoreline protective device. In this case, it's a um, concrete bag slope protection wall that would basically serve as a seawall. And as I mentioned, part of that work is what is located seaward of the mean high tide line. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, you can see the mean high tide line here in blue. This is based on review by the California State Lands Commission. So most of the work is in the city's permitting jurisdiction, but um, because of the way the Coastal Act is written, there are only two options. One is um, for the applicant to get a coastal development permit from the city for the part that's in the city's jurisdiction, and also one from the Coastal Commission, or the other option is to get is to consolidate the permitting so that the Coastal Commission permits the whole thing. The Coastal Act doesn't provide for it to go in either direction. It only allows the Coastal Commission to um, take the city's jurisdiction or the city to consent for them to take jurisdiction, not the other way around. Um, we presented this option to the applicant to consolidate the permitting and uh, verbally the applicant has agreed that the process makes sense instead of having this uh, parallel um, dual process. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the benefits are basically that it's a, a more streamlined way of doing it. Um, there are two findings required. There's a resolution that's been prepared for your consideration um, if you can make the findings. And those are that the, um, 
the CDP is required and that has that is confirmed a CDP is required for this work. And, and the second one is that noticing would not be or public participation would not be impaired. Um, the Coastal Commission process also involves noticing to uh, property owners within 100 feet of the project and, and um, an opportunity to speak to the Coastal Commission, and all of the same kind of things that the city process allows. So we believe you can make that finding as well. Um, so basically, um, usually when this, this type of question comes up, it, it would be a more complex project. You might remember um, uh, we've had some things involving Malibu Creek and uh, Malibu Lagoon State Park where there was some split jurisdiction. This, is, this one's a little bit unusual because it's just one single family uh, lot. But that is what is before you tonight. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I believe I saw that the applicant and possibly some of their consultants are in the meeting if you have questions for them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, do we have any public speakers on this? Yes, we have three public speakers signed up for this item. In order, they're Marissa Coolin, David Weiss, and Kevin, Kevin Poffenbarger. The first would be Marissa. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if we could take disclosures first. Okay, yes, yes. Are there any disclosures on this, Karen? Jefferson? Sorry, no. No. Rick? No. Skyler? Negative. And none for me either. Bonnie, uh, yes? I just wanted to, uh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. Um, in, in talking with the applicant, um, Marissa Coughlin, about this, um, I did want to mention that um, staff, city staff agrees that the project is important and urgent and um, assuming that if the council is, is willing to um, consolidate the permit, we would, uh, I would prepare a letter of support for the project to accompany the, uh, that the applicant could submit to the Coastal Commission, just so that uh, they understand that we're on the same page about um, moving this forward, they've done considerable work in terms of um, studies and plans and designs already. So I just wanted to, I forgot to mention that earlier. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Are all the speakers on the applicant team? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, they're signed up. So uh, it doesn't seem like they'll be need to leave any time for rebuttal at this point, but uh, who's our first speaker? The first speaker is Marissa. Oh, did I just lose you? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you don't mind. I gave my uh, Kentucky thoroughbred a, a bucket of booze so we can be quiet during the meeting. So um, thank you all for that you do. And thank you for our outgoing council members for all that you've done. Um, I really appreciate it. You always put in a lot of hard work. And I want to thank Bonnie and her staff. Uh, this project was submitted for review and you can see by the length of the, the time frame of this project, uh, I didn't come into it until January of 19. Mr. Uh, uh, Weiss and Kevin, Mr. Poffenbarger had been working on it for the previous ownership uh, in 2014 and they, he, the previous owner put them on hold. And then in 18, he passed away. So from 2005 to 18, nothing was done in effect. Uh, everything was reviewed under the LCP and LIP and all the codes and regulations of the city. It was, it had conformance review, it was reviewed and approved. It was ready for permitting. I'm actually the one that asked the building official to come down and, and see it. Uh, and the building official, uh, Ms. Bundy and her uh, lead inspector came down because there, there's a definite concern about jeopardy to the structure itself. It hasn't had a bulkhead since 2005 and there's a holding tank on the deck and it's causing stress to the structure. And that's why I asked um, um, Ms. Blue about having a letter in support of the urgency of this. I don't want to get stuck on a two year coastal project, but absent that timing that the Coastal Commission would, would uh, put us in, um, the property owner is in favor of consolidating it just to move it along because as our uh, count, our city council will understand the other issue would be a legal issue between them, them and the estate of the previous owner. So as far as the city's concerned, uh, the property owner is willing 
to consolidate it. But as I as I indicated, I am looking for some sort of written communication on in support of a timely handling of this by the commission for health and safety reasons. There are no other uh, possible uh, uh, environmental feasibility that could be handled. There's only one place everything, all the work will happen from the highway, not for on the beach. There'd be no way to get equipment down there anyway. So um, um, I'm available for any questions. Mr. Weiss and Mr. Proffenbarger are also here if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Appreciate it very much. Um, I guess we're back here at council. Any questions or a motion by anyone? <laughs> anyone, anyone? Uh, I guess I'll make a motion. Okay, is that a, a motion to approve? <laughs> motion to approve. Okay. I'll second. Is that to, to also send the letter that was recommended by Bonnie? Yes, that's correct, Councillor. Okay. That is included in the recommended action for the item. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Peak. Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. And we're moving on to 4B, approval of use of community development block grant funds and COVID-19 CDBG funds for the Los Angeles County Development Authority Small Business Grant Program and the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu. Can I have a report on this, please? Yes, you may. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we are here to conduct the public hearing on the use of our community development block grant funds and the additional COVID-19 CDBG funds that have been granted to the city. Uh, currently, the city of Malibu has an unallocated balance of $88,000 in CDBG funds from prior years. Uh, the, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, has made changes to the program guidelines, and they have notified us that the unallocated funds can be used for certain eligible COVID-19 related activities. In addition to that, the city receives, as part of the CARES Act, additional CDBG funds in the amount of $39,000 and the city is again eligible to use these for COVID, certain COVID-19 um, related uh, uses. So staff is recommending here that uh, we can work with the Los Angeles County uh, Development Authority and their small business grant program to use $80,000 of the funds. Um, and this would be uh, administered by LACDA um, to provide grants of up to $10,000 for eligible businesses within the city to help facilitate the creation and retention of low to moderate income jobs. Um, and all the city has to do is agree um, and promote this to our residents and businesses and uh, LACDA will administer the program and grant the funds. Additionally, we're recommending that $47,000 be given to the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu for use in to fund childcare services and remote learning support for income qualified households in response to the pandemic. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer those questions. That's fantastic. And I gather there's a uh short time window on the business grant program? Indeed, yes. So if the council approves the grant program, um, the county will open the application. It's a five day application period, which will start on August 24th and ends on August 28th. And um, businesses are eligible to apply. And then the county will do a lottery 
to select which businesses will be um, served by this grant. And are we responsible to advertise that? Yes, and, and if the council approves, we will do robust advertising and noticing to get the word out. Do, do we know if the uh, uh, application process is difficult? Have we seen it or not yet? Um, I think the initial application is actually pretty simple, you, is you're filing um, something of interest. And then uh, once they conduct the lottery, the county will be in touch in terms of what other uh, forms they may need. So I don't think it's too difficult. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We do not have any speakers on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, questions or a motion from council? I make a motion. Resolution. I don't know who was first. I heard both of you at the same time. All right, I'll second. Okay. So Karen made a motion, Jefferson seconds. Um, can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Mayor Pro Tempe? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. And I want to say how uh, I really uh, thank you to staff for finding this and, and bringing this forward. I think it's fantastic. This money is really going to help some people, some families, some businesses. I think it's great. I'm really glad to see this. So thank you. Um, moving forward, we have item 4C, interim short-term rental ordinance. Um, do we have, who's going to read this one? That would be me. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good evening, Mayor Pearson and the honorable members of the Malibu City Council. The uh, proposed short-term rental ordinance before you tonight, zoning text amendment number 17002, is the result of years of legislative review on behalf of the Planning Commission, the RACIS, and the City Council to regulate the short-term rental of residential property and address the impacts of short-term rentals on neighborhood character and provide a mechanism to pro prohibit nuisance rentals. ZTA 17002 was most recently considered by City Council on December 3rd, 2019 as a stopgap or ordinance that would be put in place quickly um, while the Council initiated a local coastal program amendment and zoning text amendment, which would implement a, a system to regulate short-term rentals similar to the ordinance adopted by the City of Santa Monica, which requires the presence of an on-site host within the rental unit, the dwelling unit known as a home share or hosted rental. At the December 3rd meeting, council decided not to move forward with ZTA 17002, but did initiate a local coastal program amendment and a zoning text amendment for the Santa Monica style ordinance adapted for the city of Malibu. Council's direction was to require a host to live out on site at the property during the rental, but not require the person to be living within the dwelling unit. The council also directed that the multifamily regulation system proposed in ZT, ZTA 17002 be included in the new local coastal program amendment and zoning text amendment. Staff had originally scheduled a special planning commission public hearing for March 30th on the new Santa Monica styles LCP and zoning text amendment. But that meeting was canceled due to the coronavirus. At council's direction, a special planning commission public hearing was recently held on July 29th in order to move those items forward. However, the draft local coastal program amendment and zoning text amendment are not the subject of today's public hearing. They will be presented to city council for consideration along with the planning commission's recommendation in September. On June 22nd, in response to resident concerns about short-term rentals and the need for regulation to address neighborhood impacts, especially during the ongoing pandemic, Council directed staff return with an update of ZTA 17002 to establish short-term rental regulations in the near term while the LCPA and ZTA are processed. Next slide, please. ZTA 17002, which is before you tonight, 
would remain in place until the new hosted short-term rental regulations and other requirements reviewed by the Planning Commission on July 29th and scheduled to be considered by Council in September go into effect to supersede it. Tonight's proposed ordinance does not change the uses currently allowed in the city. Instead, imposes regulations to address nuisance issues and impacts on neighborhoods. It is intended to provide the city with enforcement tools to cite and ultimately prohibit problematic short-term rentals while the LCPA and DTA are processed. If adopted, DTA 17002 would remain in place until such time as the LCPA and DTA are fully adopted. If they are not fully adopted, DTA 17002 will remain in place. Next slide, please. DTA 17002 is based on ex extensive input from the City Council and would put in place a short-term rental permit system. Under this permit system, all short-term rentals in the city would be required to register for a short-term rental permit on an annual basis. No existing short-term rentals would be grandfathered in or somehow exempt from this requirement. Only a natural person may obtain a permit and that permit may that person rather may only possess one short-term rental permit at a time. In addition, the short-term rental permit system includes general requirements that apply to all rentals, some of which are called out on the slide before you. These include the requirement that owners provide a 24 seven contact for addressing issues. This contact information will be provided to the public upon request. It requires that all short-term rentals have an on-site wastewater treatment system operating permit or compliance agreement in place by January 2023. It establishes that maximum occupancy for each short-term rental based on the number of bedrooms in the dwelling unit. It prohibits off-street parking while the property is being rented on a short-term basis, except in the few rare cases where no on-site parking exists. It requires properties to be in compliance with all city and fire codes. And lastly, it specifies the grounds for denial or revocation of permit. This represents a significant change from the current system. Under the proposed permit system, the city can cite owners for violations of short-term rental regulations and eventually revoke their permits and prohibit them from renting their properties on a short-term basis. Next slide, please. In response to concerns previously raised by Council regarding residency requirements and multifamily housing, the ordinance creates a three-tier permit system to include a primary resident permit, a non-primary resident permit, and a multifamily permit. Each permit type requires certain documentation and is subject to different regulations. Only owners of single-family residences including condominium, in, condominium units for the purpose of these rules, are eligible to apply for primary and non-primary resident permit types. The non-primary resident permit has more rental constraints and is held to a higher standard of compliance. This is designed to encourage permittees who may not live in the area to be extra careful of the rental's potential neighborhood impacts and discourage absentee ownership that can adversely affect neighborhoods and residents. Owners of entire multifamily buildings with three or more units may apply for a multifamily permit. The multifamily permit allows for limited short-term rental of up to two units in a multifamily building while addressing the issues that are present in multifamily apartment buildings that are different than single family residences. Issues such as the need to preserve affordable long-term rental housing and prevent the conversion of multifamily buildings into illegal hotels, which is prohibited in the city without an approved con uh, conditional use permit. These multifamily short-term rental regulations will help clarify and codify existing policy and allow for more effective enforcement. Next slide, please.
Here is a breakdown of the key elements of each permit type. The primary residency provisions of the proposed ordinance require that the applicant lived at the property for a minimum of 185 days of the previous year. In order to receive a primary resident permit, the applicant must attest and submit proof of primary residency. With a primary residency permit, permittees can rent their property all year round. However, their permit may be revoked if they receive three citations for violations or two noise violations within a 12 month period. The non-primary resident permit does not require proof of residency and limits short-term rental to a six month period between April and September and can be revoked if they receive two citations within a 12 month period. Lastly, in order to receive a multifamily permit, the owner must attest to the long-term rental of the remaining apartment units and submit contact information for each tenant. Multifamily permit holders can only rent two units, up to two units, for short-term rental throughout the year. But similar to non-primary rental, um, primary resident permit holders, their permit is subject to revocation if they receive two citations for violation of the ordinance within a 12 month period. Next slide, please. Staff updated certain provisions in VTA 17002 from the December 3rd version presented to council so that it would better align with the Santa Monica style ordinance currently being processed. These changes are highlighted here the proof of residency requirement has been updated to match the primary residency documentation requirements previously established for the city's Woolsey Fire Fee Waiver Program. The on-site wastewater treatment system per operating permit requirements, which I mentioned earlier, have been amended to allow owners until January 2023 to obtain an operating permit or enter into an, a compliance agreement with the city. The previous version included notice of approval to be sent to all neighbors. This has been removed, but contact information for short-term rental owners and or owners agents will be provided to the public upon request. In the enforcement and penalty section, the proposed fines have been increased to $1,000 per day or violation or twice the advertised short-term rentals daily rate. And lastly, the Hosting platform liability section has also been updated, and I'll get to that further on the next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, I can get to it now. Oh, I might have missed. Did I skip a slide? That one. Okay, sorry. The hosting platform liability section in VTA 17002 has been updated based on the Santa Monica ordinance. Among other things, it prohibits hosting platforms from completing a booking transaction for any short-term rental that is not listed on the city's approved permit registry. Um, next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation of the proposed zoning text amendment before you tonight, intended to regulate rather than change current uses and to address nuisance issues and impacts on neighborhoods. Planning Director Bonnie Blue, City Attorney Trevor Russin, and Associate Planner Justine Kendall are here as well and available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, Bonnie or Trevor, did you have anything you want to add? No, um, not at, I don't, not at this time. Okay. Yeah, not at this point. Okay. Um, let's, let's get to public speakers. I'm guessing there's one or two. Yes, we have 26 public speakers on this item. I'm going to read them all in order and then call them one by one to speak. Thank so you. those speakers are Ian Ballon, yeah, I can hear this. Dennis Sider, Don Tolson, Edith Morgan, Brian Merritt, Bill Sampson, Larry Steppy, Doug Stewart, Graham Clifford, Dean Wenner, Lynn Norton, 
Joey Goodman, Bruce Silverstein, Monica uh, Brisson, Anne Doneen, James Isaacs, Andrew G Gombiner, uh, Joanne Gary, Craig Hill, Jean Zelinskis, Michael Lustig, Mark Menis Calco, Joe Drummond, Colin Drummond, John Choi, and Richard Olson. So the first speaker will be Ian Ballin. Okay. Thank you. Ian, are you there? I am. Okay, great. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I have a lot to cover. I also sent in an email earlier today. Um, my concern about on-site uh, supervision and the difference between resident, uh, the first two categories, um, you know, in our situation, we live a couple of miles away from the house that we bought. My wife is available 24-7. I think the key issue there is 24-7 availability. But if you, if you distinguish between on-site or if you're not literally on site, you can only rent it half the year, then people like us who bought a property that we hope eventually to retire to are gonna have to sell. We cannot pay the mortgage on six months worth of, uh, of revenue. And when someone, you know, literally the house is in, is in Big Rock, we live on Ramble Pacifico, we're about 10 minutes away, my wife is available 24 seven. And so I would urge you to please look at that. I also have concern about the heckler's veto. My wife is black. Uh, this is an issue where, you know, honestly, I think it, it, it invites discrimination. It invites difficulties. Certainly, if anyone violates uh, the rules, you know, they should lose their, their permit. But just creating a heckler's veto where a neighbor can, can object, um, I think, is very problematic. I would also urge you to consider a grandfather's clause, and particularly for an interim regulation during a pandemic when everybody is struggling, when bookings are down, when we're all having difficulty making the mortgage, putting in this kind of regulation is going to be very problematic. You know, for example, we are depending on some bookings that we have in, in October and November, and, and, you know, we're not going to make the mortgage this year. If, if we're limited to April 1 to September 30th, because we live a couple of miles away, we're going to have real problems. You're going to end up having a lot of people who right now are generating revenue for the city and who are very responsible in the way that they operate properties, having to, to try to put these properties on the market. There is a real problem with noise, I understand. I, you know, there are real problems here. But I would urge you to consider that, that sort of the one-size-fits-all kind of regulation doesn't work for people like us who are local, who are in the area, who have bought a house we want to, to, to retire to, and who require, uh, you know, these kind of things. She's a super host on Airbnb. We're not causing problems for the neighbors. We're not having parties. In fact, her listing says no parties. And so I would just ask that you consider those issues, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Our next speaker would be Dennis Sider, but I believe he has left the meeting. Okay, maybe let's uh, keep track and maybe he'll be here when we come back around. Okay, we'll circle back to him. So the next speaker will be Don Tullison. You there, Don? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Don Tollison. I've been operating a vacation rental for 13 years, and I'm the one that says I never have complaints. And it's because I have a no party policy. And uh, basically, I have a uh, an event fee, they call it. It's a no party fee. And I recommend that you, you implement an event fee and make it substantial, you know, like $1,000 to have an event. And you base it on the number of participants. And that is, you know, by bedrooms. And I heard some discussion about what's a bedroom, seven by 10, things like that. Well, you can go online, any, any address, and you can find out how many bedrooms it is. You just Google it. And you go by the legal number of bedrooms, not by how many bedrooms someone says. And uh, you should make it two guests per bedroom, no more. So if it's a two-bedroom residence, only four occupants. That's just my suggestion for that. Then you provide a little wiggle room and add 50% to that. And if someone has more than, say, six people on site, that would require an event permit. And, of course, you're not going to hear about that unless somebody complains and really has a party. And then 
your enforcement people can just come out and count how many people are there or take pictures. It's not a tough enforcement thing and it would work just great. So uh, the other thing I'd like to say is uh, on the TOTs, I'd like to see those raised to the maximum. And I don't know what that is, but I know LA charges 14%. I don't see why uh, Malibu should only charge 12%. I'd like Trevor to let us know what that could be raised to. I know we're looking for 15%. If we go 16 or 17, we should. Uh, the final thing is that uh, the uh, number of short-term rentals is growing. And each time we have a meeting, between meetings, we have about 40 new vacation rentals. And I think we're up, oh, uh, two years ago, there were about 300, 350. Now we're over 500, moving towards 600. And uh, if we don't slow it down somehow pretty soon, uh, we're going to have over a thousand short term rentals. And that's 25% uh, of the housing stock in Malibu approximately. And that's, I, I, you know, even as a, as a short term rental owner, I think that's way too many. Uh, the final thing I'd like to suggest, and I've suggested it every time so far, uh, we put a freeze on these short term rentals until this short term uh, ordinance gets sorted out because we're getting all kinds of people that come in and rent a place and furnish it and they're in the short-term rental business. And uh, you just look at the exponential growth of short-term rentals and put a freeze on it and we can at least do something and we could do that tonight. I think it's something that we could all agree on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Edith Morgan. Hi, Edith, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Good evening, Council. I've only lived in Malibu, I'm reading this. I've only lived in Malibu 14 years. I was raised and born in Mississippi and I moved from Aspen to Santa Monica in 79. Malibu is my piece of cake. I bought it with property tax. Short-term rentals that you asked me for are not about noise, it's about casual privacy, which is my piece of cake. I don't reach across the table with my fork and eat your cake. And you're asking if your paying guests can eat some of my cake. And can your paying guests sit where I usually sit? They think I'm a nice, kind person. Can my little lamb sit under your umbrella? Can her girlfriend sit with her? How about her rhinoceros? Can she sit with you? I'm sorry, Council. I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit. And that means that my writing is not what I want it to be. I use animals, but we all know humans are the most dangerous predators. One basic need is security. We used to gather around a fire or build city walls for security. Now we make laws. We all want to be responsible for taking care of our families, but not if your money making plans limit my freedom and my security. You're saying you cannot have what you want using Malibu to make money unless I give up what I paid for, a secure neighborhood. Security is when you know what is happening in your part of the forest, such as, is there a new lion nearby killing people? No, 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 no. He's only eating their toes. Your opinion of the lions doesn't affect my life. What affects my life is that there are strangers which come and go with no roots, not a stable neighborhood. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do it again. Or guess. I guess I'll guess. I'm going to end because I can't see it. that I don't want Malibu to turn into a resort hotel, even with the best of intentions. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you very much, Edith. Our next speaker is Brian Merrick but I believe he is not currently in the meeting, so we'll try to come back to him at the end. Okay, thank you. After him is Bill Sampson. Okay. 
You there, Bill? Yeah, I thought Brian was on. No, he uh, he he's missing in action, so you're up. Okay, thank you. The second slide presented by uh, the young lady from the city says the proposed ordinance does not change uses currently allowed in the city. If uses aren't specifically permitted in a zoning code, they are prohibited. There is no use permitted of businesses in residential zones. I've been asking the council as a body for over six years. It says enforce the existing ordinance rather than keep monkeying around. I really don't have any interest in this ordinance. I want you to enforce what's already there. That's fallen on deaf ears, um, except for Jefferson's. Skyler at one time said, why don't we just prohibit them? Great idea, Skyler, stand behind it. Karen, unfortunately, when I ran into her on November 18th after being away from home for 10 days, I lucked out, my house was still here, rather gleefully told me that she now had the votes that uh, they wouldn't do what I, I preferred. I really didn't care for that after being gone for 11 days. However, there is simply no use such as this. There, you, these are motels in our neighborhoods. It's not permitted. I feel sorry that people, I could not send Margaret to $100,000 a year college. Well, I didn't rent my place out. I don't wanna send somebody else's kid to $100,000 a year college on the loss of my quiet enjoyment of my neighborhood. That's what we're asking for. Mr. Tollefson made some interesting remarks. Why don't we limit them? If you're gonna have them at all, make them unlimited. Let them, yeah, let them have, be just like Newport, packed with these places. Might even drive the price down. I'm not, not obvious, I'm obviously not really on that side. These things should not be permitted. They are not permitted now. And all I ask is you should enforce what is already on the books. The council as a body has failed and refused to for over six years. There's simply no reason to not enforce what we've got. It is too bad that some people have two and three mortgages. If they bought the place, why didn't they, they knew what the rules were when they moved in. The fact that they violated those rules for years doesn't give them a uh, license to violate them in the, a lot of people run red lights most of the time. You get caught once, that's too bad. It's time to enforce it. Let's stop this. None of these people who come here and now occupy these houses, they're not gonna coach our little league teams. They are not going to sign the petitions to try to get the school district separated. They are not gonna participate in our bands. They're not gonna participate on our school system. They're not gonna run for city council. They aren't part of our community. Let's keep it that way. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Larry Steffi. Hi, Larry, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. All right, give me a minute to get my light on and paperwork out. One, just a quick note, that letter to McConnell was not uh, acceptable. Uh, I recall when you bought, uh, got money from uh, the public uh, highway and you used your budget and money in order to buy property. So you were robbing Peter to pay Paul. Now on the short-term rental, it is unacceptable that you're changing the rules, even the uh, on-water uh, treatment plant. We all had legal plants and now you're requiring pay payment. This is another like a joke in order to generate fines and revenue for the city in order to uh, augment what you're gonna lose for short-term rentals with those who cannot rent their places in order to pay taxes, maintenance and everything. We have 25 owners of our property. We don't allow any one of them to stay at the house as a resident. Therefore, you are restricting us from the property we've had since 1948. Any person who's had a parent who passes away is gonna lose their property if they don't move in and be able to afford to stay at that house, according to what you're doing here. You need to start making the laws and make the laws in order to do uh, the problem areas. 
you're not going to solve any problem on short-term rentals because long-term rentals can have their parties and do everything they want to. So you have accomplished nothing except prohibit people from maintaining their property and also for the use for them to use their own property. I object to the permit, both the uh, max oxygen based on two plus two. That's not acceptable because children and kids and babies are people too. So you're telling people they're going to have to break their, uh, the law in order to bring a family of four or five in or a house that has one or two bedrooms. Uh, so, you know, two bedrooms, that's six people, but you could have about four kids with a parent. So you are going to be causing problems with us as far as occupancy. So number of bedrooms. The code is just a matter of getting revenue. Uh, the dwelling unit, one family, one kitchen. That's unacceptable. We have a house that has two levels and there's two kitchens. You're making us, so we're violating it before you even start. You must deal with the problems and not create more laws that uh, the property orders have to deal with and were unacceptable. This is all subjective and subject to the city abuse. Enforcement, enforce current laws. And in the old days, you could not even uh, have a odor or homeless. So deal with the homeless problem along PCH and all those motor homes and tents all on PCH. That's more of a problem than this will ever be. So thank you very much for listening to me and do not do what you're gonna do. It's, it's just unacceptable. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Our next speaker is Doug Stewart. Doug, are you there? I'm here. All right, you're up. Good evening, council members. Uh, the proposed short-term rental ordinance before you tonight speaks really to two constituencies. The first is a homeowner that's seeking income from the rental, and the second is a neighbor who is now affected by a business located in their residential neighborhood. Any short-term rental ordinance that's adopted will provide immediate benefit to the short-term landlord, but it's just as important that the ordinance provide protection for the neighbors from the potential rental nuisances going forward. We can't have the benefits to one at the expense of the other. The only way to make this workable long-term is through enforcement. As pointed out in a recent Los Angeles Times article, the problem with short-term rentals is in the enforcement. I'm familiar with Lake Arrowhead where short-term rental ordinance was built by consensus. The first key factor was to have clearly defined requirements for a permit, then the operational requirements, and then what was the potential revocation requirements. The second key factor was hands-on enforcement inspection, and audits by dedicated code enforcement officers. It was the latter point that finally brought the parties together. It is not sufficient to only outsource the reporting telephone number. You have to have dedicated code enforcement officers who can timely respond to any complaints by the neighbors. They also can't just sit in their offices. They have to do the physical inspections, know the properties, do on-site visits from time to time. They should also respond to the non-permitted offenders and vigorously enforce the rules and fines. No one wants to hear that a loud party at 1 a.m. Saturday is gonna be addressed on Tuesday. At Arrowhead, the permit fees pay for these dedicated enforcement officers. At Arrowhead, the initial permit fee is $599 and then $359 annually. At the 446 properties reported for Malibu, this is over a quarter of a million dollars in annual fees. Surely we can afford enforcement with that level of fee income. At the end of the day, whatever you pass must be enforced and have a prompt response to problems. Otherwise, you've taken the enjoyment of Malibu from our neighbors for the financial gain of others. As to enforcement, the city has to begin to enforce its rules. Otherwise, we only growl, but we never bite. And that means that nobody cares what the rules or ordinances are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Graham Clifford. Stuart. Hey, Mikey. Hey, Graham. Um, <clears throat> and last Monday, I participated in the planning commission meeting too, uh, the one that you know dealt with the modified Santa Monica ordinance. Um, and listening so far to the speakers in this one, it's it's pretty clear that you guys have to look at the big picture here because everyone has their own little bits and pieces to 
to mull over, particularly the people who were already renting. I mean, the, the big picture here is what com kind of community do we want? Do we want a community that is just basically a bunch of small hotels operating, as Doug Stewart says, illegally? Or do we want a community that is a real community where people look out for one another and participate in civic duties like you guys are? Um, <clears throat> that's the issue. You know, there's plenty of reasons for every homeowner in, the, in any neighborhood to come up with, oh, I need some extra money, therefore I'm going to rent my house instead of finding some other way to make some extra money instead of inconveniencing or even worse than inconveniencing all of their neighbors. You know, um, and um, it's, it's um, this, in the, this interim audience will only allow year round, will, will allow year round short term rentals year round. I mean, like hotel, they're hotels, essentially what they are is hotels. And it's it's just not good for our community. Finally, all of the community, all of our people like you and me and other people, we're going to have to move out because it's just going to become Disneyland. Um, the only thing I would, yeah, so I first of all, I would uh, please set this ordinance aside, this interim ordinance, until you hear the other one in September, because the other one will stand up in court. It has more teeth to it. It does what the residents want to do, not the 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 number of um, people who are already renting, who are actually in the minority, even though it seems like there are millions of them. Um, and, and the only thing about this ordinance that I would re retain, and I don't know why it's been lost, is the letter of approval from neighbor, from the neighbors. I think neighbors should be consulted when somebody wants to rent their house nearby, and they should be allowed to express their opinion. And, and Skylar and Jay, you have a chance to go out with a bang here. Um, if, if I vote for something that will have long-term, long-lasting, meaningful benefit to your community rather than the transitory satisfaction of money. Do not let the city rely on tot income for its existence. Many cities and communities worldwide now are suffering economically because of their reliance on tourism. Reliance on easy money, whether it be tourism or TOT, is not the answer. Thank you, Graham. Our next speaker is Dean Wenner. Are you there, Dean? I think he's trying to get unmuted, if we can give him a second. Okay. Oh. For a oh, there you go. Hey, Dean, can you hear Here us? Now? Yep, can hear you. Excellent. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. I appreciate what y'all are doing. Um, I submitted comments earlier today, those supplement comments that I've submitted in, in the recent past. I appreciate the desire to do more and reach a compromise on the subject of short-term rentals. However, I'm against the ordinance for the following reasons. Additional regulation is unwarranted, and, in, and since it is rooted in an effort to ban short-term rentals, we should not take a step in that direction, as the intent behind it is unreasonable. Short-term rentals have been legal in Malibu for decades. The municipal code addresses code matters. There are systems and tools in place to conduct code enforcement. Just like a business, the city runs well. We need to, we need to act on documented incidents and not just hearsay and commentary. Three of 525 code enforcement issues are noise or nuisance. I found that by speaking to the code of officer, Doug, as well as the information that's available on site. Um, three of 525 is statistically insignificant and not a proliferation for nonconformance. No change to the enforcement system is recommended by what's being documented, which means it's working because city council does uphold its policies and requires its codes and regulations to be met. I know we have challenges, but everybody's trying well to do that. I perceive residents want enforcement to change things that are legal, that, that's a problem, and we shouldn't enable things to impact that. As further evidence that the drive for change is rooted in opinion, paranoia, and what ifs versus real problems, the only two formal open complaints in code enforcement in the last 10 years 
are for one property at 3833 Paseo Hidalgo Street. Seems like it's a very localized and specific issue, not a proliferation of nonconformance. There is a process in place for people to fill out forms and submit, which would help enforcement versus a lot of the discussion that I perceive as occurring. In 2000, prior to 2009, TOT was required of short-term rentals and Malibu was collecting the TOT. In 2009, Malibu Municipal Code formally included it and has collected TOT under it. According to the city's data, I heard 446 I saw in the report, less than, that's less than 6% of properties advertised as STRs. This is well in line with the general plan, which indicates in excess of 40% of housing types that are renter related in table 7-5. The internet certainly has made STR information more readily available to the public, but there is not proliferation. On the Santa Monica issue, please recognize Santa Monica never allowed STRs. The ordinance was driven by Dean, ve very different things. Dean, you're out of time. Those items apply to Malibu. So please look at my comments. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dean. Our next speaker is Lynn Norton. evening council members can you hear me yes it can win oh thank you so um i've given you a lot of correspondence i believe that you know how i feel about the issue and the fact that what we really need is the hosted short-term rental ordinance that was passed by the uh, planning commission um i've heard people say that there was a that that has already been put on the agenda but i'm not totally sure so my first request is to please make sure that staff is directed to get that other ordinance on the agenda asap at the beginning of september um, when it comes to the hosted short-term rental ordinance, I mean, I believe that there's a case to be made for not going to Coastal with it. However, if you do feel that you need to take it to Coastal, you could still implement that ordinance as your interim ordinance while you're working your way through Coastal, and there's no reason to be working on two ordinances at the same time and to, uh, uh, to accept this ordinance, which doesn't really give us the thing that we want, which is to follow Santa Monica's home sharing model. Um, I, I do understand that for some people it's an urgent issue and they want to see you do something ASAP, but timing wise, the hosted short term rental ordinance is only about four weeks behind this ordinance. And um, because of the fact that you don't actually implement it right away, that's going to end up being like four weeks in the middle of February or March. And that's not going to really be a big impact. Um, with short-term rentals in February. I, does that mean, I hope that makes sense to you guys. If it made sense to even one of you, you can explain it to the other ones. <laughs> um, so therefore, um, tonight, I would recommend that you not pass this ordinance and then four weeks from now, start going forward with the one that's really going to affect the big picture in Malibu and which also will also give you better um, enforcement. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of the enforcement will be proactive because you won't have the same kind of issues when you have uh, people renting out homes in their own neighborhood. Um, the worst thing, the single worst thing about tonight's ordinance is granting permits for non-primary residents to have short-term rentals. And I ask that you would please never do that. It, it's true that Malibu could be accused of having a de facto allowed this because of the fact that we um, collected tax on it, but now you would be codifying it and actually granting permits for something that has never been actually legal and which no Malibu citizens want which is permits for what I would call a de facto hotel. Some, where, where there's a house, there's no one who lives there, and all it is is one set of short-term renters after another, and that really ruins the neighborhood. So um, those are my requests. Don't pass this ordinance tonight and get the other one on the agenda ASAP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Our next speaker is Joey Goodman. Hello. Hi, Joy. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, God, I feel like a selfish person right now, but because uh, I happen to be uh, the resident uh, across the street from 3833 Paseo Hidalgo. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, uh, 
whatever code enforcement that we have achieved, uh, I do believe that we've documented uh, various uh, egregious actions and events that have taken place. Uh, uh, apparently, we're the only property in the city, I guess, is having this kind of an issue. But I'm going to read what I uh, wrote here, and uh, I hope it makes some kind of sense. We used to live on a quiet, clean cul-de-sac, not for the last two years, not since a home was purchased out of foreclosure and converted to an SDR, a non-owner-occupied property, never lived in, not a neighbor. We are all elderly, although some residents may object to that description. At this exact moment in time, I find myself requiring a gun or an attorney. A weapon is cheaper, but obtaining one may result in my need for legal representation. Without some form of code enforcement provisions, our neighborhood and its quality of life is diminished daily, significantly impacted by the numerous actions and behaviors associated with 3833 Paseo Hidalgo. The ordinance is not perfect. What is? At present, our neighborhood finds itself without any enforcement, zero. I find this ordinance provides a much needed clarity and a rational approach. I think most of the uh, SDR problems are confined, not all of them, but the majority to non-owner occupied properties that are operated for profit a commercial enterprise in a residential district. That that stands out to me. I think it stands out to a lot of people that it has an impact upon the quality of the neighborhood. I know there's issues about a grandfather uh, clause here, that the fact that TOT has been collected, that somehow uh, sets a precedent that uh, all short-term rentals that have been operating should be allowed I'd like the city attorney to address that at some point. Uh, I know I'm not being as specific as I could be, but at this point in time, I, let's respect everyone's rights and proceed in a rational, productive fashion. Let's bring an order to a chaotic situation. If not, see you at the inquest. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Our next speaker is Bruce Silverstein. Evening once again. Mike, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. So it seems to me like you've got a super easy decision right now because not a single person wants you to adopt this cockamamie interim ordinance. Nobody who does short-term rentals wants it. Nobody who's opposed to short-term rentals wants it. Oh, one person wants it, the city manager. I forgot. So whether you decide, whatever you decide the permanent ordinance should say, you should just adopt it as an ordinance. Don't adopt it as an amendment to Chapter 17, which is part of the LCP pursuant to the Coastal Act. There's no need to go through Coastal. This can be adopted as a general ordinance of the city. It is no secret that the city manager is opposed to the prohibition or restriction or limitations on short-term rentals because it will decrease the city's revenue, which is her only term. She doesn't care about the people. The city manager is looking to delay and hinder the ordinance, the ordinance that the city, that the city residents do want. She doesn't want to lose the revenue. She knows that submitting this to Coastal will at minimum slow down the process and may even result in its denial. Making matters worse, the city attorneys providing bad and irresponsible advice in aid of the city manager's agenda. Aside from unnecessary delay and risk of outright denial, if you do go through coastal, future fixes will need to go through coastal as well, and there inevitably will need to be future fixes. The better course of action is scrap the interim ordinance, which has other problems, which I'll discuss in a moment. Approve the permanent ordinance as a general ordinance of the city. Begin enforcing it. If coastal has an issue, they can file a lawsuit. 
and you can reach an out-of-court resolution with them, which is a lot easier, actually, than dealing with them through their normal process. Don't give up the leverage you have by capitulating to Coastal at the urging of the city manager and the city attorney. Any good litigator knows that the law is awfully gray in most instances. There is no, there are very rarely black and white answers, and this is clearly one of those situations. Do not give up your leverage by conceding a point to Coastal that is gray at best. Other problems, the interim ordinance permitting scheme, as a number of others have said earlier, and I think Bill Sampson said it best, um, is a new scheme. You saw a slide, which is a misrepresentation, that this does not change the existing law. It does. The existing law does not authorize short-term rentals. It may be that the existing circumstances has not been to restrict them, but the existing law does not authorize them. You are being sold a bill of goods. You're being asked to create an authorization scheme that doesn't exist so that when the scheme that everyone does want doesn't go into place, you'll be stuck with an authorization and you then how will have a law. Don't do it. Nobody wants it in any event. Like I said, e easy political decision. You will you will make every constituent happy by rejecting this. Then you'll make the hard decision later. What should the real ordinance say? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monica Brisenio. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Perfect. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council Members. Monica Briseño on behalf of Lily Reeves as trustee of the Sotero Trust. Our client owns a home in the Malibu Colony and has spoken on this issue before. And while we generally support immediate regulation of short-term rentals, we respectfully suggest that the Council consider and incorporate mechanisms that will help address the inappropriate behavior and general nuisances created in the city by short-term renters before they become violation issues. The proposed interim ordinance is a step in the right direction. However, the interim ordinance places the initial burden of policing and enforcement on affected neighbors rather than providing dedicated staff or placing some share of the burden on those benefiting from the city's allowance of short-term rentals. To address this, we suggest that the council consider providing dedicated staff to the enforcement and compliance of the short-term rental regulations. The permit structure should be able to provide funds for such dedicated staff that can handle inspections and monitoring. Additionally, to the extent this interim ordinance is intended to provide a smoother transition to the new ZTA, which provides for hosted rentals, we suggest incorporating a host requirement into the interim ordinance, if not for all primary and non-primary resident permits, and for those requested in densely populated residential neighborhoods like the colony, which would require an on-site host under the new ZTA. This would help curb some of the inappropriate behavior we see today. Without these provisions, the inappropriate behavior and nuisance issues will likely continue absent neighbor enforcement. Again, we want to stress that enforcement is key to the success of any short-term rental regulations. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Monica. Our next speaker is Anne Doneen. I don't see that Anne is in the meeting right now, so we'll try to circle back to her at the end. Okay, great. Thank you. And then if we have James Isaacs, he would be our next speaker. But he is also not present at this time, so we'll come back to him as well. Okay. Andrew Gombiner. Are you there, Andrew? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Go ahead. In short, I urge you to adopt the interim ordinances drafted by your staff. It is a fair compromise that would preserve approximately half of the apartments in Malibu as long-term rentals, while at the same time provide much needed visitor accommodations. I have owned my property on Malibu Road for 31 years and have lived in it until I needed to move for work and family reasons. Unfortunately, moving back to Malibu is not an option. However, my SDRs make it possible for us to continue enjoying the property something that we, we do in between visitors. I have long employed a property manager who lives nearby to ensure my property and visitors are closely monitored. Requiring a manager to live on site would be economically unfeasible as California state law only permits a maximum rent 
of $677 be charged to a single manager and $1,002 when a couple is employed. Given that long-term rents in my building are approximately $10,000 per unit per month, I would in effect be paying $9,000 per month or more for management of just two apartments. Allowing two short-term rentals in multifamily properties will effectively reduce the incentive of owners to take buildings on Malibu Road off the rental market and convert them to single-family homes or condominiums. This would preserve some of those units as long-term rentals. If the house conversion trend were to continue at its current pace, there would be very few multifamily properties on the road in 10 years. A couple weeks ago, the Planning Commission voted to limit SDRs and multifamily properties to 40%. I urge you to follow staff's recommendation and allow up to two SDRs per multifamily building as it treats all multifamily owners equally. At the same time, it preserves approximately half of the apartments in Malibu as long-term rentals. Lastly, only permitting SDRs on a seasonal basis won't work for multifamily properties as they are now subject to statewide rent control and controls on no-fault evictions. In other words, if a long-term tenant rents an apartment for six months, when their lease expires, the tenant has the right to stay in the apartment indefinitely. Therefore, the property owner could not commit to seasonal SDRs. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is Joanne Gary. Unmute. I'm what's okay. happening? We, we can, can hear you now. now. Okay. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm going to be quite different in my tone to previous speakers. But first, I want to thank Mayor Mikey and Jefferson for being accessible to me. I'd also like to thank Rob LeBeau, the mud in my street and the repaving he made happen. And I bugged him a lot, but he was great. Uh, you have heard from Joey Goodman already. Um, Paul Wolf and I and Joey for the last two years and eight months have put up with an Airbnb property that has taken away our rights to live in peace, quiet and privacy, privacy. Thank you, Edith Morgan. That is such a good word. You have been informed over and over again of the Madison Investment Group that has turned 3833 Pilot Sailor into a hotel with her with no rules. Um, but I'd like to say to Mr. Werner, well, that's not the only problem that we have. We have four other long-term rentals. We have cars in the neighborhood, strangers in the neighborhood. We no longer have a close-knit neighborhood. Since the pandemic, the renters have been out of control. Large parties of drunk and disorderly people from all over the world, country. Oh, only one group with a mask. Joey has ring videos of their behaviors. I have some photo, photos and videos, but sometimes I'm really, truly afraid to interact with these groups. What they want is the freedom to run up and down the street drunk, the freedom to invite guests who arrive at all hours in cars with loud mufflers playing loud music. They party into the morning hours, vomit on our streets, urinate in daylight on our landscaping. Okay. Yeah, the, the sheriff can come, but they don't get there, and our whole evening and day is ruined. Just a couple of recent examples, a big party Thursday, and the sheriff came, another party on Friday, and the sheriff shut it down about 2 a.m. And Joey, at 5.30 asked the renters who were leaving to pick up the trash in the street, including a liquor bar. They threatened to skin him alive. Airbnb does not support us. And I just ask you one question. And I have lots of things to say to the drummers and to the people that have commented. Would you be comfortable with your children or grandchildren living here? And Graham Clifford, could I take you out to dinner? And Bruce Silverstone as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joanne. Our next speaker is Craig Hill. Joanne, I'd like dinner too. Um, I'm all for individuals renting out a room in their house to help make ends meet, but turning residential neighborhoods into commercial SDRs is like turning them into rehabs. Their commonality is that they're commodifying our neighborhoods with as little regard for community as they can get away with. In my letters, I've pointed out a few court decisions that enable you to restrict SDRs without need for coastal's blessing. These are appellate decisions within our jurisdiction, which means they're legal precedent, the Carmel decision found that inherently STRs, even in the absence of complaints, quote, threaten the residential character of a neighborhood because short-term tenants have little interest in public agencies or in the welfare of the citizen, unquote. The Hayek decision in Santa Monica clarifies a few things, including that a home sharing ordinance, quote, does not require a CDP and the Coastal Commission's authority does not extend to approving or rejecting general laws adopted by cities, unquote. And in my letter last night, I showed that STRs are not allowed in our foundational documents, including the General Plan, LCP, or Coastal Act, not least because the, quote, visitor serving in Coastal's mandate is expressly defined as pertaining only to use of non-residential land. That's defined right in the General Plan, page 414. Reading that together with the court cases, it's clear that you don't need to send it to Coastal. So you can please ditch the interim ZTA and move ahead with the version that was just vetted by the Planning Commission. The increasingly irrelevant ZTA would cause owners to have to adjust twice to different regimes. Better to make one move now and let the market sort itself out once. Plus, the city doesn't need the occupancy tax as much as you've been told. Yes, there's some rough road ahead, but Malibu's property values are among the most resilient in the world. So the city may take a few punches and its makeup might get smeared, but it will survive the withdrawal symptoms of TOT addiction. Finally, with ADUs coming, it's important to nip this in the bud. They could increase the city's population substantially, making highway traffic impossible, but that's a separate issue. The ADU law does specify that they shall not be rented for a term less than 38, uh, 30 days. They can't be STRs. But if you were to leave the regime sort of uncertain with two different ordinances and different deadlines, you'd face confusion about ADUs versus guest houses. And that ZTA is crazy complicated. It focuses on trees at the expense of the whole forest. So it would create all sorts of enforcement problems. Don't let anyone who builds an ADU be even tempted to think of SDRs. They might live in the ADU themselves and rent the main house. Before you know it, Malibu could have more strangers partying here than residents actually living here. My neighborhood is turning into a ghost town with short-term zombies speeding past in rental cars more each day. Neighborhoods are for true neighbors. Lock down this neighborhood killing STR virus while you still can. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Zelenskis. Hello, hello. Hello, we can hear you. Hi, it's actually Beatrix using Jean Zelenskis' Zoom account. <laughs> I was wondering. Hi, Beatrix. Hi, everybody. Um, actually, most of my points have already been made by previous speakers, so I'll, I'll try to be um, brief and to the point. Um, I've been speaking to the City Council and the Planning Commission on this issue for, I, th I thought it was five years. According to Bill Sampson, it's been six. It's been a really long time. I would like to, like to urge you to vote no on this interim ordinance in light of the fact that the actual ordinance is so close to being um, heard itself. Passing this is just going to add layers and layers of confusion and seriously impair enforcement of whatever ordinance is in existence. Um, the And having that extra layer of different rules uh, adds, uh, it threatens to make any real regulation more difficult rather than easier. Um, Short-term rentals in Malibu have been discussed at the city level for, what, five, six years now? The ordinance is not a surprise, it's not a punishment, and it's not unfair. Residential zoning does not allow for commodification of residential housing, i.e., no inns, no motels, no hotels, no bed and breakfasts in a residentially zoned area. It's not personal. <laughs> the pro the um, Pro short-term rental um, individuals who come up in front of city council talk about how well run and managed their properties are, how many nice people they've met, but they never offer 
any specific language as to how to deal with the problem properties. And this brings me to something that I'm not noticing in either the interim ordinance or the permanent one, which is um, uh, language to, to specifically forbid short-term rental tenants from obtaining special event permits or filming permits for any time during their stay. So without that being addressed in the permanent ordinance, it leaves a loophole that perfectly suits and allows one of the major bad actor components of short-term rentals to continue party houses. Um, please vote no on this interim. We don't need it. Let's just get the final one done. Thank you. Thank you. Linkus. Our next speaker is Michael Lustig. There you go. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Michael. Very good. Good evening, Mikey, uh, Mayor Mikey. It's, um, glad to see you in the, in the chair and to the rest of the council. Hello. Uh, when the pandemic began, 13 states and 43 cities either temporarily banned or severely restricted STRs, including 11 other California cities and counties. When we approached the city about a temporary ban, we were told we had to follow LA, LA County which has no ordinance and deems hotels and motels as essential businesses, even though Airbnb has told us for years that they were neither hotels or motels. Now we have the proposed interim ordinance, which is nothing more than the same old unenforceable loopholes and Airbnb's multi-tiered permitting system that council has seen and rejected three times. It is too similar to the LA ordinance, which is a total failure as evidenced by the article in this week's Times. So let's not go back to remedial conversations about day limits and primary residence without the host on site. The answer is still no. And tonight you must reject it for the fourth and final time. Host on site is the only thing that solves the problems. You voted for it 5-0 last December. Staff and the city attorney have done a very good job on the draft. It is very close. All it needs is a few tweaks and we'll have the best, most, in, most enforceable rules in the country. We have just enough time to get the real Malibu reels, rules done and read twice before the election. So that's it. Those are your marching orders. Let's get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Mark Menascolco. Alexa, set the timer for nine minutes. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mark. Okay, guys, well, I wanna thank everybody for uh, on the council to, to uh, take my calls over the last week and weekend. Um, and one of the main things that I was bringing up to you guys is I have a multifamily building here on Malibu Road, and I use it exactly how your ordinance is currently set up that you guys are looking at tonight where one unit is my primary residence. Then I have one unit that is rented out to a, a <clears throat> long-term tenant, and she's a Malibu business owner. And my other two units are used as short-term rentals. I've never displaced anybody. I've never kicked anybody out. I waited until their leases expired. And then I went ahead and converted them to short-term rentals. I have zero code violations, zero complaints from my neighbors. Um, I have, I'm an owner operator and have a strict guidelines for my property. I have eight parking spots. I have no parking problems. I assign them to each guest and I properly monitor them and the amount of guests that are coming into the units. This model works extremely well and it's exactly how your ordinance is written. And I hope that you will look at this for your short-term rentals when it applies to multifamily buildings. There are not many of us, but there are some of us that do operate out of multifamilies and we live there and we call it our, our home. Um, and my long-term tenant of three years sent in testimony, which you guys can all read, that she has no problems with the hybrid building that has short-term rentals and long-term uh, rentals. There are lots of perks. She has a freshly painted building, newly decorated apartment, maid service, new laundry machines, new cooking appliances, new security gates, and most importantly, reduced rent. She also has the use of visitors that advertise for her business, so she's able to get new clients. Uh, the one thing I did want to bring up is in the planning commission uh, last week, they wanted to take me down to only being able to do one unit, which would greatly change the entire landscape of what I'm doing. I've never had any complaints like I uh, originally had discussed. And when I'm not here, obviously I have an owner, and I, I mean, I have a uh, manager that comes in and takes care of my units. So going down to one unit would make it 
completely unfeasible. If I can only rent out one unit and I'm here, obviously if I'm the owner and I am here and I have two units or if I have three units, I'm not going to allow something crazy to go on in my building. It would be completely irresponsible to be living in my building and allow parties to go on upstairs. Uh, and then, you know, some of the other things that went on with short-term rentals is, you know, you guys all remember the fires. My building was a great place for people to come that were displaced because Malibu does not have enough hotel rooms. People don't want to stay in Santa Monica. They want to stay in Malibu. So I was able to bring in guests from Malibu. They stayed here for two days, three days, a week, some a month, some two months. So, you know, let's really look at what short-term rentals do. They can help us when people come from Pepperdine and they have to drop their kids off for school or they want to come visit them. There's no hotels. So they use our short-term rentals and they're families. They have two guests, three guests, even sometimes six guests. Um, you know, so some of the comments that I heard tonight, you know, especially when I heard, you know, Skyler say that people in Malibu city workers may lose their jobs. We're going to let them lose their jobs because we're not going to have enough, you know, income and we're going to take short-term rentals and try and cut it by 80%. Uh, you know, that's not good business practice. Let's come up with something that does work. You know, if we just had an ordinance where everybody had to go down and get a business license or get some- Mark, kind of your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Joe Drummond. Hi. Hi, Joe. We can hear you. Oh, great. I just want to thank you all and Reva for all your support for Big Rock and the county's pilot generator project we found out about today. We're very elated and grateful. Um, I understand that short-term rentals need regulation and enforcement, which is why this ordinance has come to play, come to pass. But if there is only one home in Malibu that is causing problems, then maybe that one should be banned and the rest left alone. I do think primary residents, short-term resident, short-term rental owners should have less restrictions. We ask that you add another permit for primary residents who rent eight weeks or less in the year, so it is ready to be left alone or minimally adjusted once the on-site host requirement is added. Given our comments earlier, this permit should be a lower fee and still have the same regulations. When the on-site host requirement comes to vote, they can be added to full-time STRs and the eight week or less primary resident permit can be required 24 seven contact info, that's it. I'd like to also ask if you can give an incentive to residents to rent this short term over long term by keeping the TOT to 12% for these residents. These rentals are still used as a resident by our guests who enjoy Malibu immensely for a few weeks a year. It's not only, it's not a business. Personally, we only rent to families like ourselves who want to come and enjoy Malibu on a personal level for a few weeks a year and have always been kind and courteous to our neighbors and no parties. Yes, we've also rented to families of Pepperdine students as well. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, Joe. So our next speaker is Colin Drummond. Great. Um, Thank you once again, uh, um, Mayor Pearson and Honorable City Councilors. Um, I'd also like to say we're thrilled with the support the city has given us in uh, addressing uh, our generator issue in Big Rock. And we're truly thrilled by the announcement uh, tonight from um, the City Waterworks 29 group uh, about a permanent solution. Uh, it's a huge victory. We're very, very excited and grateful. Thank you. Um, I, you know, it, the, the, the SDR regulations seem to be kind of reasonable uh, to us. Um, the issue has to do with on-site portion of it, which we know you're not debating tonight, but will come up. So we just ask that you consider that um, STR owners are different types of people. There's people who are drawing full income that aren't living in the property at all. And, and then people like ourselves who are supplementing their incomes occasionally. Um, uh, as I said in earlier remarks, we are active members of the Malibu community. 
Um, we shop at the same places and send our kids to the same schools that everyone else does. Uh, we're active members of the community and, and volunteers. So uh, we're not contributing to the demise of Malibu through short-term um, rentals. So we think that the ordinance should make reasonable accommodation for very different types of people. So, um, so perhaps there are different ways of addressing it, such as uh, a special events permit could be made uh, based on uh, families and the vacation time that they have available uh, that they might also uh, rent uh, during that time uh, and, and to follow the other kind of regulations that are being suggested. The on-site host is, uh, is really onerous and doesn't seem like anything short of really just trying to ban STRs, which doesn't seem like uh, a fair treatment of giving people their rights to uh, rent out their homes responsibly on occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Our next speaker is John Choi. Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, John Choi, Policy Manager for Airbnb. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Uh, my comments highlight the points made in several prior letters to the City Council, most recent of which was dated August 7th. Let me begin um, by stating that Airbnb is committed to uh, serving as a good community partner. If we are notified of an issue, we will, on our turn, on our site, on our platform, investigate, including uh, verifying uh, that a booking occurred on our platform and take action as appropriate, including warning or educating our hosts of a complaint and including up to suspensions or permanent removal from our platform. To aid in this effort, we developed our neighbor tool. This can be found online at airbnb.com slash neighbors. Uh, this is a site where reports of nuisance activity can be submitted by local residents anonymously if desired. Uh, there's also a 24-hour hotline eight, uh, with the phone number of 855-635-7754, where residents can also call in with concerns about short-term rentals. We've also developed a law enforcement portal specifically designed to provide resources and tools to local law enforcement, and we've shared this information with your staff. We've also made it clear in our discussions and in previous letters to the city that our platform can help the city address chronic loses listings. We shouldn't let a few listings dictate the city's entire regulatory scheme and can take concrete action to mitigate the negative impacts. As of today, we've not received any requests for this level of support. However, in prior discussions with our hosts, we became aware of ongoing issues at uh, a property with open code violations issued, located at 3833 Sale Hidalgo Drive, a property that's been mentioned a few times by other speakers. We've researched the activity at this, address, at this address, and as a result of our investigation, we've suspended this listing from our platform for 30 days. Airbnb is also committed to upholding the Coastal Acts goals, which seek to maximize public access to our state's magnificent coastline. As noted by the Coastal Commission, STRs play a valuable role in serving the Coastal Acts mandates. The city's interim ordinance restricts previously allowed STR usage and runs afoul of its own local coastal program calling for the protection of existing visitor serving and recreation facilities. To this end, we've proposed two discrete permits, a historical use permit and a tourist core permit to ensure consistency with the city's LCP and the coastal acts mandates. We urge the city to consider these additional permits to avoid the possibility of litigation in the absence of the city seeking coastal review for its proposed ordinance. And finally, the seasonal restrictions proposed in the interim ordinance will significantly impact the city's TOT revenue stream. In 2019, Airbnb collected and remitted $2 million to the city of Malibu. We expect that passage of the ordinance as currently drafted may reduce TOT remittances by up to $1 million per year. Our internal analysis suggests that STR usage in the city is generally consistent month to month, with the occupancy rates for the banned months largely the same year round for whole home rentals, showing only minor decreases from October to February. Whole home rentals constitute the majority of Malibu's STR inventory, and the interim ordinance would significantly undermine the city's financial stability for years to come. To conclude, we ask this council to take into consideration Airbnb's efforts to ensure that a community is safe and responsible, to consider our recommendations to improve the draft policy's legal viability, and to give significant consideration to the long-term financial viability of the city when casting its votes tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Olson.
Hello. Can you Hello. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thank you for having me. I um, did uh, submit my comments uh, by email to each of uh, you guys in the council there and ladies in the council into the Malibu City email uh, prior. And I, um, I just want to start by saying that I was really directed here. This is interesting following up on Airbnb's um, representative here from emails from Airbnb as an Airbnb host. I'm also a 34-year-old 34 year, I wish I was 34 years old, 34 year long Malibu resident. And um, uh, so uh, I, I just going to read this from Airbnb. It is, this is a quote, it is critical that hosts attend this virtual hearing and speak out against the last minute set of rules that council is trying to jam through. So uh, this is what encouraged me to actually comment tonight. And, um, but for completely the opposite reason, I'm for this uh, interim uh, ordinance. Actually, I would modify my position a little bit after he having the benefit of coming at the end here and hearing uh, so many others' uh, positions, which uh, are all on both sides have some great points, but um, uh, specifically the the permanent ordinance. I would definitely prefer that, but something needs to be done. My business and my livelihood has depended since 2012 on, uh, on all the visitors and guests that come through short-term rentals, um, Airbnb isn't the hand that feeds me, but it has a place in all this. But locals, uh, those who live here and open their homes to um, to give that access for people coming from around the world is uh, is really important. It's vital. It's also vital to small business people and residents of Malibu like myself. I have a concierge business, concierge services, uh, tourism, tr tours, you name it. And um, uh, this is my livelihood, and I've been through the ups and downs, especially with the fire. And um, this needs to be dealt with, um, and it seems kind of ironic that someone like myself would be for this, but um, it's something has to be done because the nuisances are definitely, there's not just one house. There's not just one, it's not even the house. There's not just one place. There's there's more than a few. And I know this from my own personal experience, and bringing uh, an environment for our visitors and our guests and our and our residents and all of us who live here is the most important thing of all to do that in a responsible way. And it's just, it's growing in the opposite direction. And we need enforcement. We need something that can be enacted and be enforced upon. So um, I, I appreciate uh, Bruce Silverstein's uh, elucidation on some of the issues. I really think that that affects uh, my opinion, but also someone like Joanne, and her passion about what's uh, what's happening here. I really urge you guys to pass this and then enforce it and get the permanent um, permanent ordinance in. That's the most important. So thank you so much for having me. Okay, thank you, Richard. So Mayor Pearson, we have one person who signed up after this item was called. Would you like to hear their comment? Yeah, sure, that's fine. The next speaker then is Sharon Karsh, and then we'll try to circle back to the people we missed earlier. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi guys, it's Sharon Karsh. I think some of you people know me from my husband, Steve Karsh. He was a um, avid, I don't know, he was just Mr. Karsh. Mm -hmm. He was the big guy in Malibu. And I know he was a good friend of some of you, you guys, and he volunteered on the Public Works Department. Anyways, we, I started, being a super host when Steve was still alive and I, he let me quit my job so I can, didn't have to ask him for any money anymore. And um, he backed me a hundred percent and we had a guest house and we met such great people and we had so much fun together and really we never had one bad thing ever happen. And then he passed away and it became a different situation for me where I really need money. I mean, um, he was a great guy, but he didn't leave me a lot of money. So I have to rent out my bottom full time. And then I have to rent up my space upstairs here uh, part time. This is my home. I'm not going to let just anybody in it. I'm very picky about who I let in it. Airbnb has definitely been beside me the whole way. Um, I've had one person that I didn't you know, think he would be, we were a good fit once he got here and they backed me the whole way. Um, I'm a hundred percent behind them. I always tell my guests where to go, where, what, where, where to go to eat, where to go to shop, where to go do everything in Malibu, how to enjoy their stay here. And it's only been such a great positive 
you know, all around. I've never had anything happen. I have Ofer next to me, to the left of me that has four units and he has full-time Airbnbs. And I've only had one problem in three years with all his Airbnbs and also have met some unbelievable people, especially during COVID now. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're being able to have people take out, you know, come and spend some time on the beach. And, you know, it's, it's hard for everybody going through this stuff. So, um, you know, I, and, you know, then we have people like, I'm sorry, my, Michael Lustig, I love you. You're a good friend of my husband's, but you don't even live in Malibu. And um, Edith, we all live on the same road. It's, you know, Michael Lustig has left Malibu, so he's not a resident here anymore. And I do believe he was lobbying against this for his own personal reasons. And I disagree with him on that. And Edith Morgan, who's a neighbor upstairs, is completely fenced in. And she was a friend of Michael's, and that's why she's talking. I mean, I hate to, you know, pull these people out, but, you know, it, it's, it, we're, it's a great, it's a beautiful thing. I've, none of you ever gone somewhere and Airbnb. Um, it's really fun. And it's a great way to learn uh, a new place. And I just hope you guys think about it because there aren't a lot of hotels in Malibu. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure that they are present in the meeting now, but we're going to try circling back to first is Dennis Sider. And we don't have Dennis here, so next if he's present would be Brian Merrick. We don't have Brian either, so next I'm going to call for Ann Doni. Ann is not present in the meeting, so my final call would be for James Isaacs. And he is not present either, so that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we're back at the council here. I, I see Christy has appeared. Hi, Christy. Uh, All righty. Did you have something to add, Christy, or did you just want to just hanging out, sitting in? Just, just here if you need me. Okay, you just appeared on this wonderful, beautiful beach scene. I thought I'd make sure. All right. Uh, City Council comments. Who wants to start? Karen. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, could I ask one of the speakers to come back for clarification? Um, that would be, sorry. You want to ask the staff the question first and see if staff can clarify? I think we were going to try and avoid doing that in the virtual setting. Okay. All right. Um, sorry. I'm just looking for that person's name. It was John Choi. Airbnb guy. The policy manager for Airbnb. I'll tell you what I was going to ask. And if, if the staff knows the answer, great. Um, regarding 3833 Paseo Hidalgo. Uh, he said that they that property has been put under a 30 day suspension and I was wondering has that already begun or when does it begin and then I had another question uh, what is the policy for reinstatement and then I have another question what if there are future violations and then I have another question what constitute grounds for a ban so all very interesting questions. Um, I know uh, that Trevor's been following up with Airbnb on some of the enforcement and it's kind of outside of what we're talking about in terms of the ordinance today, unless you're trying to weigh whether or not that platform's enforcement is you know, sufficient and, and therefore you don't have to adopt an ordinance. But otherwise, um, I think the, the best way for us to get answers to your question and then report back to you. 
unless it, unless you think it's relevant to your decision tonight. Otherwise, we're happy to do that. I know Trevor's been talking with them, and we can get um, a complete report to you on what their uh, souped-up enforcement um, program looks like and how it applies to that particular property. Okay, and then that would become part of the record, the answers to those questions? Um, well, in the record of the world, yes. Is it, how does it, how does it relate to the ordinance, your decision here? I mean, I'm just wondering what the platform um, uh, leverage is and responsibility is compared to ours uh, trying to deal with this. Um, and, and I'll just say, you know, it's, it's been mentioned in a variety of contexts, but uh, different iterations of this council have been hearing this item since November of 2017. Uh, and I think, and, and not to mention the planning commission. So this is, I'm not even sure if I counted right, the sixth or seventh time this has been dealt with. Everybody would really like to put this to rest. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's so interesting because um, it is true. This conversation has been going on for a long time. Um, it's, it's a, an interesting conversation because it's taking place in a changing world. Like, for example, um, when we first sort of encountered the uh, impact of the online platforms um, stepping up the use of, of these short-term vacation rentals, because they've always, we've always had you know short-term rentals in Malibu, right? And years ago, everyone would trade homes in the rent realtors would do it, but that was before the internet. And so it was, you know, a very small group of, of homes that were doing this, but there was always some of that. But then um, when we first encountered Airbnb, and I don't mean to sound confrontational or facetious in any way, I'm just being historian here. Um, Airbnb took the position that they weren't even doing business in Malibu. Like that was their original position that they were just a platform out in the world, out in the, in the ethers, and that anything that transpired between the hosts and the city was like not their problem. And then over the years, there has been a lot of evolution. And so now what we heard tonight um, was very different than the story that was originally sung. It, it's changed over time. And now I, it does appear that Airbnb is taking more responsibility. I don't know the other platforms, but Airbnb, because we heard them tonight, is taking more responsibility for um, in enforcement, I'm assuming because um, we're not the only city, I know that we're not the only city that is having these discussions about what to do with the um, short-term vacation rentals. So it, I, your point is well taken. It has been a long time, but it's also been a long time because the it keeps changing on us. The thought. Trevor, do you have anything to add on the enforcement issue? I didn't mean to jump in, but. Uh, no, I mean, it's a, uh, you know, Airbnb has developed a whole series of, of new protocols in terms of, of uh, their ability to take action or willingness to take action and also communicate with law enforcement. And that's been ramping up. So, um, those discussions are, are continuing here. It, it's, it's nice to see them taking a, a step out to um, address um, issues that are very important to our, our community. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I think for me, one of the most cogent points made tonight was made by Doug Stewart uh, talking about enforcement. Because without enforcement, it's just a bunch of words on paper. Um, and he did mention the example of Lake Arrowhead uh, where the um, permit fee generates enough money to pay for effective enforcement. And I think we should be seriously looking at that. Um, and if that if that means increasing staff or retraining the current staff or or uh, doing something to to up our capacity, we've got to do that. We 
you know, I don't, I, I realize code enforcement are our staff. Short-term rental is one, one thing that they deal with out of many. I mean, I, I guess I'll ask, d d can anybody tell me what's the, what's the, the percentage of, of code enforcement's time spent on short-term rental? I don't okay. have an Maybe a better question is, is there a provision in these things if we do set up a permit situation to have more resources for more code enforcement? I think that's what she's getting at. I don't have an answer to the specific question of how much time is spent on short-term rentals currently, but um, Council Member Mullen is, is, I think, correct in this question about um, how would it look if we had more tools and resources and the interim, the, what we're calling the interim ordinance, but this DTA that's in front of you tonight um, would put in place tools that would make a, it a lot more straightforward to um, deal with uh, bad actors. Um, right now, we don't have a permit process. Um, this would make it so that one is there's one permit per person. Um, it's it sets forth new regulations that um, could be, you know, that and a, and a system for um, violating it once or twice, and then your permit is revoked or can be revoked. Um, we don't have any of these things that are are laid out in as straightforward a fashion today that um, this ordinance is proposing. Um, it'll it would take everybody a little bit of getting used to and people will have to come in and get their permits and things like that, but we will have a lot more things to react to um, in terms of uh, dealing with bad actors than we do today. Thank you. Yeah, anybody who's read this can see that uh, there's there's one tool after another laid out here um, and I want to thank anybody and everybody on the staff who worked on preparing this. So I think I, I would like to um, step back for what, however long this is going to take um, and hear what some of the other council members have to say. Hey, Rick, I see seeing your hand there. Yeah, you know, this is a very complicated issue. And let me see if I can frame the dilemma, but also kind of talk about so everyone sort of realizes how we got here, you know. Uh, the big COVID bomb went off and sort of derailed everything that was moving along. Um, we considered this a while back and we wanted to come up with something that was sort of bulletproof in court. And we preferred to, to pick, to plagiarize some, you know, another organization, Santa Monica, that had withstood a, a legal challenge. And that was the way to go. How, how is it that we're back here now? is because you, Mayor um, Pearson, and I agreed with you, are like, uh, you know, and it's mainly because of these problem properties, these problem properties that are a living nightmare for these people, unfortunately. And I get a kick out of the Airbnb guys, like with their enforcement. It's like, how in the world can that organization let that nightmare go on here? That's not enforcement. They're not looking out for those people at all. I mean, I assume that's an Airbnb property and, it, and it's turned into a nightmare. It's a festering sore that has really been very corrosive, not just for that community, but it's become a poster child of what's wrong with their whole industry. So that's why we're here. We're here because we, we were concerned about waiting however long it takes to go normally. And God knows how long it'll take in the age of COVID for the, the ordinance we want to go up to the Coastal Mission Commission and come back and we would, we, according to our legal experts here, wouldn't have any teeth in our enforcement arsenal in the meantime. And that's why we're talking about this thing is to get to the enforcement um, capability quicker. It'll still only be about six months because there'll be a phase-in period where they got to come and get their permits and all that. So that's where we are. Now, the people who are against this, and they make a lot of sense, are are essentially saying no no don't don't god you're gonna you're you're now making it legal stuff that and it does actually say in our code that you can't have a bed and breakfast in a residential neighborhood it does and i was the one who pointed that out after it was 
brought to my attention in a previous city council meeting. But, we have, you know, we live in the real world and, and it's not as it's not as easy as Bill Sampson would like to say. And, you know, I agree with him. I would like to say we don't do short term rentals because it's not allowed, but we've been allowing it for a long time. And we also live in the real the reality of having to deal with the Coast Commission and people lining up to take us to court and all of that. So this is a question for Christy and Trevor and why can't we have enforcement with the other one? Let's say it comes in front of us next month and we pass it. Why can't we enforce that right away? You know, essentially like this one. Why do we got to wait? I guess I hit my hand on the buzzer first, so I'll get to answer. Um, the other ordinance, the home sharing ordinance, we will be able to enforce as soon as it's certified by the Coastal Commission as an LCP amendment. And it's, it has to be certified as an LCP amendment because it um, changes the use in Malibu. And that's, um, that's where we're at. I don't, yeah. and I asked you this before on the phone today, and I don't really get the distinction between how that's changing a use when it's essentially renting out your house, but there's the requirement that you physically be there. And this essentially has all other kind of changes of use. Like you have to have a, a person there available 24 hours. Why is that more of a change of use than this is a change of use? Well, the interim ordinance has um, also been evolving and kind of strayed a bit from its original intent. I think its original intent was not to be, it was to be uh, enforcement tools only, to be a series of enforcement tools to enforce the rules we have, more tools. Because I don't think anyone should walk away thinking we don't have any tools. We have tools to enforce our code. Um, these would be easier because they uh, make it easier for us to track when there's a violation. So. But we can still enforce our noise ordinance and parking laws and things like that. Um, but to the extent that you're talking just about that difference, if um, if we ask you to provide the name of a, someone who can be called 24 hours because you're running an Airbnb, that doesn't change that how and when you can rent it out as an Airbnb. But, you know, I just want to say, we keep using Airbnb as a shorthand, like we use Kleenex or Reynolds Wrap. You know, it's become kind of the brand name and it's kind of not there across the board. I'll continue to do it because I'm a creature of habit, but let, let the record show that that means any online platform that assists short-term um, vacation rentals to the general public. When I say Airbnb, that's what I mean. But so that is just a, re a regulation that allows somebody who's gonna use it how it's allowed to be used right now, but it just gives us a tracking mechanism. It, when, when we get to home sharing, if you were to adopt home sharing, that would change the use. You could only now use your property if there was somebody present. And if there weren't, or if it was a second home and it was a, whatever, there are a whole series of ways that a lot of properties would be eliminated from being able to use um, their property for short-term vacation rentals. Okay, got another question, and maybe it's for you, or maybe it's for Bonnie, probably. You know, we have sort of, at least it says in the staff report, kind of um, an indication from the Coastal Commission that, uh, you know, they're okay with this interim thing and implementing it and us being able to enforce it with the understanding that whatever permanent version we uh plan to do comes before them eventually as an LCP amendment, correct? So far, uh, we have not had any other comments from them on this ordinance, but yes, that is what they um, indicated when this came through um, the last time. Okay. So the big question is, and of course we live in the coastal zone, so it's um, whatever we may think about the Coastal Commission as an entity, it's up to us and it's responsible 
for us to maintain a good working relationship with them so that um, you know, we were able to do the things we want to do and understand what sort of um, intervention they might do. So the question I'm getting at is here, let's say we, we, we come up with some version of this tonight and say, hey, let's, that sounds good. Let's go for it. Let's bring it back in a month for the final reading at the same time, maybe as the other one is going to come in front of us, which I believe is on September 14th. And in the meantime, let's try and get an understand, a clear understanding of from the COSA Commission, if that's possible, if that's possible, of what type of enforcement we can have for both of them in the meantime. And then we can make an intelligent decision as to which way we want to go. Because I think clearly the other one is where everyone wants to go. But, you know, you've got this horror story going on in Paseo, wherever it is, that Nobody really wants to leave those guys out, you know, hanging in the breeze there for the next, whatever, year or two. And, and they're not the only problem. Of course, there are other problems. So is that a realistic thing or do you not, is, is it best not to even engage in that discussion? I mean, I'm just being real. Um, you want me to go? <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Sure, then. Um, the only thing I was going to just clarify is that we're targeting September 14th, but there, uh, I think one of the earlier speakers mentioned that um, she wasn't sure about that. And that's because the notice requirement is a, is 21 days. And so the, the noticing hasn't worked its way through the process yet because it's a little early, but that's just wanted everybody to know that's what we're targeting. Or the so, other one. Or the other one. Okay. To, um, to council. The one well, we, that we still can make that window. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if I understand your question, um, you're asking, um, that would it make sense to, on September 14th, hear the, um, the home sharing ordinance and also look at um, some enforcement Please. tools that we could enforce um, while the LCP amendment was pending and that those enforcement tools would have been the com the product of some discussion with the Coastal Commission so we could feel some insurance that you weren't just enacting a lawsuit but that you were enacting some real tools. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, essentially. I mean, what we yes. want, it's like what everybody wants is the other one, really. I mean, that's what the people of Malibu, I think, want. And, and it's intelligent for us to do that because it's withstood a legal challenge already by, you know, in another municipality. So that's an intelligent way to go. That's good risk management for us. But we really, the reason why we brought this back is because we don't want to leave those people who are negatively impacted by these horror stories that are going on in places with people partying all night long. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with, with Joey on the phone. The guy's 77 years old. He's been there since the 80s. He's burned out in the fire. He rebuilt. And now he's got a freaking nightmare next to him. It's going on all the time. And we have to be able to do something about that and not wait two years to be able to do something for those guys. So that's the big question. Okay. So well, let me just uh, also say, just so we don't lose sight of this, it's, it's not going to be the Coastal Commission that sues the city, right? It's going to be these... Um, hosts who are left out and it'll, you know it'll come from you saw a bunch of lawyer letters right you got patrick perry and jim arnone and right. um marshall camp and right there are a lot of lawyers out there um who are paying attention so i appreciate you know trying to only um take the legal risks if there are any with those um initiatives that you really want that are that are gonna both accomplish your goals and be worth fighting for. So that's a, it's a, I think a healthy approach to it. Um, and the answer to your question is yes. We, I mean, there are two things we can do. One is, you know, we are following up with Airbnb about that particular property that you've heard testimony from the platform already. And I know that, you know, my office is working on that as well. So the, the heavy hand of government is about to come down on that particular property to the full extent that we can. Um, working on that. Second thing is that to the extent that we don't feel like we have enough tools or like we could clear it up, we could certainly take what's in front of the interim ordinance 
call out just those things that are enforcement related, which I think um, I think is a much less vulnerable way to go. If we're not adding any changes to the use, we're just doing enforcement, then a lot of problems go to the wayside. I, you know, I heard Mr. Silverstein and, and some others um, expressed some concern about a theory where if you were to enact a change in the use that it would be sort of ipso facto saying the use was okay at all and maybe that would be surrendering um, a, uh, a, an argument that we might have had. I'm not, I don't, I don't think I agree with that, but by going this route, you certainly would accommodate that concern because um, if we're only adopting the um, you know, civil fines, um, having to uh, make sure you meet certain criteria, like having a 24-hour uh, um, number to call, like a, a series of things that are just regulatory in terms of an existing use without changing it at all. And that mostly that's going to mean taking out the um, provisions that have to do with um, if you're uh, it's a primary residence or not. That's the part that kind of crosses over into the use area. But we could call that out, run it through the Coastal Commission staff, see if we can't get their buy-in, talk with the, you know, each other and the, whoever else wants to comment on it and bring it back at the same time on the 14th and then you could kind of do a one-two punch or consider a one-two punch. That's kind of what I'm talking about. I don't want to take up all the oxygen here, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. And it sounds like what you're saying is, hey, if you really want to be squeaky clean on your ability to enforce and not be legally challenged, then essentially you're just saying it's, it's like the Wild West right now, but the Wild West is still going on, yet we have, they still have to get a permit and they, we have better enforcement tools and blah, blah, blah. And we've reduced our legal vulnerability by not by saying, oh, you guys can only do it during the summer and you guys can only do it during the winter time, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, I'm gonna let somebody else talk because I'm, I'm taking up too much of the action. But I, I think that's, that's, what we're, that's why we're here. We're here because we want a long-term solution that's stand up in court, that makes sense, that looks out for people, that has the built-in. You, know, you, heard, you heard that guy who lives in his thing. He's not going to let people go crazy on where he lives. And that's the great thing about the, the on-site person. That, I think it's the way to go. And it stood up in court. But in the meantime, we just can't let these guys go, you know, it's crazy over there. And the, unfortunately, those guys, have, because those platforms have not policed themselves they've created a big problem for themselves and that's it's not just in Malibu it's everywhere so, all right I'll keep my mouth shut there. well said um Jefferson you want to take a stab at it thank you Mr. Mayor appreciate that well um after hearing for an hour and a half two hours on the subject matter most of us should be experts by now and I know most of the council members uh, haven't had as many years as I have at this, but you're all becoming quickly uh, enriched with legal process and challenges. So I'm going to be as brief as I can. Both the interim text and the long-term one can be challenged. Both. Christy will tell you, yes, they can be challenged. They're going to be challenged. Why would we want to vacillate? Why would we want to move? from the long-term initiative, which has a great deal of local support to go for an interim that will take staff time and staff energy and put us on two rails going different directions. I'll repeat that, two rails going different directions. The challenges from all these attorneys that are watching tonight, including Mr. Choi, will come about when they see fractured tracks of action. Those actions are hey, the council is over here, the council is over there. They listen to their homeowners. Some of them are trying to modify their behavior so that they can accommodate everybody. There's no two ways about accommodating this. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there tonight, a lot of hocus pocus. But the fact is they can all be challenged. The best thing for us to do, in my opinion, as a city council, is lead us on the right track, which is the long-term belief that the challenges will come about with fewer and less ferocious ferocity if we go with the Santa Monica rule and we stick with it and put our staff and our energy on that one, one 
rule that we should be going with, which Rick just said. That's the one everybody wants, and that's the one I surely do want. And to ask oh. Mr. Choi, he said that we're doing a 30-day knockdown on that on Paseo Hidalgo. What's to stop that property owner, Madison, from just going to another platform? Oh, darn. Airbnb spanked me. I'll just move over to RBO. So don't don't go down this path, folks. I mean, truly, we need to stick with what we've been trying to do. And I'm sorry, Joanne Gary, you've been a, a, a delightful woman. You've been very, very patient with me. And Bill Sampson, another great supporter. I appreciate your positions, but I don't want to see challenges everywhere we go. We can't waste staff time. We're always told about how we have not enough time. We can't get that agendized. Let's stick down the path. Let's just go down that right rail. Thank you, Mikey. So I just want to uh, follow up with you, Jefferson, because it sounds you sound like what you're saying is, is what I said. So you're comfortable. I think what Jefferson's getting at is let's do the one we want to do and enforce it right away. See if we can get some enforcement mechanism right away and, and go for that. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because no, thank you, Rick, because no matter what we do, the challenges will come about. So let's go with the one that has the stronger influence, the one that's already been to the appellate court, the one that's waiting to go to the Supreme Court. That's going to take years. In the meantime, the Coastal Commission, all they can do is say, we're going to challenge it. We can implement that. Then we don't have one short term to implement and then a long term one to implement. Let's just go for it all and stick with our path. We've been on a good path. We've been rewarding those who are speaking this evening. We've given them a, an observation. We've shown them what the challenges are. I think the, the general population of Malibu will back us if we go on the long-term one. And thank you, Rick, for, for seeing it that way, just in a different direction. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, everyone wants that one. We just want to make sure there's enforcement. That's why, we're, that's why we brought this thing back. So, Chris, do you want to comment on what Jefferson said? Um, I'm speechless. <laughs> when have you seen that in 30 years? Um, I, I agree that um, you can move forward with what's coming to you from the Planning Commission. Um, I don't think you ought to pre-decide that now because who knows what little things you might want to change or whatever, but it, it will come to you and you can send it out. You can't enforce it until it's certified by the Coastal Commission. Um, when we talk to the Coastal Commission about enforcement, we will also ask about an expedited process and see if we can't, um, you know, that the Coastal Commission is motivated to try and, you know, keep uh, air, some short-term vacation rental options open in the coastal zone and what's coming to you from the um, Planning Commission does that. And so they may be um, willing to work with us on an expedited process. That's the best I can think of. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fair elaboration. Thank you, Christy. Okay, uh, Skylar, um, want to take a run at this one? Well, um, I appreciate all the comments and correspondence from people. I know that there was a lot of that to go around and everybody spent a lot of time mm -hmm. on it. Um, you know, I feel that as a council, we need to get to a place where we can put this to rest. This conversation has been going on to a long time. It's important for us to do it right. I'm kind of inclined to, you know, um, sort of agree with, with Jefferson and Rick on this one. Um, so I'm not going to take up a lot of the time, but, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that there's, um, you know, a need for us to get something on the books. I don't want to jump the gun with that. Um, it's kind of my gut feeling. I don't want to make a mistake on this one. So I'll leave it at that for now. Well, you know, let me chime in here for a second. The reason we brought this back is because we need enforcement. So let's say as it's right in front of us now, we say, okay, looks good. Let's pass it. The next time it comes through, we pass it. We implement it. It's going, it's in place. As it's, as it's written, okay? And we start enforcing it six months from now while the other one is going downrange. When the other one goes downrange and gets approved, which is gonna take a while, probably, 
then it supersedes the one we're using in the meantime, correct? That's the whole idea of this two-tiered thing. I mean, the reason we're here is because we don't want to wait forever to be able to have enforcement. So we need to talk about that. Yeah, I agree with Rick. We're talking about this because we're looking for prompt relief. And the last time we talked about it, I asked Bonnie, what would you estimate would be the length of time for this to go through coastal and get on the agenda? And the answer was 12 months, a year and a half. So Bonnie, has that changed? Uh, no, I think the pandemic has probably slowed things down just because of um, there was a, they had a backlog and a, a delay in getting going with virtual hearings like a lot of people did, like the city did. So um, I would expect it would still take a while unless it was um, done in the context that Christy described where it was um, kind of bifurcated with the short term tools that don't require amendment potentially, and then longer term dealing with the, the, what the vision is for hosted rentals. Right. So the, the idea being that um, regardless of what, if any, um, LCP amendment you put in to change the current rules, we, we can at, every, at any time and continuing bring back additional enforcement tools if we think we need them. For example, you know, a, a hefty civil fine might be helpful or a suspension of the um, the registration permit, which, you know, is in the intro. We can take those out and independently put them in and use them without having to, you know, have this larger conversation of, that creates the new use that everyone's nervous about. So we can take the stuff that we really need, which is how to punish and enforce um, scoff laws until the LCP gets certified and have you enact those and also use the ones we have now. And maybe when we come back for a budget amendment, we can look at increasing, for example, the fee for registration in order to create some um, program of enforcement so we can have a de designated um, person who can be available, enforcement person who can be available to monitor just that use and so there are things that we can do and we don't we don't have to do it all tonight i mean this has been going on for a long time so it's you know we'll clamp down on this one use every tool we can think of and see which ones work the best and then continue to use those as we go along that sounds reasonable to me um and i'll i just want to address um a question that jefferson uh posed why move on tonight's ordinance? Again, it's because we've heard from people, we're looking for immediate relief. We're looking for immediate leverage and tools to deal with these issues. Um, and I'll say again, I got a lot of emails. I had people calling me. Um, quote, not everybody wants any one thing. I have heard a complete spectrum of opinion from people uh, wanting, wanting us to do nothing, wanting us to do the most extreme thing possible. So I don't, I don't, that doesn't sit well with me that everybody wants, I would say pretty much anything that's ever on our agenda, certainly not this. Um, so again, Immediate relief would mean moving on something tonight, what, whether we pick certain things out of it uh, or take some things out. Uh, but I, I just don't see us hearing this every six months or whatever, the way it's been going on. Yeah, I agree with you. We have to, we need some enforcement tools and we need to get that tonight. You know, and and it, maybe it's just okay. Let's 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 pass this like it's right in front of us, or change it a little bit, and bring it back in a month. 
I'll have a t- month to think about it and chat about it and, and get some more input and maybe get a little more intel from uh, the Coastal Commission, et cetera. And then, uh, and then if, we, if, we, if we feel like we're comfortable enough, pull the trigger. But that's why we're here. We're here because we want enforcement. And as much as we may favor the other one, and that's what everybody wants, or I mean, there's a majority of people that want it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take too long to be able to deal with this stuff. We, we're, the poor enforcement guys have no tools now. They're like going out to a gunfight with a holster and no weapons. And it's, it's idiotic. And then we just can't do that anymore. So we have to do something with this tonight, I think. This, and it should not supersede or, or, or negate um, the other one that is going to come in front of us in September. I don't think. Okay. Um, lots of great comments. I'm going to take a few minutes because you've all said a lot, and i got to distill it for my own brain. First of all, I know the staff spent a lot of time on this, trying to update this to reflect more of the uh, – Santa Monica ordinance for what this is. Um, so I just want to say thank you. It actually took a lot of staff hours. And I want to address something that was said too. Actually, Bruce, I, I don't know why you think Reva's bringing this forward. I don't know what that's about. I'm not sure what the blame Reva thing is about. I'll tell you if Reva pushes something forward, I'm not going to lie about it. I asked to bring this forward multiple times. Because I just, I'm on the phone with Joey and Joanne and them multiple nights, multiple times, texts in the morning. It doesn't end. Bill Sampson as well, but I think he just gave up. I don't blame him. You know, he probably fried a cylinder. He's so frustrated. Um, on the phone with Jim Braden, at, you know, with party houses with short-term rentals. That, that's been happening with COVID a lot. This isn't like just one thing. It's ongoing. And it just, I get to the point where I can't do nothing. Um, and in my long talk with Michael Lustig, I told you, Michael, I think you're on still. The same thing. I am fine with the other ordinance. I know we can get through that. But I'm, I told you tonight I would fight for enforcement because I don't know how to just abandon properties in Malibu and just leave them to, to, to suffer with this. As far as the interim ordinance goes, um, I'm, I'm here for enforcement. That, that's what I'm after. Some of the other particulars in it, I don't know. They're, they're not, I don't know, the non-visitor or the non-primary and primary and the some stuff in there, it, it, it doesn't resonate for me entirely by any degree. I don't know the multifamilies figured out. And what I was going to ask Christy is, I, I thought I heard you say in there, but not sure that we could have enforcement without, do we have to enact all of that ordinance? Or can we just sort of develop an enforcement vehicle here tonight and then just walk away from everything else? Because I think that's what we're really after. Right. Uh, so. I think that is what you're after. I, I, doing it tonight would be um, difficult because we really do need to, to um, spend some time just pulling it out. But it isn't like you haven't sent the message that this is now an, you know high enforcement um, priority. And there's nothing you're going to do tonight that's going to become, you know, immediately enforceable. But we can bring back on the 14th. And I think if you look at them together, it might make more sense for the community, too. Because I think there are a lot of people who are just confused about this, these two tracks. And I, I think, you know, Councilmember Wagner kind of put it like it felt to people like you were going in really separate directions. And that's not what's intended. It's what's intended is what, you know, Councilmember... Um, Mullen described, which was, you know, to have the ordinance that for long term that you want go through the long term track and create some immediate tools for enforcement. And what happened was one immediate tool for enforcement is, you know, to create a permitting system. And then, and then as you guys started talking about, it, you started adding things on and then, 
with the primary residence and then the summertime and then the not summertime. And it became, you know, a much broader regulatory scheme. So we want to take some of that out of it and go back to some serious just enforcement. And I, I again, I think civil fines, um, some kind of registration is important. I think, um, you know, uh, Councilor um, Fair's correct that maybe we can fund a, a, another position using some uh, regulatory fees. I mean, there's, you know, very classic, more enforcement related, less, you know, um, short-term vacation rental related things that we can do. So I hear what you want. I think we can do it. Um, this this ordinance, I think, got very wrapped up and so it'd be hard to tonight, for me anyways, I don't know, maybe um, Bonnie is up for the task, but to, to separate out what is peer enforcement from, from the regulation stuff. But it, it can be done. We can bring it back on the 14th in a, a big package. You're gonna hear the item anyways. So it's not like we're um, adding to the length of that meeting. Same topic. We'll hear them together. <laughs> okay, a couple, thank you. Um, a couple more things. So there's a lot of fear out there that by doing anything outside of the Santa Monica style ordinance, that we're gonna pollute the waters and we're gonna end up with grandfathering and all sorts of other, other issues. Why is that not true? Or is there a danger? Well, you, I mean, you're ultimately gonna set a policy if you change your mind. And you know, I don't know what you're gonna do, but you can, as the policymakers, you can um, change the policy of the city and say, it used to be this way, and now it's that way. And then in we the, if legally, we then have to look at, okay, well, how do you phase that in? You know. How, what, how many months do people need of notice and to get ready and to implement it. But that part of it just kind of follows more mathematically. You'll decide whether or not anyone's grandfathered or not. You'll decide. Okay, so you're saying there is a track to sort of move on in a way from the interim ordinance as we're calling it craft something that brings us enforcement much quicker than the long-term vision will. It probably involves a permit system to help pay for enforcement, if I'm hearing sort of the way your mind's working on this. Will that part of the system stay as we move forward or will we or we'll just have to probably clean it up as we go or? Um, we'll, we'll bring to you, um you know, what we think is enough. And if, as time goes by, you need more, we'll amend it. It'll be in your hands because it'll just be enforcement. It's not going to be the regulating the use. So hopefully that will be clear enough with Coastal. So we might be able to find a path here where we take, because we're, we're on two, we are on two different rails to just what Jefferson said. We're on a long-term rail and, and there's a short-term rail is how I would look at it. The short-term rail being enforcement because not Paseo Hidalgo has become the Airbnb of, of problems. You know, it's become the brand name in Malibu, but there's a lot, there's other issues too, as, as well as we know. Um, as I can, Jim, who's somewhere on here, I think waiting, Jim Braden can attest to the amount of times I've texted him and called him. Um, you know, I, I, I'd also say, I know this is hard to hear because you guys are sick of this and you've been talking about it for a long time and you're thinking about it and you're worried about it for a long time, but these public conversations have enforcement effect. You have, you've woken up a lot of people who are now understanding that their way of, of doing business, not the worst of them, the worst of them we're gonna have to bring down the hand of government on, that's obvious. But for a lot of people, um, these conversations um, help educate them about the fact that while they might be handling their own business very well, there are others that are, you know, in being disruptive in neighborhoods and they should, or, or they might not realize what is disruptive. They go, oh, I didn't realize all that parking was a problem, those kinds of things. So these conversations are also part of the ultimate enforcement effort. If it makes you feel any better about sitting here at this time of night. I, 
I think I haven't been on council as long as many of the other esteemed people here, uh, counselors, but you know, this is, this is a big issue. It's a difficult issue. I know for me, um, I really had to stop a number of months ago and really think about the long vision and the long vision is protecting our, our neighborhoods and having families that send kids to the schools and not just being a short-term rental community. And so I do believe we need to do something and find our way there. And I understand we, well, you know, we have to, there's a balance required. We can't just blanket, shut it down. That's not going to happen. So if we can go on a track where, um, hang on, Skylar, I'll get you. If we can go on a track where we get enforcement quickly, because the, the problem with the long, the longer term one, despite some different opinions, is that we just, I just cannot hang people out that long. It's just, it's just, it's just not right. So, um, that's certainly where my head is at. I guess, Bonnie, I guess the question I would ask that, um, I'm not asked that maybe concerns me is let's say we make a decision in, it sounds like in a month. We're still battling through this and it, it, it involves setting up a system to register people. That doesn't sound that easy. That's going to, that sounds like we have limited staff. I guess, are we going to use, potentially come up with a fee structure to help pay for a, a person or something to do that? Or what, how would you see that in your mind, Bonnie? Cause that to me sounds that I don't want to just leave that dangling. Like it's easy. I don't think it's easy right now. I don't think anything's easy. Um, so I appreciate your thoughts on that, or I see Reva popped on either one of you, because that that detail worries me. I think it. I think it's. I mean, nothing's all. Nothing's going to be super super easy, but I think we're also excited about it. And we have some ideas about how to accomplish it um, using a plat. Not I hate to say the word platform in many ways, but um, using um, whether currently we're signed up with host compliance. Maybe we end up with a different. Um, online uh, monitoring tool that has portals that can help facilitate all of that. Um, Reva's currently not on a screen where I can see her face. So I don't know if she's trying to chime in or not, but um, we would not be doing that completely manually. We would be using um, electronic tools like that. So. And as far as from the city end, do we envision uh, a fee structure that helps pay for enforcement? How, what would your view of that be, Bonnie, out of curiosity? I'll defer that one to Reva. She has a better sense of the cost of hiring staff and, and how to recoup that with fees. Um, we hadn't really spent a lot of time developing a fee structure. Um, obviously, we've been um, trying to get this uh, in front of you, so I hadn't wanted to, to spend a lot of time on that part of it. Um, but, you know, in, in speaking with my administrative and accounting staff, we just kind of realized we're going to have to absorb um, this workload um, if it's something that the council wants us to do. Um, very, as you know, you keep hearing me say, um, you know, we, we don't really want to keep adding positions at this time. So um, we'll just sort of walk it through and see how it goes. And if it becomes something that we just can't manage with current resources, then we have to come back to you with that. But um, our plan at this point was to try and absorb it. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, Skylar. Um, just one sec. Um, okay. I, I think I see where we're trying to head. I think we're, you know, maybe not perfectly aligned on this, but we're trying to head towards an enforcement mechanism in the immediate future-ish, hopefully, quickly, and and then head towards, it appears most of the council wants the uh, Santa Monica style ordinance. So that's what I'm hearing at this moment, Skylar. So, I mean, yeah, it seems very clear from staff. I think that there's definitely um, a way for us to, to get to a point to having the permitted process and you know using some technology to get there to manage all of this for staff. I don't think that that's the most difficult part of this. I just think that you know we as a council maybe right now is a time when we just go down the list of these things and say we want this in there, we don't want this in there. Staff can come back with that in a more concise format. We can move this forward. Um, I, I, I see that kind of as the best way to do it, and maybe 
if while we're doing that, Christy can point out, you know, these are what I see as enforcement and these are things that I see that it would be, you know, alter that. And this is what you should focus on. Uh, let me make a comment on that because that's a good idea, but maybe because there's been a lot of thought gone, that has gone into this one, what we should do is one month from now or whenever, September 14th, we leave this one as it is, okay? And we can go over some bits and pieces. There are some comments I have, but generally speaking, leave this one like it is. And like Christy was saying, develop one that's sort of an enforcement only of the way things are going on now thing that's simpler and we can consider the implications of that because that still means all those the wild west will continue we'll just be able to police it that may not be the way we want to go maybe we want to go with this one okay and then then we got the other one of course i mean there are some things i want to go over though in this skylar so i don't know if that's that that simplifies it but that might be something to consider maybe um i mean I'm more inclined to go go through this and, and get something like this done. So I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe that kind of gives the marching orders for where this should go. And if at that point, when this comes back, there's something else that, you know, is focusing strictly on enforcement, then that, you know, we have the option of looking at that too. I see Jefferson's hand in the air. But, uh, you know, I don't know if Mikey wants to take the lead on it or I'll take the lead on it. We can kind of run down these different topics. I have a bullet point list of what I believe all the main points are, what we're talking about tonight. Um, it's not that long, I promise. It's just part of that. So um, we could certainly go through that. It's not a bad idea. Um, it's not midnight yet. So, I mean, what do we have to lose? Um, but uh, first, I think Jefferson wanted to say something, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, go ahead, Jefferson. Thank you, Mike. I sure appreciate that. I'll just be as brief as I can. Um, I just want to thank the council for the deep thought that they put into all this. Um, it's evidenced by your knowledge of the subject matter. And I do appreciate that. And many of the people that put us in office will appreciate that. They will also appreciate you, Mikey and Rick and Skyler, Karen, of taking the lead on this and being strong about it and moving forward in a positive way and not asking Reva staff or staff itself to put more time into this. I, I think we're at that t- place in the city's history where we just need to stand together as a council and move forward on that long-term track because I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna pick things apart. We're gonna go down a, a, a side curve at, at a 33 or 45 degree angle and it's gonna detract from us and it's gonna tr- detract from what the Coastal Commission is going to be looking at. But I do appreciate your thoughts. You've really gone deep into this and uh, I want to pat you each on the back for that, but I'm going to stick on that long-term one. And and we're only talking a month or two apart. The challenges will come forward on whatever we do. So keep that in mind, my fellow council members. And thank you, Mikey. Yeah, thank you, Jefferson. Let me, can I ask you a question? How, with what you just said, because we understand it could be a year and a half before the Santa Monica style ordinance goes through. What about immediate enforcement? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was talk, yeah, talking to you. Just raising a hand. Um, the immediate enforcement are on a couple of subject properties. Let's say there's a half a dozen that constantly are on our thumb. And Christie's outlined a way we can go about doing that. But if we that if we move too much, it, just my opinion, if we move too much, we're going to see a challenge no matter what we do. These these crafty people, and I'm going to call them out, Madison, a couple of others, will just simply change platforms, and they'll they'll find ways around it. And if we sp- spend s- staff time and Reva's time on chasing these down, and Doug Clevenger's got to document this, that, and the other thing, that's that's just their mantra. That's just their modus operandi of how they work. So just want to let you know that, uh, that that's my feeling. And I think a lot of people in the community feel the same way that all of you do. Hey, they're sure trying for us, but let's go for the big picture. Cause that's the one that counts. Thanks again, Mikey. 
Okay, no, I hear you. I just don't think we're ignoring the big picture. I think we're embracing it, just trying to walk our way there. So that's 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 the the two rails I'm trying to connect <laughs> um, to use your language. So it's a good one, Christy. You look like you like you had a, something to add here. No, oh no, okay. I saw a smile. I thought, uh, Skyler. I just I just feel like this is a step to getting to that long term goal, and I think it, it's an interim step um, that. I, I'm actually going to say that I feel like it is a bit in line with it. I think that the priorities at the end of the day are relatively similar. So, um, you know, I think that we should take the, uh, you know, if, if we were to say we can focus on this long-term goal and we're going to have that done in three months, that would be a different conversation. I think that that's unrealistic. Um, and I think that, having discussed I, this item has been basically getting discussed my entire time in office, which is almost nine years or eight and a half years, I think at this point. Yeah. So, you know, it'd be awesome to get, you know, just a little bit of it to rest. Um, no kidding. I think, I think everybody agrees with that. Well, yeah, but it's also, it's, I think it's very much unfair to members of our community that have been frustrated and, Every council has been like, okay, we're going to deal with this and then just not deal. With it. And I don't mean to say, I'm not like saying that we haven't deal with it. We're trying to deal with it, but it just gets kicked down the road and kicked down the road and kicked down the road. And then we come back and it's okay. We have the wild west going on and now we want to get some enforcement here. All um, right. This is the end of the road. So let's deal with it. You want to go over it? Let's go over it. Yeah. Let's go over it. You want to go down this summary? That yeah. Is well, to me, I have the first thing is, the bullet points on our one active STR permit. Uh, I'll just read them first. 24 seven contact, maximum occupancy rates, no on-street parking with, you know, exception if you don't have any, valid uh, OWTS permit or compliance agreement. Permits revoked if for a bunch of reasons, TOT do, outstanding code violations, doesn't comply with safety codes, laws or ordinances, Appliance application not updated, like the contact name, for example. Property not in condition to be approved. Has received more than two citations in 12 months for noise. Um, it also includes that other tier, which is the part that I'm not sure what I think of. Non-primary resident from April 1st to September 30th. Feels odd. The multifamily permit. I think this one says limited to two maximum units and then a non-primary permit revoked for two citations. So as opposed to three for the primary uh, permit. Um, it was updated by staff with a proof of residency uh, update, um, an OWTS uh, update, notice of approval. I'm not, I can't remember what that note means. Platform liability, more like Santa Monica. And then a list of enforce, enforcements and penalties. So that's kind of a just highlight of what's before us now. And if we're heading towards enforcement, it seems like it gives us sort of direction in here um, so that we don't, you know, to Jefferson's point, get off the rails too far. One comment I had about was that in the notice of approval, I read that essentially because of COVID, instead of noticing the people within 500 feet, you know, via mail, it's like, well, you know, they're encouraged to reach out to him. That's a little lame. I think they should still have to mail stuff out to him. Hey, the mail service still works in the age of COVID. Because if you just say, instead, owners will be encouraged to reach out to their neighbors and contact them. Well, if you encourage people to do something, they ain't going to do it, you know. That's a fair you point. A requirement. So I would, I, I would like to see that get back to the Previous thing where you just said. to have the mailing uh, notice requirement, yeah, within 500 feet. Three, yeah, okay, I agree with that. Um, it seems to me we could adopt the same penalties as we're heading for in the Santa Monica style ordinance, it'll make it easier when there's a if there's a transition to that ordinance, also. I mean, that, that way we're already down that path. There's no change there. Is there consensus on, on that? Sounds smart. Okay. 
Um, Were there any items you had, Skylar, that you uh, had issues with or were interested in modifying? There's a couple things, and I actually think that they're kind of, you know, relatively, you know, substantial issues. First, in regards to the street parking. Um, it's a big one. Yeah, I think it's a big one, but I think that it's also sort of dealt with when you deal with the occupancy based on bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that that's, I don't even think that we need the parking part in there because if you're, let's say you're renting a place on the beach and it has two bedrooms, right? So you're going to get two cars. You're either going to be parking one in a garage or you're going to be parking them both in front of the garage or out on the street. And there's nothing that stops somebody from most of the majority of our parking in the city is um, unregulated, not permitted. And I think that you're going to, I think that we all of a sudden have to walk like kind of an awkward line of saying that these people aren't allowed to park here. And what happens if they say, oh, that's my friend and they're just going to the beach or, you know, like you, you can't really single. I don't know how you, I don't know how staff goes and single those people out. Yeah. If they're having a huge party, that's a different conversation, but that's getting dealt with in here anyways. And I think that for the most part, your five, six, seven bedroom houses that are in the neighborhoods that are not on the beach have the parking in the driveway because you're not allowing a, you know, seven bedroom house on a 5,000 square foot lot. You're allowing that on a larger piece of property. Um, I mean, maybe that's different in a little bit in the, you know, area above La Costa or something because some of those houses are half size and they only have a two car garage, but a lot of the other places have a driveway and plenty of space to park. Um, so that's one thing that I have issue that I, that I think, I don't know if it needs to be in there or not. Is there, is there consensus then to uh, take out the parking restriction and just keep it at the bedroom restriction? Well, so what does the bedroom restriction say? It's basically two per bedroom or something. What does it say? Where is that? It says two per bedroom plus two. Okay. All right. There's, also, there's, also, there's also a cap at a maximum of 14, regardless of the number of bedrooms. Okay. All right. Everyone's good with that? Do, do we want to allow STRs to apply for event permits? That seems to be a diff another issue potentially. I mean, I, I think that's the kind of thing that worries me. Like, that, that's how we get into um, regulating and creating a whole nother use besides your um, goal ordinance, which is coming to you from the Planning Commission. You know, I, I would suggest if you really want to do something tonight, the most beneficial thing you could do is just adopt um, what is in the ordinance as um, Section 17.55090, which is the enforcement penalties. If you would, if you introduce that, you can adopt them on the 14th, and then on the 14th we can bring back to you this permitting scheme that will deal with some of the other things. Um, the revocation of a permit, I think, is a really important enforcement tool. So I think that is a like a good thing to have. But we, I think, we can grossly si simplify the permit itself so that. Um, the people who are concerned about you institutionalizing this use won't be worried. And then the people who are concerned about you over-regulating it won't worry. And it'll be more narrowly aimed at the scoff laws, which is really all we're trying to get at, right? I think that's great event. You said 17.55.090, correct? Yes. That's, that's the $1,000 a day fine for um, the violations, um, and that, that's, you know, that's the new teeth that we've been looking for. Also the, the revocation and appeal process tied to the permits too. I, would, I think we'd tie into that. Yeah. Number D. Oh, wait, um, not D. So what you're saying is essentially all that primary residents, non-primary residents. That's like, yeah. Yeah. So we're just we're just applying uh, enforcement tools to the present situation. Mm -hmm. yeah, following Santa Monica with enforcement tools in advance. Right. Exactly. 
And I guess the other side, listening to all the speakers and all the phone calls and et cetera that I was on is there's a lot of people that got to figure things out right now, like how they want to proceed with their property. You know, let's, let's say they have bought a house as an STR. So I guess part of the direction we're going gives them a chance to sort all that out as we work through this, because it's not like something's going to happen next week. Um, and whether I like it or not, that's probably, if you're in that situation, that's the kind of time you need. Well, they're going to have six months or whatever anyway from, you know, decision time. It's, it's not like the hammers. Right, 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 right. Well, I just, I'm trying to address those people because some of those people, these, this is a real issue. And, you know, I want to let them know that, hey, we're still we're making progress. Well, you know, Christy, you brought up an interesting thing, which is what kind of what I said before. It's like, why don't we in one month consider three things? One, the Santa Monica one. Two, this one before us right here, essentially in its present form. Three, what you just talked about, which is the enforcement mechanism of into the present situation. So the, the ways we could move on from that point is pass the Santa Monica one, send it down range to the Coastal Commission, put in the enforcement thing. In the meantime, we're not in the next month if we say, oh, well, wait a minute, I, I kind of like that, you know, uh, primary guy only rather than some guy out of state who owns 50 um, rentals. We're not throwing it out with the bathwater saying, God, what the hell do we do? We're just like shooting from the hip that night. So I think we should not get rid of this. Um, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I think it's probably the prudent way to go, which is the less risk averse legally. Um, because we're not monkeying around with what's going on. We're just enforcing the present situation. So that's what I would recommend. So there would be three ordinances then our versions brought forward. We're going to have the Santa Monica style ordinance. We'll have something similar to what's brought tonight. And then uh, a paired back version uh, where we're, we're focusing basically on just enforcement, not changing um, basically how people are, are, are renting out, but attaching penalties for people that are having noise violations and other types of um, neighborhood impact um, impacts. Right. Yeah. And this, and the, this, the most likely course of action is going to be, take door sure. number one and door number three and but we you know in case we change our minds in the next month we have to run out door number two and you and keep i would say i don't see a reason to rewrite anything of what we looked at tonight we, we've yeah. gone through this of you know ad nauseum with a lot yeah, of people. let's spare the the staff yeah. time you know put staff time to that we gotta you know we gotta streamline this a little bit i think we have a perfect chance to do that but I do think we need to send letters out to people 500 feet and not just encourage people to notice them when we get to that phase. Keep that in the pared down order. I can see that change. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Uh, yep. No, thank you. So we, so we haven't... Does somebody, somebody want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that um, concurrently, <laughs> hopefully... Continue, go, continue, go. This, continue this hearing to... September 14th, to hear concurrently, go ahead. The Santa Monica version, quote unquote, Santa Monica version, that the Planning Commission already passed. Uh, this one that's before us right now, and a essentially enforcement only um, tool for the present situation that is going on right now. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. Okay, good. I will second it. Yes, Jefferson. Final comment. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that's still watching and for my fellow council members that uh, I really do appreciate your deliberation. I appreciate your deep thoughts, your, um, the way you elaborate. Um, I think you're doing your community the best that you can. And uh, I really will applause and stand behind you in that. But um, once again, I have um, different thoughts, but um, I'm glad to see that it looks like four council members have gotten together on this. I just want everybody to know the Joanne Gary's, the Paul Wolf's, the Joey's and the Sa Bill Sampson's that your council is trying the best it can. And there are a lot of restrictions on your council, but um, 
I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done and the staff as well. But I failed to agree with you, but let's move forward. Thank you. Well, we haven't really decided anything tonight, Jefferson. We're, we're trying to coalesce it all together and our next meeting on this subject. So that. Yeah, our options are all still open. So we still got another month to mull it over and, uh, you know, change our minds. And maybe we'll do exactly what you're talking about, which is, hey, forget it. Let's just do, you know, the Santa Monica one and, and, and start enforcing right away. Who knows? Okay. Um, can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. May uh, Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Abstain. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, does anyone need a quick break or do you want to forge ahead? No, that was good. And Christy, thank you very much for showing up for the big one. We needed a two-headed legal monster tonight, and it was greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Well said. Um, does anyone need a break, or can we keep going? I'm good. Keep going. Okay. Item like 5A, um, Hotel project development agreement, public benefits. Can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor Pearson and members of the City Council. The item before you tonight is a follow-up to City Council direction provided on April 27th for staff to negotiate a development agreement for a proposed hotel project. This follow-up is concurrent with city review of the application and is not delaying the overall project timeline. We just felt that the purpose of uh, bringing this to you tonight is to ensure that we can present a stronger project to the Planning Commission and the City Council again, and ultimately the Coastal Commission for a final decision on the overall project. Next slide, please. The project involves two properties at 22729 and 22, um, sorry, 22791 PCH, and I, I um, miswrote the address on the staff report, and staff did note that. Next slide, please. As background, subsequent to the April 27th City Council meeting, city staff met with the applicant to discuss the projects and options for public benefits. The applicant informed staff that three additional hotel rooms would be added to the project since the, um, the previous city council meeting. This increase in rooms would not increase the floor area of the project. During meetings with the applicant, city staff provided suggestions for public benefits such as rooms dedicated to seniors, an on-site visitor center, or additional funds for the city's use. Um, the applicant has since submitted revised public benefits, which are included in the agenda report packet. Next slide, please. The, the latest offer involves $400,000 cash to the city and $400,000 to the Boys and Girls Club. Next slide. So at this point, Staff is requesting that the City Council provide feedback on the proposed public benefits, specifically whether the type of donation that the applicant is proposing is appropriate. In this case, the applicant is proposing cash, although City staff has also suggested other types of public benefits, such as an on-site visitor center or lower moderate rate hotel rooms or an elder hostel room. So staff is seeking um, planning or City Council's feedback on, on the type. And as far as cash offerings, staff is also seeking direction on how and to whom those dollars would be donated, whether the dollars would be unrestricted for however the city council determines to be the most appropriate use for the funds, or if um, the city council supports the applicant's uh, proposal to limit the um, how the funding is spent to specific causes um, or city projects. Um, and whether the dollars should be donated directly to the city for city use or to a nonprofit organization such as the Boys and Girls Club. 
Next slide. That concludes staff's presentation. The applicant um, will also make a presentation and we look forward to your uh, feedback and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I assume we have speakers on this item? We do. We have seven speakers, and in the order they signed up, they're Graham Clifford, Lynn Norton, Norm Haney, William or Bill Curtis, Sagan Zod, Hamish Patterson, and Andy Lyon. Mayor Pearson, I wanted to check, do you want me to call the speakers in this order, or do you want to hear from Norm Haney first or last? Uh, I think since he's sort of the applicant, we should probably have him go first as, as normal. Okay. Um, then our first speaker will be Norm Haney. Yeah. All right. Um, are, Hi, Norm. I can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, I'd like to ask for a, a little additional time other than three minutes. I've been working on this project for... Uh, four years. I filed it three and a half years ago. Um, and I have a few things, a few comments to make, and they're going to take longer than three minutes. How much time do you, are you asking for now? Um, well, <clears throat> two things. I, I, I'd like to have at least six minutes to start with, and then I'd like to be called on uh, at, at the end of the public testimony. Okay, well, let's, okay, let's start with the six minutes. That's fine. That seems fair. Okay, thank you very much. I certainly do appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, I've been working on this project for a long time. And the reason that I added the three rooms is because I really didn't have any choice. I had trouble finding uh, boutique operators to, uh, uh, to be interested in the hotel. And of course, if I can't find someone to uh, be interested, then everybody loses. Um, you know, I, I had a presentation, uh, with, with renderings and, uh, so on and so forth, but I think you've all seen the re renderings. <clears throat> you've all been up to the building. Uh, you've seen that, uh, for all intents and purposes, around 65% of the project is already developed. Um, and that building is vested and was approved and permitted by the city of Malibu. So we're only really talking about 35% plus or minus uh, of the lower uh, portion of the, uh, of the hotel uh, on the old Shell gas station property. Um, and we are over the floor area ratio of 15%, which is the, the standard. So the issue is what type of additional benefits uh, can the applicant uh, provide to the city to move forward? You know, I, I, I looked at Malibu Municipal Code, section 17.64.040A, uh, which was provided by, by the city. And as I read it, it said, it says council must find that the information presented by the applicant substantiates that in consideration of the rights accruing to the developer under the development agreement, the developer shall provide the city or the community with special benefits, which might not otherwise be provided by the developer in the absence of the agreement. It gives absolutely no uh, indication as to how the additional benefits and how much additional benefits are to be provided. So I looked a little further and staff looked a little further and we found this in the, in the um, general plan, chapter one, land use elements, section 1.5.0, which states, the public benefit or amenity shall warrant the burdens of the development intensity bonus over the zoning ordinance maximum subject to review and approval by the city council. 
Now, I looked into this, and there are some, several words here that, that are not used uh, generally by the city. And warrant actually represents justification. If you read a little further, um, you find that, that burden actually refers to um, the negative impacts that the project is going to have on the city uh, as a result of being larger than the 15% floor area would allow. And then it talks about um, basically the, the, the burden, which is the negative impacts. So let me read it another way. The um, public benefits or amenities shall justify the negative impacts resulting from the increase in the floor area ratio over 15%. So now that we understand basically what they're talking about, they're talking about the negative impacts that the project's going to have to the community. And what are those negative impacts? Well, there aren't any. The people that uh, put this together, um, uh, the, the original founders, um, authors, uh, basically realized that all projects are different. And additional benefits for one project might be appropriate. For another project, they may not be appropriate. This is an incredibly unique project in that, as I said, approximately 65% of the building is already there. Second, the development that's already there, permitted by the city, has doctor's offices, a spa, a gym, a salon, and a bunch of other businesses. That generates more traffic than the hotel, the 39-room hotel, will generate. And it's not just a little bit uh, more traffic. The hotel reduces traffic by a minimum of 21%. If you look at a daily rate, it reduces it by 49%. That's pretty substantial. Um, the visual impact, the addition to the lower area actually meets the side yard setback on the west side. It also meets the height standards for the city. No section uh, provides a three, um, you know, three level uh, uh, section. And we also have a setback of 46 feet, 46.5 feet, which is the greatest front yard setback. Um, and, and so- Norm, your six minutes are up. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, let me just have 15 seconds more. What I'm proposing is a benefit to the community as well as a benefit to the city. And it has full support from Senator Henry Stern. Uh, and it's not just for out of kids that live outside of the city. It can also be uh, signed up for by kids that are within the city. It is a community benefit when we're talking about $400,000 to the Boys and Girls Club uh, for the, um, the therapy uh, surf program. So I'm available to answer any questions um, and I hope there are some. Okay. Thank you, and I'll be listening. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Graham Clifford. Okay. Hello again, Graham. Hello again, Maggie. Um, so I'm here. This is it's probably the first time that any of you will see me or not see me as it stands out now, but will hear me speak in favor of a, a development, given my long-standing anti-development stance. So pay attention. <laughs> now, honestly, this is the, the only time I have ever spoken in favor of, of a development. And, and, and um, you know, the, the, the reasons are obvious, as outlined by Norm. You know, the, it's, 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 not it's not destroying open space. It is just repurposing already developed land in a, in a commercial stretch it will improve the 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 visual impact of that building 
Um, it will provide, as many speakers said in our last two and a half hours, it will provide many hotel rooms in the case of Hello? What? No, you're fine. I'm not sure what that was. Oh. It will provide rooms in, in, um, in the case of an emergency, um, as many speakers uh, mentioned, and, 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 and Reva also said in, uh, there's, in the pro one of the problems with the Apple fire is there weren't enough hotel rooms to house the people that were displaced. So Norm's Hotel will do that. Um, the public benefits, you know, I don't know enough about this to, uh, but the public benefits, this sounds like a bit of a, my, my father would characterize this as a shakedown. Um, I don't know why Norm is being asked to pay for a pipeline that La Paz was supposed to put in and never did from Topanga to, to help Malibu. Um, and they were, and and on top of that, by the way, La Paz, I believe, if I remember correctly, was supposed to put to, was supposed to put in a tank, a water tank, to to in place of the pipeline. I don't see that happening either. So in so now, Norm is being asked to do this, and so I, you know, that's fine. Norm's generous enough to agree to that. Then there's the public benefit to the Boys and Girls Club. I'm not sure if the Boys and Girls Club qualifies as a public benefit. I thought public benefits had to be physical. Um, but I may, again, be wrong. It's late. Um, and another reason that, that I would like to, to, to uh, approve, to have you ask you to approve this project because of the man who's behind it. I mean, he's a man of integrity and honesty, someone, someone I'd be happy to do a handshake deal with. And, and Norm and I don't always agree on matters that come before you, as you've probably seen in the past, but, but um, I cannot think of another developer I can say what I've just said about. And, um, and um, <clears throat> what else would I, um, let's see, it's, it's, it's an elegant looking building, it's refined, it's classy, and it's in the right spot. It's opposite Nobu. I mean, it couldn't be better. Uh, I, I don't know why. Graham, your time is up. This. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks Graham. Our next speaker is Lynn Norton. Hello again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lynn. Hi. Well, I am also, this is the first time I've uh, supported a development project, not because I don't follow most of them, but um, I generally would not, uh, I generally would object to a project with this much FAR in it, but um, these are my reasons for uh, supporting this. Visually, Norm's putting a building in front of another building that's already there. So the only thing his building blocks the view of is another building because there's no nature behind it. There's no, you know, beach behind it. And the people across the street are in restaurants and they're looking the other way. They're looking over at the ocean. So it's not like someone's building this in front of someone's house or something like that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to see anything like that happen, obviously, in the Civic Center where it's all wide open and everything with that FAR. But when I look at this stretch of Malibu, it doesn't look like this building is going to stand out like a sore thumb any more than what's already there stands out. Um, and, and then, I, I mean, the reason why I even got, you know, started paying attention to this project is obviously it's somewhat synergistic with the, you know, with the item that I'm the most focused on, which is the short term rentals. And I, I actually do respect Coastal's goal of keeping the beaches accessible to California. I actually think that's a very, uh, you know, worthy goal. And you know, I'd be upset if I went up to Big Sur, which has been a long time since I've been there, if the city had no hotels in it, you know. So um, I think that th this is where people should be staying. Instead of staying in our neighborhoods, they be should be staying in Norm's Hotel. <laughs> so um, with regards to your negotiations, I, you know, the one thing I would like to see is some sort of uh, guarantee from Norm about the TOT tax that he's claiming that would come to the city, because that's a big reason why this is um you know an asset and um i'm sure he's probably done all the numbers and he's really confident in that but that would be nice to see that that's part of it that we you know something where it doesn't just something that's kind of a guarantee um that you know so that it's not just we're buying a story but we're buying you know we're, we're making a, a nice deal there and um I also I don't think the donation to the Boys and Girls Club I don't think that counts as a as a part of this. Um, 
because I wouldn't really want to see the city right now. If the city was negotiating something for $400,000, I wouldn't want to see you make a $400,000 donation before you spent the money, you know, getting PCH fixed up and stuff like that. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm supporting the project. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Our next speaker is William or Bill Curtis. Hi there, thank you. Uh, I've never spoken to this group about uh, supporting a project before, so I take this very seriously. Uh, for myself and my wife, Lisa, the approval of the Seaview Hotel will result in a few things that as quarter century Malibu residents, we really appreciate. Um, for variances that are comparatively insignificant, we get rid of one of the nasty eyesores in Malibu that I'd love to see go away, that old blue gas station. And with this development, it becomes a significant positive for the street rather than embarrassment. The current office building with spas and salons and businesses produce an amount of daily traffic and influx of people that would be replaced with a smaller fraction of that tonnage. And the additional concessions offered by Mr. Haney seem like an added bonus, obviously. The, I know we have a habit of twisting anyone that asks for a variance because we can, we demand more and more and to the point where if a developer asks what it'll take to get a variance, the answer is usually uh, more. More? Yes, more than whatever you're offering. Uh, we carefully weigh how much blood we can squeeze, which is embarrassing. But with the best intentions, we sometimes forget that we may be profoundly affecting a fellow Malibu citizen, in this case, a good one, rather than some big corporation. So here on top of getting rid of that blue monster gas station, which you can tell I'm not fond of, and reducing the traffic, we get $400,000 to the city, which I think is thought to ear be earmarked for underprivileged, which you gotta like. The replacement, uh, whether it was fair or not, the replacement of a half a million dollar water main valve at Topanga and PCH, uh, which we need for fire preparation, yes. Mike, I agree with you, you said much, much earlier in the night that we're all worried about fire season. So otherwise the city might have to pay for that valve. So arguably it's kind of a million dollar swing if Norm Haney pays for it. So I applaud that. And Mr. Haney's $400,000 Boys and Girls Club donation fills a special place in my heart because my wife and I, Lisa, my wife Lisa and I, along with Laura Stern, Henry's mom, donated the first original funds, raised funds and built the original Boys and Girls Club back in the 1990s. So bravo to the idea that we would donate that kind of money to the Boys and Girls Club. If you gave me an hour, I could fill it with what that club does for young people in Malibu and the money will be well spent. Also, this plan replaces a zero for the city with, with a million dollar occupancy tax or anywhere near it. So we can argue about whether or not that's a perfected number, but anything better than zero is better and close to a million is wonderful. All that, or we can do what we sometimes do. We can say we want even more, and then we risk getting none of these advantages for our town that we love. In case it's not clear, I am completely in support of this project and request that we get this one done. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker on the list is Hazan Azad, that he does not appear to be present in the meeting. So we'll move on to Hamish Patterson. Okay. Hello. Hey there, we hear you. Okay. Um, like everyone else, I'm a hugely anti-development guy who is 100% in support of Norm's Hotel. I think it's a uh, the way development should be done, repurposing old buildings. I think it's well done. I've met with Norm. I've looked at the plans. I've done an on-site walkthrough with him. And um, I'm wholeheartedly behind it. And personally, I, I'll agree with Graham. I think that the shakedowns that the city do on developments are criminal and they've gotten a lot of bad projects stuck in our community. I personally think that, that Norm shouldn't have to give the city anything. I think the project is a, a net benefit for our community. I think the, the water main adjustment down in Topanga is a huge plus that seems to be kind of somewhat forgotten. And um, I wanna vocalize that, but yeah, I, 
I think this practice of exchanging bad development and overreaching development for shakedown money should be stopped. I think that the project should be able to stand on its loan on its own. And I think Norms does. I don't think that he should be required to give any money, but he's being a good community member and a solid community member. And he's willing to do this. And um, I hope that it does go to the Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club is a definite asset to, to my family and other families. And I know pe people without children don't understand what a benefit the Boys and Girls Club is, but it, it truly is. And I definitely do not believe that Norm should be uh, hemmed in on the occupancy tax. I think we're coming into a giant recession, if not depression. And um, I, I would bet, I would wonder if he'll be lucky to keep that thing occupied two years from now when the economy collapses. And I also suggest that you fast track this project in order to get the money moving through this project, or it could be lost to a financial calamity. Again, uh, I think just on, on merit, this project is standalone, one of the more innovative and better, better design projects this community seen. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of shakedown cash go to a lot of crummy projects that dot our coastline. And I sure hope we don't build any more hotels in Big Sur, by the way. And uh, with that said, I hope that we, like, let's do this for Norm. Let's get this hotel built and um, let's stop shaking down developers for bad projects. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Andy Lyon. But we may not have Andy Lyon still in the meeting. There's an Andy there, but I don't know if it's him. I, I think he's it's Andrew who spoke on the uh, short-term rental. Yes, yeah, so it looks like we don't have Andy Lyon anymore. So that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we're back to the council here. Um, where is everybody? They're slowly appearing on screen. Wait, I've lost people. Hang on, there you are. Um, Hey, Skylar, you have your hand up. Why don't you go first? I Thank you, Mikey. Um, I just wanted to be clear on what the benefits were. I didn't see it. Maybe I'm missing it, but I didn't see a ton of mention in here of the water main stuff. So I just wanted to get some clarity from staff on exactly what was discussed. I know that there was the uh, two $400,000 amounts, but what in regards to the water infrastructure improvement is detailed. So the way the staff report is structured is to highlight the uh, public benefits as it's laid out in the code where it address the public benefits um, are specifically things that would not necessarily otherwise flow from the project. So it's separating out the things that the applicant has to accomplish in order to do the project, such as infrastructure upgrades and, um, you know, cleaning up the site, um, paying the TOT tax as a function of the project itself. So these are all positive things that come out of the project, but they're not um, above and beyond what is involved with the project itself. So that that's the distinction. So that stuff's essentially a condition of the project regardless. Right. That's that's the way that I understood. I didn't yeah. understand that it's something above and beyond. Yeah, and our intention is not to you know say that those things are insignificant. It's just in terms of looking at the code and what happens with a a, a development agreement and the vesting project approvals that go along with it, the and the increase in the FAR. Those things are steered towards this public benefit negotiation. Yes. Okay. So we're on the same page. So. Um, I uh, I adamantly do not believe, and I'm the first person to say that I absolutely love the Boys and Girls Club, but I don't think that the city should be directing funds in those different directions based on a project like this. I think that the money should go um, directly to the city, and if the city or the council decides to do something like that, or in the future, then they can decide that because you don't know what's going to happen with that organization or another organization. There's no discredit, no negativity towards the Boys and Girls Club at all. That's just like 
kind of a fundamental uh, thing of how I believe that this should work um, and how I've always interpreted it. Uh, and I think that the amount is significant, um, although I do think that there is room for it to be increased a little bit. Um, so uh, I would propose that we try to increase that to a million dollars and get some sort of money based on commencement of construction and some the remaining funds, um, you know, a few months after construction is completed and the hotel's up and operating. Those are my comments. Uh, can I comment now? Go ahead, Karen. Uh, I, I do want to say um, I, too, have been a supporter of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, both uh, financially and physically, since uh since very early on, um, I'm personally friends with everybody there, um, but I agree with Skylar. I, I don't, I don't see how or why the city would involve a third party uh, in this public benefit consideration. Um, I think also, like Skylar said, the money ought to be going straight to the city. Um, that's that's the council's decision. Uh, how to use uh, a public benefit or how to, how to craft it. I, I just, I, I, I think it's, it's awkward and it's cumbersome to put a third party in the middle of this deal. Um, and I realize what Norm said, um, there is no formula for public benefit. Um, and, and that makes every situation unique. I too appreciate the fact that this project is a conversion, uh, not new construction, at least not most of it. Um, but I've got a question, I guess for Bonnie. I, I'm not sure exactly who my question goes to, but I'll, I'll say it and maybe you guys decide who answers. Can you give us a, uh, examples of other projects and what the public benefits were and maybe take us through some of those, um, how long ago they were, the size of the projects. I mean, I realize there's no apples to apples. Everything is unique, but can you, can you kind of help us understand what's happened at least to date? Sure. Um, in terms of other development agreement projects, um, the one I'm most familiar with is the La Paz project. Um, and that involved a public benefit of the donation of parcel C and a cash contribution to the city. And also I believe dedication of trails. Um, there was a Malibu Bay company, I believe a uh, development agreement project that um, predates me and I don't think it went forward. So I can't really give you any, I hope I'm remembering that right. I, I can't really give you specifics about that, but um, I don't think that we've had any other development agreements go forward. Case Crummer. Uh, well, they wound up giving money to the Coastal Commission. The, yeah, the Crummer project was, it involved um, a local coastal program amendment. And then the, yeah, they made a, a contribution to the city and um, yeah, money to the Coastal Commission, but I don't believe that was in the context of a development agreement. Okay, well, land that's being used for the skate park? Yeah, that was, um, Am I just forgetting this? <laughs> I'm drawing it's complete blank. I apologize. Land was given to the city, and there was cash that was given to the uh, coastal. Right, region. but I but that did not involve. City received cash as well on that. Yeah, there was um, there was no uh, floor area ratio adjustment in that case. That's why I don't believe it was a development agreement. I think it was um, a separate um, arrangement. So that's that's all I, I've got for you right there I, I, at this time. Shed any light on that? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get get information on precedent. Jefferson seems to know it. What do you got, Jefferson? 
Uh, thank you. Where the skeletons are buried is back how long ago I started, uh, back in 2008. So um, on the La Paz project, um, there were some traffic modifications that were supposed to be uh, implemented, just like it was for the uh, Whole Foods with a right turn lane. So the La Paz project did uh, furnish for its development rights, changing the FAR gave us that extra uh, um, acre and a half behind it, lot C, as Bonnie had mentioned. In the case project, the $2 million went uh, directly to DPR to be used at Topanga modifications for the upgrades of uh, Topanga uh, State Beach and the uh, area behind it that the LA uh, Athletic Club used to own. And uh, Norm's uh, proposal would include, I think it's around 500 k for that water valve upgrade uh, at Topanga which uh, allows a higher pressure to be achieved up PCH, which would help us in the fire events. So those are amenities that are furnished by this project that you can qualify with the history in the past of just using the La Paz project or the case project or the, uh, um, the five houses on the point where we got the skate park. And I think that's a, uh, another one of it's a perfect example of how these amenities were furnished. Thank you. Uh, Jefferson, do you have any comments on the current um, arrangement or currently what's offered? Uh, thank you, Mikey. Once again, yes. Um, I've had some emails come forward from various constituents in the city that said the uh, Boys and Girls Club couldn't adequately uh, receive the funds the way it's orchestrated. And I think that's what Karen was commenting on and you were commenting on and Skylar was commenting on. But I think uh, as a city council, we can earmark whatever funds, if this moves forward, we could earmark those funds as we choose as a council, just like we put impounds on money for uh, undergrounding or impound funds for uh, tr treatment plants. So there are ways that we could keep that money aside in the city coffers to be dedicated as the council chooses. I think that's fair to say. Thank you. Um, Rick? You know, it, the difference between this project and something like La Paz is it didn't start out with a blank field and say, how can I maximize my floor area ratio? He basically took an existing building and he did get rid of an eyesore, you know? And um, so that's different. I mean, it's not like, okay, I want to supersize this project. I better be willing to do something for the city to, like you said, compensate for the impact on it. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. I have to, and you know, it's surprising. I agree with Hamish a lot these days and make some good points, I have to say. And I do think that the impact of the increasing the water pressure into Malibu in general, that's good. That's very good. So uh, I have mixed feelings about the whole getting money from him, but I'm comfortable with it if he's comfortable with it. I do think it should just go straight to the city, and the city should just take under advisement the fact that um, there's interest both from, I guess, Henry Stern, according to his letter, and, and Norm Haney himself that it go to the Boys and Girls Club. But this is a weird project. It's a development project with Norm Haney and everybody's on board, even all the environmentalists. So it's pretty cool. I mean, I think we're going to bronze this moment in time. So that's, I mean, I have misgivings about extracting money from it, but I'm comfortable with it if he's comfortable with it. Okay. Um, Norm, I see your hand up. It's, um, you know, I'll, I'll say before calling on you that you've had nobody against it. <laughs> Everybody's supporting you. So you don't really have anything to defend. So uh, I'll tell them to unmute you, but make it quick, all right? It's getting late and we're tired. So uh, if you could just wrap it up for us quickly, that'd be great. Maybe, are you there? Unmute. Oh, there you go. Okay, so I'm on? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for your time and staying up late listening to this. Um, I, I have two points to make. First of all, the project virtually has no negative impacts whatsoever. 
So there's almost, there's nothing to mitigate with additional money. Second, I don't really, I have the, the fire flow and the pressure in the water main that is in front of my building right now. I know I put the 12 inch uh, diameter water main in myself. However, the water department is doing some of the things the city is doing. They would not sign off until I agreed to put in the check valve at, at about $500,000. I had no choice. I agreed to do it, which doesn't benefit me. It benefits everybody in Malibu because not only does it increase the pressure, but it also provides 4 million gallons of water from the top of Topanga, which can be used in an earthquake, uh, which, which uh, reduces the flow into the 30-inch water main that feeds all of Malibu, or it can be uh, used in the event of, of a fire. Now, oh, that's a, a great deal of money. Finally, I made commitments on the $400,000 to the Boys and Girls Club. I made commitments to a number of people, and I'm not going to change that. So the $400,000 in cash, in addition to all the other benefits, and there are 14 of them that go to the city, that, that's what's on the table I am interested in moving this project along quickly, and I want to thank you for the additional time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're back here. Um, where do we want to go on this now? We have, we seem like consensus on the offer, but all to the city. Norm has said something a little different here. Um, Jefferson? Uh, how about something like this? I know Norm has mentioned that the time he has into it, and we all know about his frustration and his having to choose tenants. He made a, a, a point in the meeting, I believe two meetings ago. Um, what if we, uh, if we ask the uh, applicant to uh, kick in another 150 K or something additionally. I know Hamish is right. And, and Rick, you sentiment this too, but we're asking maybe as a council, if he wants to put this on a fast track to make sure that um, it's, if we take an extra 150 to help it through, to help push it through, I, you know, it's like a number of speakers have said, we're holding these guys to the screws. Um, but uh, September 7th, maybe he can, you know, we say it'll go to the planning commission on September 7th and be heard there. And so it's no longer on a slow track. It's on a fast track and will, Norm's willing to kick in some extra money so that by October 12th, we can hear it again. So what I'm saying is let's ask Norm, let's bleed him some more and put him on a fast track to uh, application and acceptance. Trevor, it, uh, it, Trevor seems to have a comment on that, Trevor. Sure. The details of the development agreement are going to come through the planning commission of the council. I think what staff was looking for his general direction about what kind of benefits you're interested in. Um, and it seems like there was direction that, that the interest was in more cash to the council and not towards um, the, the Boys and Girls Club as good as, as as much as everyone appreciates what they do and would like to see that. Uh, and the other question was, you know, other things in kind are money or use of the property, if that was something that interested the council. This is already on track to go to the planning commission um, as soon as staff can can get it there. So, um, you know, we don't, that whole process will go through. This is to provide some general direction, I think, to, um, to Norm and uh, as to, you know, um, how to structure and, and what kind of benefits the council's interested in more generally. Tyler? Um, I think that the, the, while I commend him on the stuff with the Boys and Girls Club and that, and I could never not commend him on that, I think that for the city, or at least for me to support this, um, I would need to see the city getting a total contribution of a million dollars, $250,000 when his property starts construction and the remaining balance of that um, within three months of operating after the project is open. I'll support that. I'll second that. Okay, so that was a motion with a second. Is that what I just heard? Or was that just talk? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. If, I don't know. Um, 
if Trevor's going to chime in here, because I, that's the direction that I want to be given. That's how I would like to see staff more move forward with this or just stop the conversation. Yeah, we don't we don't need a, a motion. Uh, I mean, you need to weigh everything when the when the project comes forward and everything there. But um, general direction about what you understand of the project so far and the scope and the type of benefit you're looking for. It seems like we have some, we have some consensus there. If there's anything else that the rest of the council wants to weigh in, I think that would be helpful to staff and to Norm as they move it forward. Otherwise, we can you know uh, receive and file this and move on. And I, I like the less money up front and most when he's done and it's in operation and all of that. Uh, I, I think Skylar uh, is on to a good idea. Um, and I will reiterate, I, I don't think it's the right thing to do uh, to involve a third party, any third party. And, and that has nothing to do with my longstanding support of the Boys and Girls Club uh, and, and what I plan to continue there. Um, but I don't believe it's correct for us to involve any third party in this. Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, last comment. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree uh, with what Karen and uh, Skylar said about the contributions. You know, involving a third party may be difficult. It may have legal ramifications that we're not aware of right now. So going straight to the city, will your market later? We can do that as a council. I think what Norm is after and what I'm trying to get through to the rest of the council is to get this thing in, in September in front of the planning commission. So in October, Norm has an avenue so he can go to his investors and say, look, I've met a timeline and now I need extra cash. It's a lot easier for him to sell that to an investor than just this uh, off into the wilderness uh, kind of thing where he doesn't know what timing is involved. So I would say I would roll with that. The extra money that Skylar had mentioned in the form that Karen had mentioned, but remembering that it's got to be in front of the planning commission on September 7th. So we can hear it on October 12th. I think that's fair. The man's coming up with a ton of money. Thank you, Mikey. Okay. Well said. Um, I think I, well, first of all, I agree with all the speakers. Um, I've known about this project for years. I think it's a perfect fit and I never thought ever I'd want to vote. I'd ever vote for a hotel in Malibu. So I agree with that sentiment that's been said by everyone else. I agree with Skylar and Karen and Jefferson and, and Rick. So uh, I think we've given direction here. Um, I think I think we're pretty good unless someone has a last comment, but I think uh, they've all done a good job. And um, are we good? Yeah, I was just going to um, add one clarification about, I did take a quick look at the city council resolution index to just to ease my own mind about not remembering any other development agreements. Um, there was a, the Malibu Bay Company development agreement process that happened um, back in the early 2000s, but ultimately did not move forward. I think there was a ballot measure thing associated with that. And then the other one that came up was um, involving the Weintraub company um, that originally owned the property that is now Nobu. And again, that one did not move forward either. Um, I did not see that Crummer, the Crummer project involved a, de a development agreement. I think those, uh, those contributions and everything were made in, with some other mechanism. So I just wanted to fill you in that we, there's not a lot of other history that we haven't discussed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that context. Okay, so yes, Kevin. And I just, I wanted to, I didn't say this, but I wanted to be clear that I agree with Jefferson and I think everybody's in support of getting the project done in a timely fashion. So. Absolutely. I think, uh, yes, time is of the essence. I agree. All right, so we're good. I don't think, I think we've given enough direction. We don't need a motion, we don't need a second. Okay, then we're gonna move forward. Thank you very much, everyone. We're on to item 6A, Malibu Aquatics Foundation Fee Waiver. Oh, there's Jesse. How you doing, Jesse? <laughs> I'm good. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pearson, members of City Council. Uh, the item before you this evening is the fee waiver request from the Malibu Aquatics Foundation in the amount of $4,683. The foundation provides various swim programs at the pool through the community service department contract instructor program. And so some of those programs you're probably familiar with, the Sea Wolves competitive swim program, uh, swim conditioning, 
junior lifeguard prep and master swim are, are some of their bigger ones. Uh, their agreement with us is on a 70-30 split, which essentially means that all of the total registrations that we get in, 70% uh, goes to them, and then the city keeps 30% of that. And that's to help us cover things like part-time staffing costs, advertising, operating costs, um, things such as that. So uh, since the Woolsey fire, the Aquatic Foundation's registration numbers have uh, remained lower than they had been in previous years. And so we, we worked with them following the fire to um, help reduce some of their costs without reducing our 30% of the fee. And the reason for that is that the cost of the programs to the city is significantly higher than the 30% that we actually get back uh, from that agreement. So um, unfortunately, their numbers have still been, we're slow to, slow to recover after the fire. And then with the current pandemic that we're facing, um, it, it caused pool closures from mid-March to mid-July and their registration numbers. Um, unfortunately have, have struggled to recover and particularly their ability to pay their coaches who um, were kept on during the, the pandemic closure. So uh, the request before you is for that fee waiver of $4,683. And that would cover 30% of the cost that they paid to their coaches uh, during the most recent closure. So happy to answer any other questions. Um, I know that Sue and Jules are, are present in the meeting here from the Aquatics Foundation as well as Recreation Supervisor Kate Gallo, who works works directly with them. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, do we have public speakers signed up here? We do. We have two public speakers, if they're still in the meeting. The first would be Sue Murphy. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I do not see that Sue is present in the meeting. It's only midnight. Why would not <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker would be Bill Sampson. Okay, is Bill here? It's next up. Bill does not appear to be in the meeting either, um, so that would conclude public comment for this item. Okay, um, <clears throat> back to council then. So, uh, Skyler? I was going to ask um, Jesse, for the amount of money that, like, does it cost us a ton more than the amount that they pay us to, to like their portion of, you know, whatever those fees are, go to our cost to cover the pool usage during that time, et cetera, and the staffing cost? So, and I'll give you the last couple of years, which admittedly have been affected by the Woolsey fire and, of course, this year with the pandemic. Um so we took in roughly in this fiscal year, I'm sorry, the 1920 fiscal year, just over $65,000 in revenue uh, from these programs. They kept 45,000 of that and we kept just under 20,000. And to give an example of what it cost us last year, it cost us 53,000 to run. So um, to put it in layman's terms, it's about double what we take in. So. Um, we took in 20000 last year. It cost us 53 on top of that 20000 So I shouldn't say double. I should say it's like one-third of the total amount that we bring in um, might cover those costs. The rest, actually, we have to cover on our own. And it's 20, higher in other years. Cost us about 53, 55000 That's what it cost us last year after we got the 19000 It cost us an additional 53000 I mean, to to run the program. Okay, so I sort of see this as sort of like a casualty of COVID, but also the fire. I don't know how everybody else looks at something like this, but, um, you know, and I don't know if it's like, oh, this is something that, you know, like fees from our settlement with the SCE should come in to help go towards things like this, because part of the reason as to why their enrollment dropped off so much is related to that. And maybe it's, uh, maybe we want to say, you know, we'll cut it in half or something. I don't know, whatever the council wants to do. But I mean, I'm just, I sort of see a little bit of a correlation between those two. That's it. Uh, I got a comment or a question. So you said they kept their coaches on basically during COVID when there was nothing going on. Am I reading that right? Yes, that's, that's correct.
Okay. Um, Karen, look like you almost ready for a comment. Um, I'll say a couple of things. I appreciate as much as anybody, water safety, pool safety, ocean safety. Um, you know, my son played water polo for seven years. I mean, Skylar, I know you played. Um, the sad fact is we're in a extreme austerity mode and you know, I'm sorry to see anybody's programs um, get cut. And I think we're all starting to really feel the effects of this pandemic. Um, everybody I talk to is out of sorts. It's, it's very hard right now. But we have to deal with the real world and the hand we've been dealt as a council. And our... Uh, Revenue is down and projected to go down more. Our costs are up. Um, next year, we start paying on the debt service for the three parcels that were purchased in 2018. Uh, and it's, this is where it's not fun. But I don't know how the city well, I will say this, the city can continue to subsidize if we all want to put our heads together and decide what we're cutting to make this possible. So I, I'll leave it at that. Okay, uh, Skylar? This is maybe a question for Reva, but did we leave any money in our general fund grant program for this year? Um, in our budget? Um, yeah, I think there's a few thousand dollars left in there. Um, I think just hearing what Karen said and, and back to what Jesse said, last year we subsidized this to the tune of $53,000. So partly it's waiving the fees, but we're already subsidizing these types of programs. So, um, you know, if you want to do it a general fund grant, we can certainly do that. I'm not sure if they're a 501c3 or not. Um, and we can only grant funds to a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. Okay, I thought I thought that they had applied for a general fund grant. Yeah, well. they do apply. They have applied. I'm not sure if they 501c3, but they're they. If they applied and they were went through the process, then they are. Sorry, it's late. I don't I don't have all that on top of my head at this point anymore. Well, all I was going to say is maybe we could, you know, appropriate a thousand dollars from that towards this, and then. On the reason why I'm saying that, Karen, is because we've already budgeted for that. But that would be available in the current budget, yes. Okay, I, I, uh, I kind of find myself where Karen is. This is tough, but it's going to get tougher, it looks like. So, yeah, I, I'm thinking to look at my e email inbox is looking for money, you know, all over. Not that one thing will lead to everything else, but it sort of does. <laughs> so... If there's money still available in the general fund grant, a thousand, well, I don't, I don't know what's in there. It's late too. I'm tired, but, uh, that makes sense. We're coming out of general, the general fund right now. I don't, I'm just, maybe it's late and I'm tired, but it's, uh, it's kind of seems like we're might not be the direction we want to go, though. This program is important. I love this program. I think it's great. I mean, my son too, you know. Yeah, big time made a difference. So I, the value of the program is there. The financial end, I'm not sure I have all the answers. I think that's a good solution, Skylar, because they, they have been applicants, as I recall. And uh, we did leave a little money left over there. I think you were the one who wisely chose to do that. So that's a good idea. I can support that. We, we could make them, I can make a motion to appropriate um, and I don't know if it has to come back on a separate item or how properly to do that, but to allocate a thousand dollars from those set aside funds towards this. I think we can do that with that direction. It doesn't need to come back again. We can uh, direct a thousand dollars from the general fund grant program uh, to the Malibu Seawolves, and that would be the action. Reallocating the budget. Okay. Um, is that your motion? Yes, that's it. Okay. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Any more discussion? 
Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tempe? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we've made it to the sevens, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so 7A, um, designation of voting delegate and alternative voting delegate, plural potentially, for the 2020 League of California Cities Annual Conference. So this is just a standard item that we bring to the council every year um, in advance of the annual League of Cities Conference. This year, the conference will be uh, held virtually. Um, so any council member attending will need to um, attend the resolutions committee uh, virtually. Um, so that's, that's what's before you tonight. Okay. Um, there we, oh, do we have any public speakers? Not on this item. Okay, all right, just double checking. Oh, Mike, they're all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> all asleep. Yeah, they're all here. They're all sound asleep. Um, personally, I'm. I. Uh, I mean, I want you to just chime in. I. I'd be fine as an alternative. I might have another conference I have to be at then. I could dodge out if I ended up being the delegate. Um, cause my, the other one's virtual too. So, um, but I, someone else would probably be primary as I might, if it happens to be in that other conference. That's where I'm at. Anyone else? Who, who else wants to volunteer? We need, we're looking for volunteers here. Hey, you're the mayor. You got to go to all these things. You're always the primary. I actually will be there for, actually, I don't know what day that happens. There is one full day I know I can be there. I just don't know what day this Thank happens. You. Well, I'd like to make a motion to make you the, primary and then have the mayor pro tem if he's available be the alternate does that make sense it does make actually perfect sense and i'm tired enough that i needed your help there thank you that's fine unless there's anybody else jefferson or karen that wants to be the primary i i think mikey's uh, gonna be up for it and he's gonna be around for another couple of years with karen it should be up to you folks karen do you want to be the uh secondary to him on this I'm happy to do it. Okay. So I would make a motion that Mikey's the primary and Karen's the secondary. I can second that. I can live with that. Okay. Um, I guess we need a roll call vote on that. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. That was a motion from uh, Mayor Pro Tem Peak and seconded by Councilmember Mullen. Uh, so, Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, 7B, this is my item on uh, wondering if we should bring forward a face covering ordinance. I don't know if Jim made it this far, but um, a little background on this um, is I had a lot of requests for this, certainly. And um, looking around at other cities and being on calls with other cities, seeing um, Santa Monica's doing it to try and encourage enforcement. Um, well, we know there's a lot of other cities doing it. There's, there's no lack of them. Um, I had thought, in all honesty, that the sheriff might not be really in favor of this. So I got a hold of him, and to my actual surprise, both uh, Chuck Becerra and Jim Braden were in favor of it. Um, they both said, yeah, we think you should do it. Um, so with the acknowledgement that the idea isn't really to write up a lot of, of uh, citations on this, but it's to encourage enforcement because as it's clear to anyone who's been out, especially on weekends, it can be sorely lacking. I don't see Jim here anymore. I don't blame him, but uh, his thought was, you know, gonna be probably a little hard to enforce on Zoom on a weekend, and that makes sense, but he actually was in favor of it as well. Mayor Pearson, we do have two speakers uh, oh, on this item. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Let us get to the speakers. Thank you very much. Our first speaker is Bruce Silverstein, and I do believe he's still in the meeting. Yeah, I think I saw him. Great. Okay, thank you. Good morning. <laughs> so, so um, this is a proposal, as is the next one, for a, quote, for a, quote, urgency ordinance, close quote. I'd never heard of that before, so I looked it up because I thought maybe even it was it meant to be emergency and it was spelled wrong. But as I understand it, an urgency ordinance is one which, contrary to the ordinary process, can be um, proposed and adopted immediately at any meeting, either regularly scheduled or specially scheduled. So literally, you could, you could draft this up tomorrow morning, propose it tomorrow night, and pass it. Or maybe you'd need 24 hours for notice. I'm not sure, but it could be done very promptly, and it bypasses the ordinary public process. Um, I agree that a mask ordinance is important, um, as is finding a way to help local businesses advertise, which is the subject of the next uh, proposal. Um, process, however, is important. Ordinary process is to propose an ordinance at a meeting, obtain public comment, schedule another meeting, and obtain public comment again before it's, um, debate, it's ultimately passed, amended, or rejected. And there's sound reasons for that, um, and should be varied only in the case of a true emergency. I mean, we are facing an emergency, but we've been facing this emergency since March. Uh, here we are now in August. And this is particularly important, I think, to follow proper process. Personally, I wear a mask whenever I leave my house, which I do very, free, uh, which I don't do very often. I prefer for others to wear them as well, but I t and I tend to favor a mask ordinance. But I know there's a very vocal contingency that feels otherwise. And I believe they need to be given an opportunity to be heard and permitted to press their arguments before a law is adopted. So I'm very torn on this. Um, I will say, and you know, earlier this evening, there was some discussion of the letter that the mayor sent to the Congress. Um, and what I heard said was, yeah, I did it. Basically it violates city policy number 27, which requires a four fifths vote of the city council before anyone can take a formal position on behalf of the city with respect to law or other matters of interest to the city. Um, I, yeah, I did it, I'd do it again because it was important and it needed to be done right away. Um, actually, the policy number 27 doesn't even provide that exception as does urgency ordinances. I'm troubled by this kind of lack of care for process. I think process is important. There are times when pursuant to proper process, you do things more expediently, but you don't throw process out the window. So um, those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, who's the next speaker? Our final speaker on this item is Hamish Patterson. Okay, great. Hamish, are you there? I'm here. Process is important. I'm gonna echo the previous caller, but I'm also gonna say if this was so important, I have been hemming and hawing at the city council since you're the second meeting you had about your lack of leadership, about how you guys are not doing anything except lockstepping, just following blindly. If you really believe that this mask thing was so important, you could have had a special meeting. You could have done it a month ago. You guys took, what, five weeks off. And now all of a sudden it's fashionable. This is the, the what I'm talking about. The little bit too late leadership quality I, I it alarms me it alarms me that we live now at a time where we have enough information where we know exactly who is vulnerable we know exactly who the demographic who is at risk and yet we're still walking around all like the sky is falling and and I don't get it I don't get it at all except it, it's just fall in line, do something, attach your name to something, Mikey. Now, if you really believe that this was an emergency, you, we've had four months to do it. We've had four months, but maybe this is why we haven't done it. Because well, there's no reason to be walking around with a mask. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better. And it might even block a, a droplet but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think that it is. And often there are unintended consequences. So there's your Dr. Fauci. 
Is he a liar? Is he telling the truth? That guy's in charge of the health. But we just blindly follow this guy. We blindly follow Barbara Ferrer. And you're blindly following who on this mask thing? Is it just to get us to comply? And by the way, who's going to enforce this? The sheriff that just had their budget cut? The sheriff that can't get the cars moved from the illegally parked? The sheriff that's dealing with all the homeless people? You have a city where you just spent two and a half hours talking about your inability to enforce common sense housing practices. We live in a city that can't even enforce parking laws because you know why? You know why they're all parking illegally? The citizenry of this country, this community, and this city is losing face with the government because none of you guys will stand up. You guys should be talking about how to get your community healthy about how to get our immune systems healthy if you truly believe we're at risk. You should be mandating the city release information about how to get your body healthy, not put some face diaper over your face. The other ordinance I fully support. Thank you. Uh, were there any other public speakers? That concludes public comments on this item. Okay, there you go. Um, Comments? Rick? Um, I have to say I'm kind of not really in favor of this. I think, you know, Hamish makes some good points. It's, I think everyone's pretty well educated. I think everyone's pretty well educated on what the risks are, who's at risk, and the methods of transmission, et cetera. And they should be because the whole world's been focused on this for the last five months. Also, it's as, as time goes on, there's a lot. I mean, you know, Hamish said we know exactly what what's going on. We don't really know exactly what's going on, I don't think, in many ways. But we do know the whole um, government health authority policies and recommendations whether you agree with them or not on the use of masks etc and you know there's a lot of places that require them. most of the stores require them most government facilities when i'm at work as a government guy i gotta wear it um so everyone's well educated on that so i think that it's unnecessary to actually make it a rule that we go out and enforce, et cetera. I know that there are a lot of people who are very concerned about it. And I think if people are in the vulnerable categories that they probably should be exercising much more caution and risk management than people at the other end of the spectrum that are not in risk, risky categories. Um, you know, they still have the thing where you can go shopping if you're over 60 in the morning, which is pretty cool. I think it's really good because those guys are the risk uh, people. But there is a wide range of um, skepticism about the information we get. And I think it was illustrated by, by the little thing that he played, you know, the, the big bag ones. At one time they're saying, don't bother with masks. Now it's like all important. And, you know, there's just, there's a lot of lack of credibility of the information that comes down from above. But having said that, we do know, and I think everyone does understand the uh, recommended courses of action for personal countermeasures and personal defensive measures in the era of COVID. I, I think it's a little bit of an overreach to also have a city of Malibu mask ordinance. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Go ahead, Skylar. Well, I mean, we live in California and under, you know, as of what, the middle of June, it's required to wear a face mask when you're in public, like just to start with. So I think that, I mean, I'm not really, I'm not entirely in favor of the fine portion of this, but I also understand when you don't have any teeth in something is people aren't inclined to do it. And I mean, I guess the weird thing about, you know, like the off the LAFC is like, they're probably most 
the largest amount of engagement they have with the public in the summer is probably the officers that are on the beach team. And yet that's the zone where it's probably the hardest thing to enforce it. How are you good, you know, and well, I'm not what, uh, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not entirely against it. I very much understand the reason for it. I just, we don't have like, other than maybe the Cross Creek area and a couple of the shopping centers, it's not like there's another area aside from the beach, maybe some of the hiking trails, I guess, you know, I, know. I, I felt like I've seen very good compliance lately. So I'm very happy with our citizenry about that. I don't know how others feel about that, but I, I feel like each time I've been out and about, I haven't seen a person that, you know, doesn't have a mask on. Maybe I'm not paying attention to all of it. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, everywhere I go, people have got masks on. You know, you're kind of out of place if you don't. So the compliance, the compliance level, I think already, from my experience, is pretty high. Anyway, that's you saw your hand up. No, Jefferson. Yeah, Jefferson. Um, I when I read the proposal, I had a neutral position. It was like, well, um, you could go for it or not, or you know how. But you, how are we going to police it with 13 million visitors a year? And we're six months into this now, and probably into it for another three or four months. So there's a time limit on the usefulness of the proposal, but uh, I'm in the risk category. And I, I like to hear that everybody has a mask on when they're in proximity with myself. I have my mask on. Our HOA here in the uh, condos, or what's commonly called stinkies, uh, below Pepperdine, um, everybody's required to wear a mask as per HOA orders. And... Uh, I guess whether you're crossing the parking lot in Ralph's market, going to the market, um, do you have to have one on? Yes, we should. Uh, all the health experts tell us that it reduces. So uh, I look to the rest of the council for leadership on this. I'm just neutral. I, I, one way or another, if it gets passed, I'm happy for us. Um, but I don't know how we're going to put teeth into it. But sure, I'd like to see something on the books that says wear a mask. It's an additional um thing that we can you know add to our positive uh influence around the world is yeah they did it in malibu i saw the other cities that have done it i just think it's gonna be difficult to police karen yeah of course um i'm really trying to think i don't know if i've gotten one email from someone saying we should not be wearing masks but I've gotten a lot of emails from people who are angry, concerned, scared, outraged that they're seeing people come into Malibu not wearing masks, um, whether they're at the beach, hiking, I don't know where else. Um, so that, that's what I'm hearing from people about. Um, and particularly people who are at risk, um, whether it's because of their age or other physical con conditions. So I, too, am not quite sure how this would be enforced. But I will say again, I, I haven't heard from anybody, at least in, in the many emails that I've gotten regarding face coverings, Somebody's saying, hey, what's wrong with all those people wearing face coverings? I'm getting the exact opposite. Why are people showing up here to go to the beach or to go hiking and pretending like there's nothing going on in the world? So that I think for me to respond to our constituents would mean supporting this. Thank you. And um more to respond to Hamish. Hamish, the reason I brought this forward was for discussion. Citizens of Malibu asked for it, and that's our job. That's what I'm doing. Um, so you may not, I'm not sure how you perceive that. Researched it, talked to the sheriff, talked to other cities, talked to Barbara Fair, which I don't think you have a high opinion of. So that's what we do. We bring items forward to discuss and figure out what to do. Is it? I totally agree with you, Hamish. It's way too late dramatically too late. Uh, it's taking a long time for society and us to figure this out. Look what happened in, in Memorial Day. 
Mel was overrun with people without masks. And look what's happened to this virus. It's spread. Whatever you think of it, it's everywhere. Five million people in America confirmed to have had the virus. I mean, that's no small number. So that's why we're here. We're here to make those decisions. That's what we do. Um, personally, I, I agree with everybody who just spoke. It's, I don't leave my house without, actually, I forgot one time, turned around and drove home. Uh, I don't leave without it. Keep multiple masks in the car. Um, I have been around uh, previously, a couple months around, a lot of people with a really good mask and did not get any sort of infection. So I believe in that that works, um, but that's my belief. Um, I had enough emails like Karen said that it feel, felt like this should be brought forward. Enforcement will be difficult. There's no doubt. The sheriffs literally said, it'd be great if you gave us a tool. So that's another reason I brought it forward. I wasn't going to if they said, no, 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 don't, don't do that, which is actually what I thought they were going to say. So, um, but I did research, talked to them, and that's, that's, that's why I brought it forward. But mostly on behalf of a lot of people that contact me for us to discuss. And uh, Skylar? I was just going to say maybe if, you know, if this does get passed that um, maybe we want to update our messaging signs on the road. I think that the, uh, if anything, it can be used as a deterrent for people to, to wear the mask. I think that's basically what it would do. That's oh, you know, what I think it would do. You, you know, Skylar, you made a comment earlier that isn't it a state rule already? I mean, isn't the governor said you're supposed to wear a mask? It, it, it is a state rule already. I just think that it can't okay. remind people, <laughs> I guess is yeah. what. So put, a, put the sign out there. You don't have to make it a law. You can put like, hey. And we did, right? It'll be, like, it'll be education. I mean, I mean the, the, the goal here is public safety, right? It's not extract fines from visitors. So let's uh, just do handy reminders. Like, don't litter, you know? I don't think that we're going to say, oh, you know, we're going to wake up two months from now and say, God, we were such idiots, you know, that we had the thing on that said we, you know, we we're going to give a fine for somebody wearing a mask. I don't think that that's going to happen. But I think that what would happen is if we don't do it and then another month from now where the numbers are going in a bad direction, we're going to, you know. And another resident dies from it. And that's not going to feel good. So, you know, I, I agree. It's a difficult decision. We're not scientists, you know, um, none of us. No one here is a scientist on this. What's that? I said, I just wanted Rick to know I very much hear what he's saying. and I. It's already a rule. It's already a rule. So, you know, it's already, the governor took care of it for us, so we don't have to. So we can call it a night. I think it's a, I think it's a little much. I mean, we've already, you know, I don't know, man. I think it's a little excited. Let's Let's have Jefferson had a comment, then we'll have a motion, and we'll decide yes or no. Uh, I was just going to remind everybody that the uh, the message signs uh, on PCH do say require a mask. And uh, I find that valuable. It reminds people that we should be wearing our masks. Uh, I, and that's how I feel about it. I think we just need to keep these masks on, um, especially in public places. And uh, Yeah, you know, I, I'm the biggest COVID skeptic out there, really. I wear it everywhere I'm supposed to. Everywhere I'm supposed to. I wear it in the stores. I wear it where I'm, you know. I comply. So I'm sort of like the, the reluctant compliant person and I comply. And what I see when I go out is everyone's pretty much doing it. I don't see, I mean, at the beach on the weekends with those billions of visitors, it's a different story. So it's kind of, you know, that's a risky proposition. Probably a good idea to stay away from the beach on the weekend. Can I get any sort of motion here? Yes or no? From somebody. I'll make the motion. Okay. What's your motion? Uh, to uh, for seven B to uh, on face covering ordinance brought by Mayor Pearson uh, to file it and put it into action. Uh, I'll make the motion as it reads. Is that to bring back a uh, a draft urgency ordinance similar to the Hermosa Beach ordinance for the council to consider? Well, I was just trying to support Mikey and his requests here uh, and show a positive motion forward. Uh, whatever. Well, do you, I mean, do you agree with it? Is yes. Is it something you'd like to see? I'd like to see it, yes. Okay. okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? 
Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? No. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. I knew that was coming from you. <laughs> Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Let's move forward. Item 7C, and I will hand it over to Council Member Fair. Hey, drum roll, final item. Um, you know, everybody's getting hammered uh, with their businesses. We all see what's going on with our local businesses. And anything we can do to help, uh, I feel like we have an obligation to. And, you know, this is kind of... Um, it, it, it might not seem like that big of an item, uh, temporarily waiving the sign ordinance to allow people to, you know, put, put up something that they otherwise wouldn't be able to or would be told right away to take down. But any little bit we can do to help our businesses, we need to do. Um, and, and I, you know, I meant to say this at the previous item, and I'll say it now. Um, we were asked about uh, these things being labeled urgency ordinances and the, the noticing was questioned. Um, we, we went through that at the beginning of the meeting as we do every meeting and this, this agenda came out, I'd, I'd have to look now, but two weeks ago, 10 days ago, it, it came out I don't know. Does anybody want to look up the exact date? I mean, it came out, it was published on July 30th. Okay. So that's 13 days ago. Okay. 13 days ago. Um, well, so now that it's the 11th, um, but in any event, more than adequately noticed. And, and the result of that is adequate opportunity for public comment. So I don't know how a meeting could have 10 days notice or more, and, and there would be an implication that there wasn't opportunity for public comment. So I just got to get that out of the way. That, that doesn't sit well with me that we're trying to rush something through or hide something or whatever. Um, so anyway, I would just like to see us uh, as long as the, um, uh, county orders are in effect um, and the state orders. I'd, I'd like to see us do something, even if it's small like this, to help our local businesses and, and have them be able to put signs up to let people know that they are open. That's it. I support that. We do I agree with you. We've got to help all the uh, businesses in whatever way we can and kind of give them a little leeway. You know, hey, hey, let's uh, let's get to public public comment here first. We yes, could. we have three public speakers. They are Bruce Silverstein, Graham Clifford, and Andy Lyon. Bruce Silverstein would be our first public speaker. Okay, Bruce, are you there? Okay, I'm still here. Hey. Good morning. Good morning once again, everyone. Thank you for for the for all the hard work you're putting in for this. I really do appreciate. It's really appreciated. I'm sure by everybody. Um, look again. The, the, the comments that council person Farr just made, uh, yes, there's been a notice for both of these things for 10 days to do something, not a notice on what to do, just a notice to do something. You can't comment on we want to talk about doing something. There's no statute that's been proposed. It could have been. That's exactly my point before. If it's urgent, where's the urgent provision? Why didn't you draft it? five days ago, seven days ago, a month ago, whenever, and put it on the agenda so we could see it and comment on it specifically. So again, I think this is a laudable measure, just like I did the other one. In fact, I hope that we do get a good mask ordinance. I just don't think we should get it the day it's gonna be passed and have the opportunity to comment on it only that day. I think that um, um, Hamish, Hamish will be very upset with that. But same with this, section 17.52.040 prohibits 30 different kinds of signs. They're not all business signs. Um, they may even cover political signs. And all this is a desire to have an urgency ordinance that waives that provision. That's way too broad. There should be 
a draft of a proposed ordinance, put it forward, let the public see it, let the public comment on it, and then have another meeting. You can have the other meeting five days later, and you can propose it and vote on it. But this is not proper process. This is, this is kangaroo process. And if you had thought this was an urgent thing when the urgency first arose, it might have made sense actually then. But things have been going along, and this is just, this, I think this is just political at this point, actually. But in any event, I'd like, I think that the public deserves to see what it is that's being proposed, not just hear that something should be proposed at the last minute and then see it. I'd like to understand exactly what it applies to. Um, businesses clearly should be able to advertise that they're open to the extent they're allowed to be open, and there should be a way to get that message out to the public. Our businesses are hurting. They need that help. But the statute that's in question is far more broad than that. And by the way, it's also part of the zoning code. Does that need to go to coastal? I don't think the, the short-term rental one needs to go coastal, but this is right in the zoning code. If you're going to waive this, I think that has to go to coastal, unfortunately. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Trevor? Yeah, can I just jump in? I just want to clarify that there is not an urgency ordinance being approved tonight or being considered tonight. The question is whether to add it to a future agenda. So I just want to clear that up that there's no ordinance going through tonight for either of these items. Trevor, do you want to also explain the difference on the urgency ordinance with the noticing requirements and the fact that we're under an emergency declaration right now? Um, sure. It, it, if, you know, for, for certain life health safety issues, there's no requirement that um, a number of regular requirements under the code are not going to be applicable that, because you would have to come through, and that would include uh, moving things through that would otherwise have to go through the planning commission, can be directed directly from the council. We also have the ability to pair these ordinances with a with a regular ordinance saying the same thing, which would then come back for a second reading um, to survive challenge. Um, but when there is a, a justification for that, um, that's related to the emergency itself, then the justification does come through for push through with these urgency measures. Okay, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, who's our next speaker? Our next speaker is Graham Clipper. Great, Graham. Hey, Mikey, I'm not asleep yet. <clears throat> I'm, here. I'm, I'm still with you. And this is another first. This is the sixth item I've spoken on in one meeting, which is a record for me. But anyway, so Karen, the only thing that bothers me about this, well, there's a couple of things that bothered me. Um, uh, first of all, I agree with what Bruce said. This has just sort of been jumped on us, but now I hear that we there's nothing's going to be decided tonight anyway, so that's fine. But what I'm worried about is the fact that particularly in Eastern Malibu and PCH, if everybody sticks a board out the front of their business, the, ent the southern entrance to our city is going to look like a four-letter word. And, um, and everybody will shove signs out and then and it will look dreadful. And n nobody will read them anyway because the proliferation of them will probably be so pronounced that you'll you'd have to pull over to read them but maybe you can if you if you're if you find a need for this and i don't um um, um maybe you could limit which businesses are the hardest hit and therefore reduce the potential number that way somehow um and then the third issue is of course how temporary is this and how how Who's going to run around and take them all down? You know, once you, we, we've, you and I have both lived in this town long enough to know once a sign goes up, it's up. And um, unless it's balanced on a car on the side of the road, it's not going to be taken down. So, um, so I think you're opening up a big can of worms. And, uh, and I think there are more problems down the road that may come from this. I'm not saying they necessarily will, but um uh, blight visual blight being one of them not being able to enforce we can't enforce anything so enforcing taking a sign down would be yet another thing and um and um i don't know it's just i uh, that that's it anyway anyway th uh, thank you karen thank you Graham. did we have one more speaker our final speaker would be Andy Lyon, but he's no longer present in the meeting. So that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to council. Okay, I'd like to just address um, one thing or a couple things that Graham just said. Um, the purpose of this in my mind is to, to make this allowance while 
uh, while we're under state orders, uh, when when state orders are lifted, this this goes away. Just just like the uh, the outdoor seating uh, changes that have been made to to help our local restaurants. So, uh, Graham, if you're listening, um, the whole purpose of this is to deal with the pandemic and the effect on the local businesses. This, this comes to an end when those things do. Okay. Um, comments, Jefferson, a small business owner. Thank you, Mikey, appreciate that. Uh, Karen, I understand the passion here as well. Having a small business, I could use additional signing, but uh, I would walk against the retail businesses and say, we're, we're pretty well established. I think we could tie this in, the need for this, uh, to the restaurants, as was mentioned. For instance, we know that the seating arrangements that we permitted uh, two meetings ago or a meeting ago is working out pretty well so far. Uh, additionally, if you added signage, additional signage to those restaurants, the minute the county or the state says done uh, with this and the seating arrangement goes away, the sign goes away. Make that part of the stipulation. When the seating goes away at the restaurants, the signs go away. But as far as the entire retail part of Malibu getting a sign out front, it's going to get gnarly. Who's going to regulate what size it is? Who's going to regulate how long it's out? So we're going to be spending a lot of city resource time monitoring this and reminding people when it comes down that it has to come down. We also have an assessment here at the city. It was done a year or two ago of all the current signage, and that's in our inventory. You could ask Bonnie. She would know about that so that people aren't going to you know, scam the system once this is over. So there's a couple of ways to look at it. If we're going to go forward with it, we need to get the details out. But uh, I sure do appreciate the, the reach out, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Jefferson. Um, could could I ask, I don't know, Trevor, Reva, somebody to address that concern that was just voiced? Um, I, I, mean, I think it's going to depend on how the council, if you want to move forward with this, how you want to address it. Um, you know, I'm think that that depends on who you talk to, whether your retail restaurant, I do think businesses are certainly hurting during this time. Um, and, and the way I understood this was to, you know, perhaps allow some of those types of flags that you see out or banners that we normally wouldn't allow up um, that say, you know, we're open or whatnot. Again, I think you could carve out a couple things or how many you could have or when, and certainly put in just like a temporary uh, restaurant recovery program that as soon as the, you know, the order ends, then the program ends and the signs have to be picked up. But, um, you know, happy to help figure that out if, you, if you'd like to discuss it further. Or perhaps Trevor can weigh in. Yeah, th this one's more complicated than the restaurant recovery program. Um, where there you're, you're, you have programs in place to allow social distancing, you know, in terms of the justification for the signs, you know, um, tying that to an urgency I think we need to look into that issue uh, if this can be done as an as an urgency ordinance um, and what kind of form of relief that we, we could do. But something we can, we can definitely look into, um, you know, what would what we potentially what the potential options are for for doing something along these lines. And there are other cities that have done this. I'm trying to look them up right now. I don't know them off the top. I, I believe City of L.A. did, but there are other cities that have done this. So there is a precedent. Well, that's always good. Uh, Rick, were you about to talk? No. Um, well, I, I'll say when I saw this in in our uh, agenda, I thought, oh darn, I should have thought of that. <laughs> so, but as we're here now, I do wonder what the logistics on it are. It is interesting, um, but yeah, it's a fantastic idea. I would just need help in how you actually execute that. So, seeing another another ordinance makes sense because. Buildings come in all different retail stores and they're all different. Um, what does that look like? Um, I agree that, I guess, I don't know, whether Graham or whoever that you probably need to figure out a little bit what it looks like, but I really like the idea. I think it's a great idea. Are we creating a lot of more staff time here, you know, and putting something together for this that probably we might not need to be doing. 
Hopefully we're just looking at another ordinance and deciding if it makes sense, maybe. Um, I mean, plagiarize uh, from some other town and all of that. Uh, sort of like the mask ordinance. <laughs> yes. And, or the Monica, or Santa Monica, you know, short-term rental thing. There you go. Jefferson? Thank you, Mikey. Um, we do have that inventory, and I'm sure Bonnie or Riva can look it up. We do have a sign inventory where the city went through already and processed the signage. I don't know what year it was done, but it kind of gives you a background of where a starting point could be. So uh, staff would have to review that as well as coming up with some language if we move forward with this. So we already have a history and we have a, an inventory of what businesses have, which signs, which are permitted, which are not. We went through this some time ago. So that part is off, the, you know, is easy part. It's getting them removed and having code enforcement be involved with getting all this removed once the virus is over. So I just pulled up and this just happened to be the city of South Pasadena that popped up and they did allow, um, they put a, a total sign width so the sign can't um, exceed four feet by six feet and they can have up to two temporary signs per business. Only one can be in the public right of way. So there are some things we could put if the council wants us to try and craft something um, and that the temporary signs can remain in place for 30 days or until the local emergency declaration ends. So there are, you know, uh, as I said, there's precedents in other cities that we could easily take that information and, and put it into something if the council wants us to do that, um, that have parameters and limitations of how many each business can have and what those look like. Okay, that helps. I think, I think what's hard to right now, we don't, a lot of us don't know what businesses are open and what's closed. It's a little confusing because some people are not open. So um, I see the need and uh, hopefully there's a way we can help our local businesses. They're in real, they're in real trouble. This is, this is real. It says, uh, I talk to them a lot. It's a really tough situation. So if we can find a way to help them in this manner, I think it's great. Scott. I was just going to make a motion to direct staff to bring back an ordinance uh, that deals with some temporary signs similar to that of, I think, South Pasadena. That sounds reasonable to me. Uh, I'll second it. Either way. <laughs> All right. Do we have more discussion on this? The Jefferson. Last comment. I know we have that inventory. Nobody's addressed it yet, but it was very recent in the last couple of years while I was on the council the second time. So I would say that uh, that should be part of the initiative if we move forward to say that we recognize we have a sign, sign inventory because I don't want these businesses a year after COVID is to have, have Dub Clevenger to run over and say, no, this was your sign ahead of time. This is the sign you were allowed, and now you got to remove it. That will cost staff time, and it will cost the city money. So we're going to be heavily dependent on the inventory. We're looking to focus on cleaning it up afterwards and mechanisms to ensure that happens, right? Yes. I think it's absolutely fine to have that in there. But I think the ordinance should be simple. Okay. Any more comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call? Mayor Pro Tempe? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, I just want to thank everyone on the council and staff for working so hard. This is a hard meeting. It's really late. Really appreciate everyone's efforts and um, Everyone get some sleep. Good night. That motion to adjourn. Um, okay. Later. Oh. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.